Okay, so we are going live right now on YouTube, everyone. All right, Bonnie, it's uh, 602. Do you want to give me a thumbs up? You can begin now. Okay, so I'll turn it over to the clerk for the playing of the national anthem. Over to the council coordinator. My apologies, Bonnie. to regular meeting of council and general committee for Monday, July 13th, 2020. We begin this gathering by acknowledging the land on which we are gathered is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabek peoples, many of whom continue to live and work here today. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within land protected by the dish with one, 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 uh, one spoon wampum agreement. Today, this gathering places home to many First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples, Acknowledging this reminds us of our great standard of living and is directly related to the resources and friendships of our Indigenous peoples. So I just have a brief mayor's report. I'm just going to try and keep it brief, but I do want to open up with the recognition and, and honoring of the 25th anniversary of the genocide of Shri, uh, Srebrenica and the uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, where more than 8,000 Bosnian Muslim men and, men and boys were killed. It's a solemn day and an especially important one to stand together against all crimes against humanity that continue to be carried out across the globe. 
This anniversary is a poignant reminder of this de devastating period in the history for the people of Sri uh, Re Ni uh, I can't, um, I apologize. Uh, I was practicing this, Shri Re Ni uh, Nisa, and a chance to remember and show our support for those who had their civil liberties and human rights violated. Those who lost uh, family members in this tragedy, the genocide is a painful, is painful to remember, but it's important not to forget. And the fact that it happened only 25 years ago is a, is a reminder that these tragedies continue in our community, in our country, in, in, our, in the globe, and we want to make sure that we acknowledge this. Um, stage three, so we heard from Premier Doug Ford today. Our community remains in stage two for the province's framework for reopening. While much of the province uh, moves to stage three this Friday, uh, the Niagara region residents and businesses have the and uh, at this time the opportunity to further prepare for the procedures and guidelines that come to stage three. Uh, so you'll have more information that will be coming up. Uh, stage three is about indoor gatherings, up to 50 people and outdoor gatherings, up to 100. Sports leagues will be able to resume. Nearly all businesses and public spaces will be able to gradually reopen their specific provincial guidelines that focus on health and workplace safety. It's going to be a big step. And while I know everyone is anxious to get there, it is important we follow the best practices to ensure we reopen our community in a safe, responsible way. Niagara has done an incredible job in fighting the virus. We've seen low case counts over the last several weeks, but we can't let our guard down. And we've seen what has happened south of the border. The pandemic isn't over and we wanna be able to continue to get to stage three. Uh, there was a couple announcements a couple weeks ago about transit. So I just wanna say thank you to the federal and provincial governments for their 31 uh, public transit projects in the region, including here in St. Catharines, more than 16 million federal, 13 million provincial and 10 million municipal will be made into St. Catharines alone. These will go to fund downtown uh, transit terminal renovations, fleet expansions, expansion of the current operations area, bus stops and shelters, uh, new contact lists, fare box technology, rehabilitation of hybrid buses, replacement of 11 conventional buses, replacement of Paramount, uh, paratransit, and a lot more to invest in our community. So with that, I'm just gonna say happy birthday to Brian York, who is gonna be uh, 20 something tomorrow. And so I wanna say on behalf of uh, council, hope you have a great day. So I'll turn it over to the clerk. Through you, Mr. Mayor, this evening's adoption of the agendas, you have additional correspondence from the following, uh, following individuals in your sugar sink folder. Uh, Evan Armstrong regarding council item 6.1 on 2021 rates and fees. You have a confidential memorandum from the manager of Realty Services and Insurance Services, Corporate Insurance Program 2020-2021. 21 renewal pricing rotary club of st catherine's request to use seymour hannah uh, sports and entertainment center parking lot july 6 2020 a joint statement and call to action from amo lumpco and marco ontario mayors and chairs issue emergency call for financial support amo watch file july 9th 2020 and a memorandum from the director of crcs and director efes outdoor pools related to council agenda item this evening 10.4. You have additional items of correspondence regarding Council Agenda 6.2, mandatory wearing of face masks and coverings in St. Catharines draft bylaw, which has been placed in your sugar sink file. And the following amendments are being made to your agenda. The resolution from the Township of Armour, uh, high-speed internet connectivity in rural areas listed as sub-item four in the Council Correspondence Report will be endorsed by Council rather than received. The Office of the City Clerk will provide notice of the endorsement to the Township of Armour and Niagara MPs and MPPs. The following delegations will uh, have also been added to this evening's agenda. Saleh Wazirudin is re uh, regarding uh, General Committee uh, agenda to item 3.2 uh, from the Anti-Racism Advisory Committee regarding body cameras for police officers and Angela Zito regarding Council Agenda 10.4, opening of an outdoor pool in St. Catharines. And that's what I have for this evening. All right, thank you to the City Clerk. Anything else that Councillors would like to add? Okay, seeing none, can I have a motion, Councillor Kushner, to move? Seconded by Councillor Harris. Okay, all in favor, show of hands. All right, that's carried. So now we go on to um, any conflicts of interest for today's agenda? Councillor Harris? Any 
can hear you. And a tech comp, can someone help Councillor Harris? Because there's no audio coming through. It looks like he's unmuted, but nothing's coming through. If you maybe pull out your headphones and see if it works that way. Can you hear me now? Yeah. I have a conflict regarding the body cams since my son is an employee of the Niagara Regional Police. Okay, duly noted. Thank you, Councillor uh, Garcia. Mr. Mayor, I apologize. I should have asked uh, what you asked before, but uh, <clears throat> I noticed the clerk did not mention that I had pulled item 2.4 from consent, so I want to make sure that that's okay. Yeah, so it's coming up under consent. It is noted on, on mine that you have pulled it. Thank, Thank you. you. Councillor Garcia. Okay, um, with that, we go to uh adoption of the minutes that council adopt the minutes of the meetings of council held on monday june 22nd and that council adopt the minutes of the general committee meeting held on monday june 22nd and the council adopt the minutes of the special meeting held on monday july 6th and i have councillor dodge making that motion seconded, so moved mr mayor seconded by councillor phillips and he's giving me a thumbs up and any comments on the minutes seeing none all in favor Okay, that's carried. Now we go over to consent. So the following items have been requested removed from consent to discussion. Uh, item 2.4, Office of the CAO uh, remote, uh, remote public engagement, Councillor Garcia, and as well as correspondence 11, sub item 11, uh, item 2.5, and that's to request the use of Seymour Hanna Sports and Entertainment Center parking lot, and that's Councillor Littleton. Um, can I have a motion to move that council approve the consent agenda save and accept those items brought forward for discussion moving the motion i have councillor littleton and seconded by councillor phillips and seeing no questions on this one i'll look to the clerk to accept the consent agenda three mr mayor this evening's consent agenda we have item 2.1 corporate support services naloxone in the workplace additional information 2.2 financial management services billing covid19 property tax penalty and interest relief program item 2.4 community recreation and culture services skip culture days funding recommendations item 2.5 legal and clerk services office of the city clerk council correspondence and as you noted save and accept additional correspondence sub item 11 item 2.6 uh, financial management services amendment to administrative penalties for parking of vehicles by law beach areas councillor littleton yes councillor miller yes councillor phillips yes councillor porter yes councillor kushner yes councillor harris yes Councillor Garcia? Yes. Councillor Dodge? Yes. Councillor Cisco? Yes. Councillor Sorrento? Yes. Councillor Townsend? Yes. Councillor Williamson? Yes. And Mayor Senzik? Yes. And that's carried unanimously. Okay, uh, financial management services. This is the 2020 rates and fees. And this is notice of the adoption of the schedule of 2021 rates and fees has been published in accordance with the City of St. Catharines Office Bylaw. Public meeting will proceed as follows. The Director of Financial Management Services will present the 2021 rates and fees. Members of the public were provided with an option to submit written correspondence. <clears throat> Items received have been added to the Council's sugar sink folder. As today's public meeting is being held electronically, members of the public wishing to speak to this issue were advised to RSVP with the Office of the City Clerk by 11.59 on Sunday, July 12th in order to speak. No one has requested to speak. So staff will present any any final comments. Uh, public meeting will be closed, and then council will make a decision. So with that, I will turn it over to Ms. Christine Douglas, Director of Financial Management Services, to present the rates and fees for 2021. Uh, thank you through you, uh, Mr. Mayor. This evening, I will be presenting an overview of the schedule of the rates and fees for 2021. User fees are charged by the City of St. Catharines for purchases of publicly provided goods and services. The rationale for charging these fees is those who distinctly benefit from the services provided by the City should be the ones who pay for the service. Next slide, please. At its meeting on October 
24, 2016, Council approved the motion that the annual rate and fee increases be set at a minimum of the core rate of inflation. At its meeting of October of April 27th, 2020, the Budget Standing Committee approved that the rates and fees for 2021 remain the same as the 2020 rates and fees. Details regarding the 2020 rates and fees were presented to the City Council at its meeting held on May the 27th, 2019. Next slide, please. Staff reviewed the Budget Standing Committee's direction and there are a few changes recommended for the 2020, 2021 rates and fees. If all the items recommended are approved, the City of St. Catharines will have 1,107 user fees. These proposed fees consist of four new fees and five reintroduced fees. The reintroduced fees relate to fees that were included in the city's rates and fees until the end of 2019 and were removed from the bylaw when the Niagara region took over the licensing and bylaw enforcement aspect of these businesses. In discussion with the Niagara region, these fees should be reinstated. These fees have been adjusted for inflation to represent the 2020 levels. Next slide, please. For 2021, Community Recreation and Cultural Services is proposing the creation of one new fee with a $0 amount for use of vacant and unused city-owned properties by community-based volunteer groups who provide work or services on behalf of the city. In order for a vacant city-owned space to be considered for this category, the space would need to be move-in ready, which means AODA compliant and no requirement for capital improvements or repairs, such as Improvements or repairs are not being budgeted for and could not be incurred. Existing spaces meeting this criteria would be the Ontario Street parking garage commercial space and a vacant space at the Seymour Hanna Sports and Entertainment Complex. Uh, Planning and Building Services is proposing the creation of three new fees to assist with bylaw enforcement. The first fee is the maintenance of grass and weeds, repeat inspections. This is a fee designed to recover additional costs associated with repeatedly having to reinspect properties within the same calendar year, receiving grass and weed bylaw complaints. The second and third fees, entry onto adjoining lands non-refundable and adjoining land entry extension of authorization, address cost recovery concerns for a service which is currently being completed without a charge. At present, under certain conditions, resident requests letters from the chief building official authorizing entry onto the lands. By collecting a fee for this service, the city can provide a greater sustainability for the service and maintain the ability to deliver the service within an acceptable time period. Directors from both uh, CRCS and PBS are present to address any specific questions that, that Council may have with regard to these fees. Next slide, please. This chart shows how the 2021 rates uh, changes break down. As shown, the majority of the fees are not increasing for 2021, with only 10% increasing less than 2% and only 3% increasing by more than 2%. For 2021, there are no fees that are being removed from the schedule of rates and fees. Next slide, please. As part of the 2021 rates and fees, Planning and Building Services is proposing 114 fees aligned with the parameters of core inflation, 1.9%, 34 fees increasing by greater than 1.9 and 25 fees to remain unchanged. Fees exceeding the core rate of inflation have been increased for two reasons. First, Planning and Building Services staff have determined an increase is required to more align the fee with the city's comparator municipalities. And second, a higher price will allow more revenue be, to be collected improving the relationship between the actual staff time required to complete the application, the cost, and the price of these applications, the revenue generated. With COVID-19 pandemic is constantly involving. The construction permissions were continually being expanded to aid in the recovery of the economy and are anticipated to be back to normal levels before the end of this year. To freeze at the 2020 rates and fees as an incentive to the development community would compromise the city's effort to rebound financially from the pandemic and places an unfair burden on the local taxpayer. Therefore, Planning and Building Services is recommending that these changes in its rates and fees be implemented for 2021. Next slide, please. By adopting the fee changes noted above, staff estimates additional fee revenue would be generated of slightly over 38,000 in 2021. This estimate includes the, both the new revenues and for price adjustments. Next slide, please. More information is available in the city's 2020 rates and fees council report and the related appendices. Next slide, please. To conclude, 
the budget standing committee is recommending to council that the 2021 schedule of rates and fees be approved that the city clerk maintain the list of rates and fees for public inspection and that the city solicit prepare the necessary bylaws mr mayor that concludes my presentation on the city's 2020 rates and fees Thank you very much, uh, Director Douglas, for the uh, very thorough presentation and for your team for moving forward on the rates and fees for 2021. And in addition to the, the budget committee, which was able to review those and move forward with recommendations as well. I do have, um, we're going to go to, to, to council comments. I have Councillor Porter with her hand up, I believe, and then Councillor Kushner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My question is either to the CAO or to uh, Christine Douglas, the Director of Financial Management Services. We still are reeling from the impacts of COVID-19 on our finances, and I, I think some costs are still uh, increasing, um, especially as we try and um, maintain beaches and keep them open. Um, so there are, uh, there are additional costs at some of our facilities, and as we reopen, we think there will be even more costs I'm just wondering, if, you know, if we approve this today, uh, would it be prudent to take a look at it again in another three months to make sure that freezing most of the fees is actually a wise thing to do as we move into 2021, um, facing essentially a $7 million shortfall? Could, could we do that in the fall? Mr. Mayor, I can take this one through, okay. Mr. Mayor. Um, it's true that we are experiencing some increases in costs, not only loss of revenue, but increases in costs in many areas due to uh, the situation that we're in right now. Uh, in many cases, those are in areas for which we don't have rates and fees yet. So for instance, you can use our beaches without paying a fee. There is no parking fee for the beaches or there's no usage fee. So um, passing this this evening doesn't preclude us from adding reviewing and adding future rates in as we go through time and as we have a little bit longer to assess. So um, I think there has been quite a bit of work placed in this and review of all the fees. There was an initial feeling that, um, as you know, from the budget committee that we would hold the fees. And then there was some uh, look back to say, yeah, there's a number of fees that we do need to increase. So we certainly can bring it back, particularly for those areas in which we don't have a fee presently. We could introduce new fees during the year as long as we have appropriate public consultation related to that. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Councillor Porter. Councillor Kushner, you're up. And unmute, I don't know if Evan can do that. But... Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, do two questions. Do we have cost recovery on the fees? Uh, thank you through you, Your Worship. With regards to uh, the city's rates and fees, um, we are uh, continually moving towards cost recovery, but at this point in time, we are not at uh, any of the city's rates and fees. So what's the rationale for not increasing the fees when we know we're going to have to increase taxes? Through you, Mr. Mayor, um, with regards to not increasing um, the majority of the city's uh, rates and fees through, uh, from, from 2020 to 2021, um, it was viewed as one of the um, items that the city could do to help some of our residents um, with regards to the impact of the uh, COVID-19 um, pan pandemic. As the CAO has indicated, if we find that um, there are new fees that we should be implementing or that if other fees want to be increased, we could do that with the appropriate public consultation. Okay, thank you. Can you elaborate on the uh, uh, maintenance of uh, grasses and weeds, the, the fees there, because in South St. Catharines, we have uh, a very problematic area because of housing, that rental housing, that for the most part is owned by out-of-town landlords. They tend to be the most problematic with respect to weeds, with respect to maintenance, and we send inspectors there all the time. 
So Thank that, you, Councillor Kushner. Through the mayor, the introduction of this new fee is to address just that exact problem. We have uh, a handful of repeat offender properties in the city where we are constantly sending out bylaw enforcement staff to investigate, send out a notice, reinvestigate the property, and then um, uh, enter the work into work manager for municipal works to undertake a bylaw cut. Uh, when this behavior uh, repeats, it, it's seen as a, a cost of doing business for some of these investor properties. So the purpose of introducing this new fee is to act as a deterrent for that. Okay, and uh, the first complaint, what is the fee? When you have a complaint and you investigate it and it's the first time, what is the fee? Through the mayor, there is no current fee, but then the establishment of this new fee is for um, uh, repeat calls on the same address in the same calendar year. Okay, and the first notice, if they cut the grass on time, then there's no charge to them? That's correct. But the second time, even if they cut it on time, there's still a charge to them? through the mayor. No, that, that's not correct. The charge will be if uh, we have to go out and, and do a cut multiple times. Okay, but the fact is that they're costing us in staff time having to send staff out. So we send them out, they cut it on time. We get another complaint, we send staff, they cut it on time, and therefore they don't pay a fee, but the grass is never cut. How can we resolve that problem? Through the mayor to the councillor, in your example, you just gave um, the lawn was cut. Um, we're going after people for multiple times where we have to keep going out and they're not cutting it. Okay, but um, we know that some of them don't cut it until they get notification and they get a grace period and they seem to do that continuously. How do we deal with them? Well, councillor, councillor, because it's it's not on the rates and fees currently. What I what I can suggest is possibly contacting the CAO and, and work with Director Kitte. It's more about the the time between notification and what it takes for them to cut. You can you can work to get that that timing reduced from I think 14 days, maybe down to seven days, but it's not going to be resolved today with the rates and fees. So if I could ask you to take that offline, that'd be great. Okay. Thank you. And that's, Thank the, you. that's a good point because you hear a lot of those complaints over the course of the summertime. And we've got to figure out a way to deal with this. But this is um, hopefully a, a counter move on people who are chronically getting us to cut their lawn. Councillor Miller, I believe you have a hand up. I did. Uh, I guess following up a little bit on what Councillor Kushner was asking about, uh, last term of council had an opportunity to put in a, uh, a housing licensing, apartment rental licensing bylaw didn't do that and asked that it go back for sort of more work. Where is that at right now? Could, I don't know if any, uh, could, do you want to restate the question just in terms of? Uh, we, it, it, as far as I understand, we're still looking at licensing rental properties in the city uh, and rent licensing landlords we did some outreach on it we were at the market and at penn center and asking people their opinions uh and i believe we had a committee set up about it i, I actually think councillor Wilton maybe was on that committee as a citizen i'm just wondering where are we at in terms of licensing and fees for for landlords in the city so director kitty i miss maybe uh, touch on short-term rentals through the mayor to the councillor um i'm i'm aware of the work that Councillor Miller is referring to. It was before my time here, and my understanding was that there was a subcommittee uh, that had been put together at the time to look at that issue. There was a lot of community consultation and there was a lot of controversy around it. And ultimately it did not result in a directive to staff to continue down that path. Uh, staffs current direction is to be looking at the deliverables of the housing action plan. Uh, the last remaining item of that is the uh, community improvement plan and supporting affordable housing initiatives through through that method. Okay, um, 
I guess uh, my only other question on rates and fees is uh, reintroduction of uh, fees related to adult entertainment and body rubs, like these kind of parlors. Why is that coming back or, or why did it go away? Is that something the region was doing and now we're responsible for it? So I believe Director Douglas, I think you touched on this in your presentation, but I think you did. Director Douglas. You want me to respond? Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the, actually, the city clerk will uh, respond to this uh, particular item. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the councillor. Uh, we took that out because the region is now responsible for the, uh, the body rub parlors. But in order for them to actually go out and do it, it needed to exist someplace so they can actually enforce. I had taken it out inadvertently. I shouldn't have. Um, so they asked me to put it back in. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I understand. Yeah. I just, I, I don't remember us ever discussing that. So, okay. Thank you. That sounds good. And that is it for me. Thank you, Councillor Miller. Any other questions on rates and fees? Okay. Seeing no other questions. Um, I guess I can bang the gavel. <laughs> no smiles on that. Come on. It's a, it's a bang of gavel. Um, am I on mute? No, I'm still good. Council, uh, can I have a motion to do two things? receive the presentation and close the public meeting. Councillor uh, Cisco, Councillor Sorrento, all in favor of closing the public meeting and the presentation. That is carried. And can I have a motion to move the committee recommendation committee? So can you put the, before we do this, uh, Evan, just to make it official, put the motion on the floor. I have Councillor Cisco and Councillor Whoever wants to put their hand up quickly, uh, Councillor Littleton, uh, moving and seconding it. So for the public, this is what we're approving as part of the motion. And I will look to the clerk to call the question. For you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Dodge. Yes. Councillor Garcia. Yes. Councillor Harris. Councillor Harris. Council yes, yes, yes. Cou Councillor Kushner? Yes. Councillor Littleton? Yes. Councillor Miller? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Councillor Porter? Yes. Councillor Cisco? Yes. Councillor Sorrento? Yes. Councillor Townsend? Yes. Councillor Williamson? Yes. And Mayor Senzik? Yes. Carried unanimously. All right, again, thank you to the Director of, of Finance and your team and to the Budget Committee and Council for putting, putting a lot of effort to getting this through today. Now we go on to 6.2, and this is the mandatory face mask and covering in St. Catharines draft bylaw. Notice of the consideration of a bylaw regarding mandatory ma face masks and coverings in St. Catharines has been published in accordance with the City of St. Catharines notice bylaw. Public meeting will proceed as follows. Members of the public were provided with options to submit written correspondence. Items received have been added to council's sugar sink folder. As today's public meeting is being held electronically, members of the public wishing to speak to the proposed bylaw were advised to RSVP uh, to the office of the city clerk by 11.59 p.m. on Sunday, July 12th in order to speak. No one requested to speak. The public meeting will be closed and the council will make a decision. Um, so in terms of, for those who are, are following along and for council, we do have Dr. Herji, the, the, the Director of Medical Health or uh, Public Health for the, the region of Niagara. He is on the Zoom platform and I'll look to Evan to confirm. Mr. Yep, uh, yep through you, Mr. Mayor. Yep, uh, Dr. Herji uh, is here uh, in the meeting right now. Okay, and so the way that we would like to commence with the meeting is if you have questions of Dr. Herji related to the, the, the mask issue. This is an opportunity for you as counselors to ask those questions. I would ask that if you can sort of keep your, your any statements related to the issue till after Dr. Herji's uh, Q&A that you could have with him, and then we'll proceed into the discussion about the draft bylaw. So I'll open the floor now to any questions of Dr. Herji, and I've got Councillor Townsend. And thank you for joining us, Dr. Herji. It is greatly appreciated. Um, a lot of folks have been following along since the beginning and Dr. Herji has been very much at the leading front of COVID-19 and helping guide us through it as a community. So the fact that you're taking time here today is greatly appreciated and looking forward to the discussion with council. So uh, Councillor Townsend, you're up. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you, Dr. Herji, for, uh, for coming today here to answer our questions that uh, we may have. Uh, my question is uh, to you, um, from what I understand, uh, a mask is the third uh, defense towards COVID-19. If people are physically distancing, washing their hands, um, a mask would not necessarily, um, I mean, that's a, the third sense of defense. My concern, I guess, that I have is when restaurants and when we enter into stage three, which could come in about four or five weeks, if restaurants uh, or wineries, for instance, in St. Catharines are practicing the six feet rule and the washing of hands, would, would they be considered, um, would it be needed for them to be wearing a mask in a restaurant, any resident in the city? Okay, hey, Mr. Mayor, thank you to the council for the question. And on the topic of stage three, my expectation is that we will actually hopefully be moving into stage three in about a week and a half. The province has laid out that they wanna see every region in stage two for four weeks before assessing whether they can move to stage three. So. The group that moved into that was announced to move into stage three at the end of this week hit their four week period at the end of last week. We hit our four weeks at the end of this week. So I am hopeful that we will get our announcement on Monday and we'll move into stage three next Friday. But to your question around uh, restaurants operating indoors and the like, the province, the guidelines they put out today around stage three did not uh, put any advice around wearing a face coverings additional to what they've previously advised. So the recommendation remains that people wear face coverings when they cannot keep a distance of two meters, but other times they wouldn't be expected to do so. So a restaurant right now, if it's operating as patio, the idea is that they have placed their tables in such a way that Obviously, within your own table and the party you're with, everybody might be within two meters, but you will be farther than two meters from anybody at any other table. And so restaurants would have to reorient how they set up their indoors as well, so that people, you know, would be sitting with another with a table of other guests, but they would not be within two meters of guests at any other table. So that's how that would occur. And so for that reason, I don't think they would be expecting face coverings to be necessary. Obviously, if council wanted to go above that, they are certainly welcome to legislate accordingly. In regards to uh, Dr. Herji, thank you for that. And uh, in regards to airflow, uh, there's been, uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not an expert of, on this virus, but in regards to airflow in indoor facilities, in a restaurant that maybe sits, you know, 20 people, for instance, um, they're still six feet apart, still washing hands, uh, does airflow impact this in any way? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I think that's actually a really hard question to answer, and it's something that is still being actively studied in the research. Uh, some counselors might be familiar with a uh, basically what's called a case study, which is a study of a single instance that occurred in a restaurant in China where it did seem that three tables, uh, most people at those tables were infected with COVID-19 and it seemed to follow the flow of the ventilation system there. There's been very few reports of that kind of instance occurring. So definitely the consensus of science is that if it does occur, it's pretty rare, but we can't rule out that it does occur occasionally. So I think it's very much still something being actively researched. For the most part though, we believe it's large respiratory droplets that cause the spread of COVID-19. And so the keeping a two meter distance from others is going to take you most of the way there. And it's only maybe a small marginal amount of risk that might remain. Okay, thank you, Dr. Herjee. Thank you, Councillor Townsend. Uh, Councillor Miller, you're up. Thanks and uh, thanks Dr. Herjee for joining us. Uh, just a couple quick questions. Um, as you probably know, Sick Kids released a report about uh, children uh, and COVID-19 and going back to school and things like this. Um, can you, I, I, I think that report then, then was possibly refuted. Could you just touch on uh, mass on, on children? Because I know some people have reached out uh, about the likelihood of, of being able to keep a mask on a, a three-year-old or a four-year-old. Yeah, so Mr. Mayor, I think this in some ways is less a scientific question than just a question of practicalities. Um, I, I don't think we've really seen studies done on young children, and I don't think people generally would want to do research on young children. So we can't really answer it from a scientific perspective. I think people who are familiar with young children certainly know that children are 
if they're wearing a face covering are likely to touch that face covering, play with the face covering, pull it off and generally not use it the way it's intended to. Um, really our advice at public health is that for the youngest children and you know, minimum that would be children two years of age and under, it is perhaps even unsafe for them to wear face covering. So absolutely that should not be done. And I believe your bylaw reflects that. For children over two years of age, um, you know, given the practicalities of having a child continue to wear a face covering, you probably want to have a relatively loose rule for children over the age of two uh, and really focus on any kind of restrictions on adults and perhaps the older children in their upper teenage years where you can understand that they're going to comprehend what the rules are and have the ability to actually follow them. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, my only other question is, I think some people, there's been some concern that, that this is a political decision and, and not a medical or it's not coming from uh, yourself or something like this. I know you've touched on, on that in the past. Uh, the mayor referred to at the last meeting that St. Catharines in some ways has been ahead of maybe some of the recommendations of public health. Um, and, and maybe that's why, you know, everywhere in Niagara is doing fairly well right now. But could you touch on, I guess, or maybe reiterate, I suppose, why this decision isn't coming from from you, it's coming from, from city council. Yeah, so th thanks to the council for the question. I know this has been very much a hot topic uh, late. Really, the critical element boils down to the strength of the science. Um, when we you know, recommend in public health that there's going to be a requirement to do something and we are going to take away people's freedom, even if it's only a small amount of freedom, we think there should be quite a high threshold met of evidence that we're absolutely certain this works and that it's necessary. I think with face coverings, the research really up to around March was really saying that they didn't work. That body of research was really based on influenza, influenza-like illnesses. It wasn't on COVID-19 because COVID-19 was a new infection. What we've seen over the last three months or so is that there has been some research now coming saying that Unlike with other respiratory viruses, face coverings may actually have an impact with COVID-19. It's a different virus. Obviously, it you know, potentially behaves differently, and so that's what it's showing. The kind of research that's been done, though, is largely looking at correlations. It's not really been a highly, you know, high-quality controlled study, which is what we ideally like to see in public health and medicine in which to base really strong decisions. That being said, the research is fairly consistent. There's been several studies showing that face coverings are working. And so what most public health expert bodies have done is recommend that people wear face coverings when they can't keep physical distance because that's the period you're concerned about where physical distance is no longer protecting you. And it does seem like face coverings may be able to help you. And that's where we've landed as well in public health that we recommend it in those instances. We're not going to the state of requiring it because we don't think the research is strong enough yet. We can't say with a level of confidence that we should be perhaps infringing on people's freedom at that stage. That being said, we're also not opposed to there being a restriction and, and a requirement that people wear face coverings because the research is leaning in that direction. However, I think given the uncertainty here, I don't think science is definitive on this and what the policy should be. And so it does end up being a judgment call that I think needs to be made a society as a whole. And I think obviously you as elected officials, you're the one charged with representing what is the you know, values of society and where do they draw that risk benefit line. Taking account that the research is relatively weak, but we're quite concerned about COVID-19. We also are concerned about infringing on freedom, but maybe it's a reasonable infringement on freedom. I think those are judgment calls that we as a society need to make. And I think as elected officials, you're the ones who can make that decision given that the science isn't determinative here. Okay, and last, thank you for that. And last question, sort of a, a two-parter. Um, it, it, most public health officials, most public health organizations are recommending face coverings where physical distancing is impossible. We've had emails about negative uh, results of, of wearing masks, negative health effects of wearing masks. So I guess my question is, are there, is that something we should be considering? Are these, are this, is that accurate? Is there science to back that up? And in your opinion, as a, as a public health official, is there any, um, is there any fear of sort of a false sense of security with mandatory masks that, that maybe it will somehow hinder our, our efforts to physically distance? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, this is, I think, are quite complex questions. So 
I think absolutely we should be mindful of these potential risks, but I very much emphasize that they're potential risks in that there isn't really research to back them up that they do exist. Now, some of the claims out there, I think, are demonstrably false. There's people saying that wearing face coverings will inhibit people's ability to breathe and will decrease their oxygen levels, and there's no scientific plausibility to those kinds of arguments. There's maybe a small segment of the population who do have medical conditions where wearing a face covering could be unsafe. And for those, of course, I believe the bylaw has been structured to exempt them from the requirement. For the vast majority of people, wearing a face covering is not going to do any kind of harm in that fashion. The kinds of harms that I think we you know, may want to be mindful of is that there is a risk that if, you know, obviously the point of the face covering is it's blocking that virus from either going from you to other people or from other people to you. If that face covering is working, that virus is going to be blocked and now be on that face covering. So handling that face covering could mean that you contaminate your hands and you could end up spreading infection around that. So that's something to be a little bit cautious of, but you know, you can do messaging around educating people on the importance of not touching their face mask on using hand sanitizer before and after they use their face mask and that can hopefully mitigate that risk. There's I think concerns that if you know certain people do have those medical conditions, they can wear a face mask, some people might stigmatize them. Don't have any research on that, but I think it's certainly a concern that we should continue should be mindful of. You've raised the concern that some people may feel that now they're wearing a face covering, they're protected, they don't need to worry about physical distancing. I think quite a reasonable thing that people may slip into thinking. Again, I think you know we don't have research to back that up and maybe we can mitigate it by really getting that message out and emphasizing to people that this doesn't negate the importance of continuing physical distancing. So you know there are some potential drawbacks here, but we can't say that the research supports it. And certainly the recommendation of myself as well as most expert public health bodies is that we would recommend people still wear face coverings when they can't keep physical distance because that's the more clear science than the science around there being risks. But we do want to be mindful that it is possible those risks might start to occur. Thank you and, and thanks again for, for taking the time to join us. Thank you, Councillor Miller. Councillor Littleton, you're up. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Hirschi. Thank you so much for coming and answering all of our questions. Um, some of my colleagues have already answered, asked some of my questions. So I do want to ask um, this one. When, because I think we've missed a huge opportunity here to uh, can have consistent messaging. And by that, I mean, when the virus started, it was very consistent, right? From the, right, Canada's medical officer help right down to you know, your family grocer or everybody was on side about, spit, you know, two meters apart, um, diagrams in stores, we all got that really fast. And we didn't need bylaws to tell us to do that. And so now we're in this, you know, kind of wading through a huge um, public outcry. We have never seen this many folks writing in about this issue. And so my concerns are, we have so much misinformation. So I'm gonna ask you a couple of basic questions, just maybe because if people are watching this, this is what's gonna help us wade through the rest of this in my inexpert medical opinion. Um, so when do masks need to be worn in your opinion? So by this, I mean, when you can't be away from some two meters apart. So where are those places? Can you just outline that very basic for folks? Uh, sure, Mr. Mayor. So um, really the recommendation comes down to when you can keep two meters physical distance from someone, that's where to you want to wear a face covering. So we are exempting that we all have our social circle of 10 people where we're going to have close contact. Once you're outside of that group, I think it really falls on each of us to do a risk assessment of the kind of context that we're in. If we are you know, entering a store and we see the store is busy or we know from past experience, this is a very busy store where it's hard to keep your distance from others, that would be a time where you may wanna wear that face covering. If you're going into you know, the convenience store late at night where you know there's never anybody around and it's gonna be easy to keep your physical distance, I don't think you need to wear your face covering then, but of course it depends on uh, you know, what your habits are and if you think you can keep your distance from others. I think you know transit, particularly if you're in a larger city where transit buses can sometimes be quite busy, I think that will be another place I think of as high risk where you wanna be wearing a face covering. 
I'm not sure what the current state of uh, St. Catherine transit vehicles are. If, for example, they're carrying very small numbers of people and people are able to sit quite far apart, perhaps it's not needed. Again, I think people need to you know, be prepared and do their own individual risk assessments around all of these kinds of scenarios. Excellent. So if I was riding my bicycle outside, would I need a face covering? So Mr. Mayor, I don't think you would typically need a face covering if you're doing that. I suppose if you were you know, side by side with someone else and you're biking the entire way and that person's not part of your social circle, you might choose to wear a face covering. That being said, we generally advise against wearing face covering if someone is going to be undertaking strenuous physical exercise. So bike riding might qualify as that for a person. And so you might not want to wear a face covering for that reason as well. Okay, I saw it <laughs> the other day. That's why I'm asking. Uh, in the 40 degree heat, riding a bicycle mm -hmm. by himself with a mask on. Um, and I think a lot of this is where people are saying, I don't want to wear a mask when it's hot outside, but we're talking about inside for the most part. Um, what happens when people touch their mask? You alluded to this. So is there ever a, uh, a time when, even though I'm wearing a mask, have I done something to compromise the potential um, goodness of the mask or any protection that it might give me? Yeah, so Mr. Mayor, you know, touching the mask is certainly a potential risk. Uh, the research we are seeing in a few countries, and you know, cautioning that this is correlation research, it does seem to be there is more an effect of the mass protecting people than the potential issue of contamination. Obviously, you know, we're looking at big population studies where we don't know what every individual is doing. Maybe they are practicing really good hand hygiene and using hand sanitizer all the time. So we can't say for certain, but it doesn't seem like the, you know, touching the mask is likely to be as large of a harm as the benefit from wearing the mask. Um, the other part that I'd say that compromises the mask would be if the mask gets wet. Um, you know, if the mask is splashed by water in some form, if, you know, you've been wearing it for many, many hours and it starts to get a little soggy, that's, I think, where you would be a little bit worried as well that the mask might be compromised. Okay, so I've had some emails from folks who have said things like, I see them hanging from people's rear view mirrors. I see people taking them out of their pockets. I see them taking them out of their purses. You're saying generally, it's still better protection for you than not. Would that be correct? Uh, yeah, Mr. Mayor, I'd say that that's probably the case. That being said, one of the things we do want to encourage, and I think their efforts on this would be up if the uh, city chooses to pass the bylaw to, it's being under consideration right now, is to better get the messaging out around it. Don't touch mm -hmm. your face covering, don't store it in your pocket or your purse, because the last thing you want to do is start to contaminate what's in your pocket or in your purse, and really start to educate around safer ways of handling the mask, which is you take the mask off, you put it in a bag, ideally wash the mask each day when you come home and have a different mask for the next day, or another way is actually to put the mask in a Tupperware container where you put it kind of the outside face down. So you can put the mask on, put it back in there. The contaminated surface would only ever be touching the inside of that Tupperware container. Okay, excellent. Um, and another question I have is about, and I, I, uh, I am grateful to my colleagues, um, uh, patients with my questions. Um, why now? Why would now be a good time? Because I mean, we're looking at low numbers, I believe, and you will correct me because you are the expert, but perhaps the infection rate is generally one to zero new cases a day on average for Niagara, maybe two. Um, why, why would now be a good time to encourage people to wear masks? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, so we, we are actually averaging two cases per day right now in Niagara. So it's certainly good and certainly a relatively low risk out there. And I think that's actually a testament to the hard work of lots and lots of residents across St. Catharines and across the broader Niagara region, where people have been, you know, putting effort into keeping physical distance, washing hands. You know, not everybody's wearing their face coverings when they can't keep physical distance, but certainly some are, and all of that is added up, I think, to the success that we've seen. I think the biggest reason, you know, one might think that despite these low numbers and relatively low risk that we want to be wearing face coverings going forward and be more diligent about having more people take on this practice 
is that we're starting to lift the restrictions in society that have kind of forced us to have distance from each other. You know, when restaurants were shut down, we weren't, you know, gathering in restaurants. Now that restaurant patios are out, we're gonna gather there. You know, in a week and a half, we'll hopefully be in stage three, and now we'll actually have some gathering inside the restaurant as well. And so all of these kind of restrictions being lifted are gonna have people having more likelihood of being within two meters of each other. And so as the government is forcing that, uh, you know, uh, those, uh, that distance to no longer be there, I think that the, you know, impetus for keeping ourselves safe from COVID-19 is it more and more falling on our own personal responsibility. So we need to be taking on ourselves to be more vigilant than ever about keeping physical distance, about washing hands, about wearing face coverings when we can keep distance, and about monitoring our symptoms and making sure we're getting tested if we do have any, because those personal behaviors, I think, are going to become really the key to making sure we keep our case counts low in Niagara. And I think this might be uh, two, two more questions. When do you think might be then, and I don't know if you can answer it, but I'm going to ask you, mm -hmm. when might be an end point? Do we say when we get to October 1st, when we have the kids go back to school? When might be a time where we might want to lift if we have a mandatory bylaw about masks? When might we want to look at lifting in that? Yeah, so uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, presumably council would put in place the requirement to wear face coverings because they perceive risk in the community and want to make sure we're protected from it. I would say that as we head into the fall, there's no reason to think that that risk is going to be appreciably lower. If anything, I think it could be higher. As children go back to school, they're going to be in close contact with each other. They're likely not going to be as good as adults about practicing physical distance and they might spread infection amongst themselves and then be bringing it back home. We'll of course be heading into the winter months where people are gonna spend less time outside. They're gonna be more indoors. And of course, if you have more people indoors, there's less opportunity for people to be spaced apart indoors. I really think that the only logical time to back off of wearing face coverings would be if there's some new research that starts to show that maybe it's not as effective as we thought previously or we get to the point where we now have an effective vaccine so we can be protected by a vaccine rather than by these personal behaviors. Okay, so we could be looking at quite some time then for this, for wearing masks. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I think that's absolutely true. I think what we're really trying to do is set a new social norm here that we're gonna live with for a year, two years, perhaps longer, hopefully not. Okay. And um, if you could just talk about one thing that I've been concerned about with having um, this whole discussion, and again, I think it goes to having the education, is what I've seen some shaming, public shaming of folks who maybe got caught in a five minute time when they removed a mask and a photo was taken and put on social media. What could you say to um, about that, if anything, it's just a big concern of mine, any kinds of discrimination against folks who can't wear the mask, whereas those who can't get inoculated, we don't see them. We don't know that they're not inoculated. I don't, I'm really concerned that I don't want to see any backlash against members of my community who, who cannot wear masks or those who actually just refuse to wear a mask. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, this is absolutely a concern for us as well in public health. You know, I think it, COVID-19 and the pandemic, really the past four months have been difficult for all of us. And I think the way we've gotten through it in part is because we have all, you know, had that phrase that we have out there that we're all in this together. And we've really lived that. We've really tried to support each other. And I think it's really important going forward that we don't live in fear. I think, you know, we've really brought the uh, risk of COVID-19 infections down in our community. We are seeing things open up as a result. And I think that's a reflection that the risk is a lot lower. And so we shouldn't be living in fear. We shouldn't be um, you know, uh, taking that as the cue on how we're gonna react to others. And we should always be mindful that there can be very good reasons someone else isn't wearing a face covering. Maybe they have one of those medical conditions which actually does make it unsafe for them to wear. Maybe they have a disability such that they're not a physically able to even put on or take off a face covering. And so I think we should take that attitude wherever, you know, council ultimately decides on this bylaw or where we go as a region as a whole, that, you know, we're all still in this together. We're going to get through this pandemic by supporting each other. And that means that we're, of course, going to all do our part of practicing those behaviors that protect others. 
but we're also going to be accepting and taking into account that there can be very good reasons others sometimes can practice those behaviors and we're going to respect that and not be judgmental or stigmatizing. Thank you so very much for answering my questions. To the mayor, I do have some amendments for the bylaw. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Littleton. Councillor Porter, you're up. <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Dr. Herji, for coming tonight. I have a, a, just a couple of brief questions. Um, there's a gold standard in scientific research, which is a, a randomized, double-blind, controlled trial, which I think is impossible to do, in, I think, at the best of times, and really not possible at all during a pandemic, and maybe even unethical. So. Um, in order to study masks, you have to look at a bunch of smaller case studies or um, smaller bits of research. So from your perspective, uh, since these kinds of perfect scientific studies are not uh, possible to do right now, like what is it, what is a tipping point? Um, and then I guess that leads into my next question. Um, I appreciate that a lot of residents are doing their own research, but I'm finding that research literacy of uh, some of the residents quite mixed. Um, so do you have any advice for residents who are doing their own scientific research, what to look for? Um, just, I know that's a, maybe a tall order <laughs> to answer in a, in a, in a question, but um, could you help residents out when they're, when they're trying to do their own scientific research? It's something I support, but um, I'm seeing a lot of problematic um, research in some of the emails. Um, and I, it's like videos on YouTube that I think are actually quite harmful. Yeah, so Mr. Mayor, thanks to the counselor for those two very uh, complex questions. So the counselor is right that the gold standard of research is a uh, randomized double blind placebo controlled trial as we would say for it. Um, with the kind of you know, uh, issue we're dealing here, which is kind of a policy question, there's a variation on that kind of study called the cluster randomized trial, where you're not necessarily randomizing individuals to different groups, but you'd actually take groups of individuals and randomize it. So, you know, plausibly, you could have uh, 10 different workplaces, you'd randomize them to either wearing face coverings or not wearing face coverings and see what transpires with them over time. There haven't been those kinds of studies done with COVID-19 yet, and it's possible we may not get them given now there's a recommendation for people to wear face coverings. However, uh, I think it's still possible we still could see some of those kinds of studies, particularly in regions where they don't require face coverings with a bylaw. There could plausibly be workplaces that are unsure if they should adopt that kind of policy for their um, uh, clients or not. And we would potentially be able to do that kind of research. Of interest that there actually are three such cluster randomized trials done on wearing face coverings and SARS as a virus, which were done, of course, about 18 years ago, back when the SARS epidemic was happening. Interestingly, two of those uh, studies, these were studies done in the community at large, so not healthcare workers, community at large. Two of the studies showed that there was a benefit to face coverings, and one of the studies showed that there was not. And so the research was a little bit mixed on SARS, and of course, there's only three studies because we fortunately were able to basically eradicate SARS from the planet. I think we could still see those kind of studies done at some point. Even absent those studies, I think additional observational studies, you know, particularly more observational studies done in a North American context or really watching experience maybe of areas which do mandate face coverings to compare them to regions which don't in North America or Canada would give us science that's maybe a bit more applicable to us, which is based on our culture and the tendency of people with our norms to follow these kinds of instructions, as opposed to where most of the research has been done, which is in other countries where there is a different culture and perhaps the results aren't as easily applicable to us. So that's my first thought on, around that. On the second question about scientific illiteracy, you know, I, I think this is a really a challenging thing. Um, you know, when we look at science, uh, there's better quality science and worse quality science. And one of the things we as uh, health professionals do is the first thing when we're reading a study 
is to really assess what is the strength of this research and what are all of the limitations of this research so we can take it into context. And there's no perfect study out there. And you really want to look at multiple different studies, each with different limitations, to try and get a sense of the overall research and come to a conclusion of what that is, recognizing still what are the limitations of that research. And I think that's really hard to do if you're not a professional trained in looking at this research. And so my advice really to the public at large who wants to look at research is I think, you know, we don't want to discourage people from taking the interest in doing their own research. I would advise that they should start off by really looking at expert bodies, bodies like the World Health Organization, Public Health Agency of Canada, Center for Disease Control in the US, Public Health Ontario here in Ontario, and really seeing what they are saying, because usually that's going to be science that's been synthesized by some of the experts, where they've looked at all of the research and they've really boiled down to what are these solid conclusions that we can take away from that. I think if you then start to look at, you know, what are some of the references those sources are cited and you want to delve more into the actual details of those studies, I think that's a great place to start to launch into some of that research. So you know you're looking at the research that experts have deemed to be the highest quality and most influential, as opposed to necessarily looking at research out there and not necessarily knowing what is the caliber of research being done out there. So that's, I think, the advice I'd give to those residents. The final thought is, of course, uh, there's lots of scientists and experts now on places like social media. And if you want to try and post questions of them and get their context after you've read a study, I think that could be a good way to try and get some kind of expert opinion on what that research means. And so you're able to, you know, um, combine that with your own reading of it to get a better sense. Thank you. Um, thanks. That was a very good answer. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Porter. Councillor Phillips, you're up. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for being here, Dr. Herji. Um, as has been mentioned by my colleagues many times, this has been a very contentious uh, topic. Um, you hear that masks are hazardous for some people and helpful from other, others. But I'm hearing from you, I believe that you feel that the um, wearing of masks in this situation is going to be much more helpful uh, to residents than it would be hazardous. Is that correct? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I think that's absolutely correct. The weight of research is uh, very much supporting wearing face coverings, and there's not really much research to support the harms at this point. Okay. Um, you've read our bylaw, obviously. Is there anything in that bylaw that is lacking in your expert opinion. Is there anything that could be added? Uh, Ms. Chair, Mayor, I think the biggest challenge with the bylaw, which I don't think will be any surprise to uh, members of this body, is that it's really the enforcement side of it, which I think is going to be most complex of how do you do. Uh, particularly for those individuals who maybe claim they fall into one of the exempted groups. And I think the list of exempted groups that has been selected is a very sensible one. How do you validate those? And I believe the intention of the City of St. Catharines is that they would generally not seek to validate that. This would really be a nudge, but there wouldn't be perfect enforcement. And I think that's really the biggest weakness of the bylaw. And I think it's a weakness of really every group that has put forward restrictions requiring the wearing of face coverings. I don't think there's an easy solution to that. With us approaching stage three, obviously, um, if we approve this bylaw, do you feel that that would have any impact on the provincial government into allowing our region to go into stage three, or is it strictly going to be numbers as far as infections are concerned? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I believe that there would be no uh, impact based on whether or not council adopts this bylaw of whether we move into stage three. I think the province is very much looking at the number of cases and what the trend is, and that's really going to be the determinative factor. The province, as you'll note, has declined to put a provincial rule requiring face coverings. They have said that this is best remains a recommendation right now. And so consistent with that, I don't think they're looking for local areas to be going any further than a recommendation at this time. Thank you. Last question. If you were on our council tonight, how would you vote? 
Uh, Mr. Chair, I don't think I can easily answer that question. Is a were I counselor, I would be very much listening to my constituents to hear where they fall, and particularly what are the values they place on going the extra mile to protect against COVID-19, on how much their freedom they're willing to give up in pursuit of uh, giving that up, and how much they're concerned about the theoretical risk of such a bylaw. And based on that public input, I think I would come to a determination of where does the uh, residents I represent stand and make a decision accordingly. That didn't help at all. <laughs> Thank you very much for your uh, for being here, and uh, um, I do feel you've done a good job, and as have all the residents of Niagara and Keeper and members as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mr. Mayor. Councillor Kushner. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The the question I have is with respect to enforcement. You indicated that would be a problem. Now, even without enforcement, I would think that the bylaw will result in more people wearing masks because generally we're very respectful of laws, unlike the Americans who are less respectful, we're more collective and not individualistic like the Americans. Would you agree that passing a bylaw by itself without enforcement would increase the number of people that do uh, wear masks? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I think it's very likely that if there is a rule requiring people to wear face coverings, you're going to see more people start to wear face coverings because many people will uh, choose to follow the rule. Uh, we don't have a lot of information from other parts of Ontario that have instituted a bylaw or a rule accordingly just because it's been so soon. Anecdotally, though, I do hear from Wellington, Dufferin, Guelph, which was the first region to go ahead with this, that they did observe that it seemed to be more people were uh, wearing face coverings, even if they don't have hard numbers to back that up. So I would certainly agree with the counselor's uh, expectation there. Okay, and then the logical follow-up question is if everybody is wearing more, even though we don't have enforcement, will the incidence of coronavirus go down? Um, so, Mr. Mayor, just so I can clarify the question, is it that if more people are wearing face coverings, can we expect the incidence of COVID-19 to go down? Yes, or not go up as quickly as it would otherwise. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I don't think we can necessarily predict exactly what's going to happen with COVID-19 the trajectory. Obviously, there could be other factors leading to an increase in spite of uh, wearing face coverings. I would say that if more people are wearing face coverings, there is going to be more downward pressure on those numbers. So you are more likely to see those numbers continue to go down. Or if something happens to lead the numbers to go up, you're going to more likely see those numbers rise less quickly because people are wearing face coverings. That would be what the research is suggesting right now. Right, and uh, thank you for taking the leadership on this problem. Much appreciated. Thank you, Councillor Kushner. Councillor Williamson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Dr. Herji. Dr. Herji, um, I live in a household with uh, two people who work in grocery stores. Um, in terms, of, and I'm not sure how much evidence there is or scientific research has been done on this, but in terms of the choices of face coverings, um, the shield style or the cloth or paper manufacture ones closer to the face. Do you have a preference and do you know if there has been research done on the effectiveness of those two styles? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, there hasn't been very much research done on the kind of visor or you know plastic shield that people wear over their face, which is clear. I think there's a lot of interest in it and people theorize that you know this would be preferable because now you can still see people's faces and there's maybe more of that kind of nonverbal communication that can happen with them. But there's really no research right now that suggests that they're as effective as a uh, you know, face covering or mask that would be worn. Uh, notably with healthcare providers, the expectation if they're seeing someone with COVID-19 is to wear a medical mask as well as wear a visor that covers the head, uh, including the eyes, mouth, and goes below the chin. And that's because we don't think that visor on its own is sufficient. We do need to wear the mask as well. It's certainly possible that as research is done, maybe they would start to show that that visor has more effectiveness, but right now we can't say that. And so 
you know, my advice would be very much that you want to focus on a face covering that actually covers the nose and mouth and sits close to the face as opposed to those visors where we just don't have much confidence in right now. Great, thank you. And also, um, you are recommending where social distances, distancing isn't possible uh, within two meters. And I'm thinking there's, there's lots of indoor environments where that two meters distancing really isn't uh, possible. So in, in cases indoors where there's not two meters possible, you, you therefore would be uh, advising people to wear masks? Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, that's absolutely correct. If you're entering an indoor environment where you can't keep two meters distance, you should be wearing a face covering to protect yourself and those around you. And something I would actually go so far as to say is that I would advise that the operator of those spaces, whether a business, a government body or whoever, that they should probably have a policy on wearing face coverings because they, of course, want to be protecting both their clients as well as their employees as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Williamson. Councillor Sorrento. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Dr. Herji. First of all, I'd like to express my deepest concern for the staff at Lynn Haven uh, that contracted the coronavirus. I hope they have a very speedy and healthy recovery. And I just have one question uh, for you, Doctor. Uh, from, from a resident, uh, can you speak to the false positive percentage in the PCR virus testing and how it could relate to wearing masks? Uh, so, Mr. Chair, we don't, or Mr. Mayor, we don't have very good numbers right now on what the false positive percentage is. Uh, it's been theorized with the different PCR interpret, uh, implementations across the world because it's not a single standard test. There's a whole bunch of different tests and different, as they call it, assays from different companies that you can use. That it seems to vary, you know, up to as high as 4%. Our sense in Ontario is that the tests that are being done here, the percentages probably below 1% are going to be false positive. How that relates to wearing face coverings, I'm not sure, so I can't really comment on that. That's great, thank you. All right, uh, Councillor Garcia. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a very quick question, and thank you, Dr. Herji, again. Uh, my colleagues have asked most of the questions I would have asked, but I think for the benefit of those watching out there, I just wanted to ask a question about testing. Uh, uh, just how time consuming is it if we go to get tested and how quickly do we get results? I think everybody's just terrified seeing the pictures of down south where there are lineups for blocks and blocks for getting tested. I don't believe we have that situation, but I'd like you to share with us what the timing is. <clears throat> Uh, so, Mr. Mayor, when uh, you know a healthcare provider sends a referral that someone should be tested, or if someone calls into the assessment center themselves to schedule an appointment, there's a little bit of triaging done there to determine who is highest priority for getting tested. So, someone who has symptoms goes to the top of the list. Healthcare providers generally are going to be near the top of the list as well. If you're someone who doesn't have any symptoms and just wants to find out, you're of course gonna be lower on that list. Um, my sense is that for those people who are higher priority who do have symptoms, it's a day of max two days before they will get their appointment within the uh, assessment center. So you know, within 24 hours, you could potentially have that appointment. Once you go to the assessment center, you know, it uh, depends a little bit on your medical condition. For people who are healthy, don't really have medical issues, it's really like a five minute appointment. They'll put you through one of the drive through lanes, you'll pull up to the healthcare provider, they'll collect the sample and you'll basically be gone in under five minutes. For individuals who have some medical issues, there will be a bit more of an involved process where you would have an appointment, they would do a bit of a health assessment before they take the sample. So for that group, it could be more like a you know, 15, 20 minute appointment for them. Once that sample is taken, it's sent off to the lab, and the province's standard is that 60% of results should be back within 24 hours and 80% within 48 hours. That being said, that standard is not being met right now at all. Um, on our website, you can actually see the numbers of what they are in Niagara, and I think that 24-hour uh, marker is being met by close to about 25% of results, so well below that 60%. And even the 48-hour one is only being met by around 60% of results and less than the 80% we'd hope for. So 
the lab certainly has some work to do to speed up that process. Part of the challenge is that there's been a huge increase of volume of uh, people going for testing. Part of this is because the province opened up to anybody who wants to get tested can go get tested. And so you have lots of people who are probably low risk, who don't have a reason for being tested, who have no symptoms, who are you know, adding to the testing volume and is potentially slowing down some of the other results from the process as quickly. As well, the province is doing a lot of proactive screening of long-term care home and retirement home workers, people who work in factories, emergency workers and the like. And so that's adding to the number of people being tested as well. What we're seeing actually is that those people who are being proactively tested almost never come back with a positive test. So we're, you know, we're at a time where there's you know, relatively low risk of COVID-19 going around. And people who don't have a reason to be tested, of course, are going to you know, have a low risk of having a positive result. So we're not seeing a lot of uh, you know, positive results come back. So I think if we were to scale back some of that testing, we could actually see the testing for symptomatic people who need to be tested really speed up. And you could expect that from the point that you call your healthcare provider or you call the assessment center, you could realistically start to see your test results back within two, maybe three days. So it could be quite a bit faster. Just to quickly speak on what's happening in Florida, I believe yesterday Florida announced they had a, just under 15,300 cases in one day. And so you can imagine if their lab system is probably not set up to take 15,300 cases in one day, how do you even have you know, that many healthcare providers to collect the sample? And so that's what they run into, that they really got complacent, didn't take COVID-19 seriously, and as a result, their numbers kept building steadily. About six weeks ago, they're seeing 1,000 cases a day, and now they're seeing 15,000 cases a day. And when you do that, you start to overwhelm your healthcare system, your physicians, your hospitals, and unfortunately, that's what they're dealing with. I certainly hope that we are not going to go anywhere near that here in Ontario. I think our province has been taking things very seriously. As disappointing as it is to see we're not on the list to move this Friday into stage three, it's, I think, a testament that the province is taking things cautiously and they're sticking to their guns that we need to see a region in stage two for four weeks to make sure it's safe to move them into stage three. And so given that level of prudence they're taking, we hope we will never get to that kind of scenario. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Councillor Garcia. <clears throat> and I don't see any further questions. I've had the opportunity to act, ask Dr. Herji a, a number of questions in terms of just gonna ask a quick one uh, following up on Councillor Williamson uh, about the difference between our draft bylaw and the regions was ours is more directed towards the business, working with businesses, I believe. And mm -hmm. can you just verify that in terms of versus the region, which was more about the individual? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, that's exactly right how the different bylaws are structured. And I think that's a reflection of the different jurisdiction of a, you know, regional municipality versus a local area municipality. Local area municipalities have lots of roles in terms of regulating businesses, in terms of issuing licenses. And so it's very clearly in their power to set a policy that requires businesses have a masking policy in place and are ensuring that their uh, clients and their workers are wearing face coverings. At the regional level, the region is not involved in regulating businesses except for a very small subset. And so therefore, it's not really recognized within their powers. And if the region was to step into that area, it would be open to perhaps uh, many different appeals, which could quite uh, well win. The region is therefore relying more on the general responsibility for municipality to ensure the health and safety of their public. And so they are focusing on a rule for individuals. I think most people would say it's probably more likely to get good in, uh, uh, uptake in enforcement if you have a bylaw focused on businesses because it's a relatively smaller set of groups. It's easier to go to a business, ask to see if you have a policy on wearing face coverings, they can produce it. So it's relatively easier to enforce that than to enforce the 450,000 people in Niagara. But it's really a reflection of the responsibilities at the different levels of municipality why they think those bylaws differ. Okay, and I and just one follow up in terms of the the public health boards from Ottawa to 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 Windsor in southern Ontario, they largely all moved in this direction, and some of them have been the individual uh, directed at the individual. Some of them have been looking at the the business side. 
in terms of Niagara is a bit of an outlier in southwestern Ontario or southern Ontario for this. So for the public, when they say, you know, you've got the Canadian uh, medical officer saying this, you got the provincial, and then you got the regional, we're surrounded by also regional uh, public health officials who've gone in a slightly different direction, because I think there's some confusion that you're actually going in a completely different direction. You're saying the same thing. It's just your, from what we're hearing, is that you're looking to the municipalities to mandate it rather than what some of the jurisdictions have done as the chief medical officer has said, thou shall. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, Mr. Mayor, I think it's a little bit of a mixed bag still. There's some municipalities uh, where the medical officer of health isn't uh, recommending a face covering uh, rule. There's some where they are recommending that a municipal council institute that rule and it's being pursued through bylaw. And then there's other places where medical officer of health is exercising their power to just put the rule in place and not uh, have municipal councils involved as well. I think what there is is a clear consensus across all of us though, that people should be wearing face coverings when they can't keep physical distance. We believe that is likely to reduce the risk of spreading COVID-19. It's absolutely a recommended practice. And it's really just a question of how strongly do you think it uh, is important that we do this, that it should be a requirement versus a recommendation. And I believe that's a value judgment by our society, which is best left to our elected officials who represent those people. Okay, thank you for that clarification. And on behalf of council, thank you very much for being here today. I know you're taking out of a lot of time. And as Councillor Sorrento had indicated, there is an there is an outbreak at Lynn Haven, so I know you're dealing with that as well. Um, just a, a trying time, but I think you've done an amazing job. So keep up the great work. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I'm always happy to come and speak to this council on an important issue such as this. So thank you for taking the time to listen to me and I wish you luck in coming up with a policy that everybody is happy with. Perfect. Thank you very much, Dr. Hergy, for that. And now we go to what will be the recommendation in front of us, which is to enact the draft bylaw attached as Appendix 3 to uh, the report by LCS 106 2020 to temporarily require the wearing of masks within enclosed public spaces. And um, the mover on that one, can I have a hand up? Sure. Councillor, Councillor Townsend is moving that. Okay, Councillor uh, Harris is seconding it. Now I've got Councillor Littleton, you wanna make a mo uh, uh, an amendment? I do. I have several amendments. If Evan could put them up, please. I'll just briefly outline my reasoning. In all the documents that I read, uh, and Dr. Herji said this this evening, uh, public transportation, I don't think should be exempt from the bylaw. And we can use um, discretion with that. As he had mentioned, if there's not a lot of folks on St. Catherine's Transit, then maybe we don't need to do it. But excluding it, I don't think is, is a good idea. Um, because of all of the research, all those studies spoke about the need for it on public transportation. Um, I'm recommending that, again, just picking whatever we can discuss, but children under the age of 10 not be required to wear the face mask. Um, and that we add in, the operator of an enclosed space shall provide hand sanitizer at all public entrances and exits for use of members of the public entering the space. And that we actually go further and provide language for what the signage should say um, and, and staff could come up with that. Just to be specific about what the sign should say, because I do think the community education component, some consistency is the way to go with this. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so just stay on there. Um, I'm gonna go, if I can, I'll go to the mover. Um, can we just get some information to the mover in a second or so on the transportation, I'd like to go to the CAO first before we decide if it's friendly or not. Uh, so I'll go to the CAO because the Transit Commission does have authority on certain things and maybe the language, we have to change some of the language there. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. The Transit Commission certainly has, as we discussed at the, uh, the last meeting, the Transit Commission certainly has um, determined not to make it mandatory. They have um, put in place a significant amount of modifications in their vehicles and um, protection for their drivers. And so they, they have taken a stance of strongly encouraging masks. There was a, they also have a concern of um, should someone not have a mask and need to board the bus as they are serving um, populations that are in many cases less fortunate and that they did not want to leave 
someone on the side of the road because not allow them entry to the transit vehicle if they didn't have a mask. So that has been their opinion. Um, certainly they work with us and would work with whatever council decides, I feel certain, but this was the stance that the Transit Commission had determined. So to Councillor Littleton, can we can we have a that, that as a direction that the Transit St. Catharines Transit Commission consider an exemption bylaw um, for their for their services because I I think what the CAO is saying is is that there is an opportunity but they may it may look different than this bylaw. Absolutely, and, and again, there is no way because again, I, I want it to be inclusive of folks. I would never want to suggest that somebody would be left at the side of the road. Goodness sakes, that's not helping our community at, in any stretch of the imagination. So if if that's not going to work, and it's maybe just to I've seen um, signs on buses with a with a mask. Maybe that's as good as it gets. I just uh, was thinking that from the information that I had read and Dr. Herji had mentioned. I'll, I'll look to Councillor Miller and Councillor Dodge. Would you be comfortable if it if the language is is directed towards working with the commission to to look at this for the ridership? I, I I mean I would say yes. Obviously, it's something the commission is aware of. Uh, you know what I mean, and, and certainly encourages. But but as as the CAO said, you know the people who ride these buses uh, tend to be economically disadvantaged, and and the last thing we want to do is is pass them by. Um, so it's definitely encouraged on the buses and obviously St. Catherine's Transit's taking COVID-19 incredibly seriously. Um, so, I, you know, I, we have a commission meeting later this month and, and maybe it's something we talk about again. Obviously, when you're on a bus, anyone who's been on a, a bus, you're, you're rarely six feet apart from anyone just walking down the aisle. So um, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, it's a difficult situation and I, I think we're going to suggest encouraging everyone we can to, to wear masks when they're on buses. I, I think the requirement, um, I, I think, would be sort of cruel to, in, to enforce at, at certain times. Okay, so to the mover, uh, to the amender, uh, can we can we put in there uh, to request St. Catharines Transit Commission to look at the to examine the policy and its impact on its ridership? Yeah, you know what? Maybe we don't need this at all. From what I'm hearing from my colleagues, is that maybe and from the CAO mm -hmm. that. Um, maybe it's already been dealt with the best way it can be. I, again, I don't want to at all cause any strife or discomfort to riders of the Camp Transit Commission. I just had flagged it. That's all from the reading and, and hearing from Dr. Herjee. So maybe it doesn't need to be there. Okay. Yeah. We'll take, take that out for now, but I think keep it on the radar because it's as, as we open an economy more, more people are going to be on the bus. So mm -hmm. As Councillor Miller said, it's hard to keep that six feet distance. There may be other things that I have to look at to to protect people. Uh, number two, and I, I don't kid Councillor Townsend, are you fine with that? Um, the original thought process with having children aged two uh, and under, what, um, I mean, I'm just trying to think, like I have nieces and nephews. I For one that does not have children, if maybe someone who has children can can chime in on this. So, okay, just some back, because we're just trying to decide if it's friendly or not. Councillor Littleton, you have kids, you want to chime in and see if we can get this in as a friendly? Sure, I just think, and you know, Dr. Hergia alluded to it, most kids, if you're going to get a mask on them, it's going to stay for a little bit of time, um, especially, I mean, maybe 10 is too old, but I think by age 10, they understand, they're, they're able to process why they're wearing the mask and understand all of that. Anything like seven, eight even are still, they're gonna play with it. They're gonna take it off. They're gonna, uh, that's just kids. So I'm just thinking we wanna be reasonable. We want our community to buy into this. Uh, you know, we don't want emails from angry parents saying, there's no way I'm putting a mask on my kid. And and quite rightly, I mean, you're not putting a mask on a three-year-old. It's just not gonna okay. happen. So. Yeah, fair, friendly. Okay, uh, the number of five, 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 seven, um, friendly. Friendly. And then the last one is just consistent language. That's more direction to staff. Yeah, no, that's friendly as well. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Littleton. Appreciate that. And looking to see for hands up. Um, Councillor Phillips, you're up. Actually, I was just going to add when we were talking about transit and doesn't have a face mask uh, issue with it, I was just going to say if we didn't put face masks or require face masks on a bus, 
perhaps buses could be equipped with hand sanitizer so that everyone, when they get on a bus, they have a chance to use hand sanitizer to uh, restrict uh, any concerns from previous riders. So, but I realize it doesn't have anything to do with the, with the face masks. I could probably add that later. Okay, so we can add that to uh, the consideration by the commission. Uh, yeah. Councillor Williamson, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, what what date will be will be will we be looking at that this becomes effective uh, through you to CAO or so to the CAO? I, I look into the CAO. Uh, at this point, were we still looking to have it be a decision of mayor and CAO in consultation with Dr. Herji? Or has Dr. Herji's um, answering of the questions today changed that thinking? So perhaps like one or two weeks from now, is that reasonable horizon or? So it could be effective tomorrow and then we mm -hmm. work through the education process. So it's effective, but there will be a, a long, uh, an education period where we'll have to work with businesses. So the education piece may take two or three weeks to, to fully implement into the community. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Councillor Williamson. Councillor Sorrento. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to, to the amender, I just need a clarification on the second amendment where it's uh, to part five and number seven. So it says the operator of an enclosed space. Now, is this just for our public, uh, just just the buildings that we own or, or is this for all uh, private enclosed spaces like Walmart, any bakeries, any stores. It's, I would assume, oh, it's sorry. Um, sorry, sorry, Kevin, go, uh, Councillor Townsend, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean, I, I would assume it would be for all, all public facilities, but at the same time, if you look at and you go into most, most establishments now have that when you walk into any uh, space, I have not seen one where I've gone into that does, has not had any type of hand sanitizer. Yeah, so it'd be all spaces. So it is all, yeah. All spaces, okay. As outlined in the bylaw, Councillor Sorrento. Okay. Okay, uh, Councillor Dodge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just have a question about the children age 10 and under not required to wear a face mask under the bylaw. So what happens when when they're going into the schools and whatnot? Does our bylaw override like what maybe the school boards might put in place or how will that work? Um, I would ju just, I would consider like, because school wouldn't be starting back up in September, that this would be a temporary bylaw going into effect. Uh, I would assume that by that time, this this may not even be a bylaw during that time. But I'll, and in addition to that, Councillor, um, if we can go to the Director of Legal Services, because I, I believe there is uh, jurisdiction for school boards to decide themselves as well. Okay. Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to Councillor Dodge, the um, the bylaw exempts. Uh, certain spaces and that exemption includes schools. So the bylaw would not apply in schools. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Councillor Dodge. Councillor Garcia. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I wanted to comment first of all on uh, Councillor Littleton's um, um, amendment on the children. I. I must say, I, I fully agree with that. I don't know if 10 is the right one, but I did hear from a number of constituents that were concerned about exactly what she said, that uh, two, year, two on, on, under doesn't make any sense. You can't put a mask on a three-year-old or a four-year-old. They're going to play with it, take it off. So it certainly should be higher than that, whether it's 10 or eight, I'm not sure, but uh, I certainly agree with the gist of that. Um, I wanted to share with my colleagues because we have all received voluminous uh, number of um, emails, uh, pro and con, and I think the, the con uh, get into pretty uh, significant explanations and, and logic about uh, the argument being that we have already um, 
flatten the curve and, and therefore do we need to do this now? We should have done it three months ago, not now. And I keep thinking that, you know, I, I fully hear that, but do we want to take a chance? And uh, uh, as I said at the last meeting, when we see the horror story unfolding down south, it makes me feel that if this is going to be some help to make sure that after we reopen, we're not going to fall back dramatically, we have to really think about doing it. And uh, uh, it hasn't been that long since we reopened and went to patios and so on. And again, the incubation period, I understand it's a couple of weeks, so we could be seeing some increase in cases that we haven't seen yet. So I wanted to share with my colleagues that I spoke today to um, a doctor who is an ICU doctor at Guelph General Hospital. And I wanted to speak to him because Guelph was a leader in this in terms of uh, instituting a uh, uh, mass bylaw, I believe the first one in Ontario anyway. And um, wanted to ask them, you know, have they had difficulties or they see it working? And in general, he said that yes, that they believe it's working, that it's very hard to quantify how much it has helped. It. Uh, he is a frontline, uh, really frontline person, uh, believes that it has helped. And most importantly, because we're all concerned about blowback and uh, relations and concerns and complaints, uh, he said he doesn't feel that from what he has heard that there have been a lot of a lot of complaints about it. So I do say to the people out there who make such very good arguments as to why we shouldn't do it, that say the rationale that we're looking at is that do we want to take a chance? And, and I think that we have to err on the side of caution because the other thing I wanted to share that I've been reading articles about what's happening in the US is that one of the worst possible things that can happen is to go back into lockdown. Um, I heard that the governor of California, Gavin Newsom today, decreed that uh, they're going to close all bars, restaurants, and theaters and so on again. And from a, the point of view of a small business, and I know people in LA, for example, that have small businesses, it's hard enough to have to be locked down and closed and then gradually reopen. But then to do it again, when you're trying to get a clientele, it could be the death knell to, to many of these businesses. So it's important that we don't get ourselves in a situation where we could be going back. So because of that, I think we need to go forward with this. That's what I wanted to share. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Garcia, and, and thanks for sharing that information from Guelph. It is, I think, it's it's important that we we hear from other communities and leaders in those communities and the medical profession and what they're doing. Uh, Councillor Miller, you're up. Thanks. I um, I guess a question to the uh, to the amendments. Uh, certainly, I agree. Uh, you know, I have a three and four year old. Uh, that they vaguely have a concept, obviously, at this point after four months of what's going on. And they can wear a mask for a little bit, but it, it's pretty difficult. And and as we said, you know, it, it ends up being worse if they end up playing with it a lot. I'm just curious. Um, I support lifting that that age. I'm just wondering where the number ten, um, why like why that number was picked. I, I certainly don't have any expertise on what the number maybe should be, but uh, I'm just curious if there was something. Councilor Littleton. Um. So I I think I did a little bit of um, searching around on on. Twitter, I, I had seen, um, I think it was Dr. Feller had said something about nine years old, and it could have been from Councillor Yip's um, feed, Regional Councillor Yip's, um, that I saw that number. And then I thought about, I'll just be completely transparent, my own son, he has ADHD, which makes him act um, a little bit less mature than, say, another, uh, whatever age it might be. And I thought about the struggle it might be to get a child who might have ADHD or some other kind of um, uh, behavioral issues, like maybe some autism or what have you. And those children, it, it might just be such a struggle for parents. I didn't want that to happen. So I just thought 10, if they can do it by 10, still there's gonna be exceptions for kids that can't do it. But I thought by 10, my son can wear a mask and he does wear a mask when he goes out. So that's where I was thinking with that. I and I guess then my only other question is, I mean, we know, you know, when I'm out with my kids, they, no one has any idea how old they are. I mean, how strict are we looking at enforcing this 
you know, oh, is that kid eight or is he 11 or is, you know what I mean? It, I guess maybe to, uh, maybe it's to legal or maybe it's to, to Mr. York, um, you know, how, how lenient are we, are we able to be with this? Because it, that, I mean, again, I certainly support it. I, I just, I, I, I'm sure, I think it would be hard to ask a business to make that judgment call of, of how old a child is when they walk in with their parent. Okay, um, I'll go to legal and then if uh, the director of economic development wants to weigh in. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to Councillor Miller, the way that this bylaw is structured, um, enforcement effectively is through education and voluntary compliance. Uh, the business operator is required to have a policy in place, but they're not required to enforce the policy um, or to prohibit entry. So, um, you know, this is the least restrictive type of bylaw. Um, it doesn't require the business operator to have somebody at the door who's going to, you know, challenge people who are coming in without a mask. It really is a voluntary compliance uh, situation with respect to the ind individuals. They will have the signage, um, you know, which will be very specific in, in accordance with the amendment that's up there that tells people what the rules are. But, um, you know, they're, they're not expected to challenge people coming through the door. So they're not gonna be making that, that judgment call. It'll be the individuals. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Thank you for that. And I, you know, I, I don't think there's much value in us as a council of, of non-public health officials really nitpicking that number. So, so I think the 10 and under, you know, it seems reasonable enough and, and, uh, you know, certainly satisfied with that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Miller. Uh, looking at the list. So that is it for the questions and comments related to the mandatory masks. Um, I just need a motion to close the public meeting part of it. So that's the official part. Close the public meeting. Councillor Dodge, Councillor Cisco, all in favor of closing the public meeting. Okay, that is complete. We have the motion on the floor and, and I will just say, uh, I'm not gonna speak long on this, but I'll just say that I do wanna thank our, our legal team for pulling this together. Uh, obviously it hasn't been easy because there's not a, there wasn't a lot of examples that they could use to pull together this bylaw. Um, but I will, to the public, remind them that there are communities like ours in different parts of the world. One is Melbourne, Australia, and yes, it's much bigger than St. Catharines, but an example of them, they were well ahead of us on the curve of pushing it down, and uh, they've now gone back into lockdown. And they did it because, and I'll, I'll read you what the, the Premier of um, Melbourne, so similar to the Mayor of Toronto, I think a sense of complacency has crept into us as we let our frustrations get the better of us. I think that each of us knows someone who has not been following the rules as well as they should be, and now we're taking steps back. So if this prevents us from taking steps back, and I understand the frustrations that those who are opposed to this have, uh, but if this keeps us moving forward and not having to step back into stage two or one uh, when we get out of stage two, I think that'll be for the benefit of everybody. So these are difficult decisions and we've all got the influx of emails and, and text messages and phone calls and everything else associated with it. But at the end of the day, we just want to do what's best for our community long-term. And as Dr. Herji said, if, if you can't maintain that spatial distancing and this is the key. And so the way the bylaw has been written is in the absence of that spatial distancing, you have to, you have to wear a mask. And so this is something that we'll have to get used to for the next little while. And um, it's a part of what the new norm may look like. So with that, I'll just ask the clerk to call the question. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Miller. Yes. Councillor Littleton. Yes. Councillor Kushner. Yes. Councillor Harris. Yes. Councillor Garcia. Yes. Councillor Dodge. Yes. Councillor Phillips. Yes. Councillor Porter. Yes. Councillor Cisco. Yes. Councillor Sorrento. Yes. Councillor Townsend. Yes. Councillor Williamson. Yes. Mayor Senzik. Yes. And that's carried unanimously. Okay. And to the CAO, um, I think communications is going to be key. Can you give us a brief, uh, just very briefly, how you attend to approach this starting tomorrow? So that the council's aware of your, what your approach will be. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, so there's a number of components. First component being that we will need to uh, meet again with Dr. Herji and determine what our, what our metrics will be to choose a date when we choose a date. 
And also then our communications and senior staff will now work on all of the public education pieces. We've been doing a lot of that public education already, but now we'll need to work on what signage will be. We'll need to work with economic development as well as an education campaign for those businesses and operators out there and certainly seek to support them as we have through the um, entire pandemic to, to make sure that we're working along with them in the difficult situations so that it's not that we have to come down hard on people for not doing things but rather that we're working together with them to all be successful okay so communications will play a very key role and um, the economic development department will support because of their expansive connections with the business community uh, so this will be a busy week and because I will we'll touch base again uh, tomorrow to the CAO about the implementation date. Um, with that, we move on to what would be the next discussion agenda, the discussion item. Um, there are no special presentations. We resolve in the general committee and we're going to have a PowerPoint presentation by the director of uh, the executive director of the Niagara Grape and Wine Festival. And Ms. Dorian Anderson is joining us to talk about the revised Niagara Grape and Wine Festival fee for service agreement. And then um, also, if there's any questions, our Director of Economic Development, uh, Birthday Boy York, will be able to answer those questions as well. So, with that, I'd like to introduce the Executive Director, Dorian Anderson. Good to see you, Dorian. Ms. Anderson, you got to hit your mute button because you, you just waved right now. There we go. Hi again. <laughs> All right, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, are we going to do a split screen, Evan? Is there going to be a PowerPoint? Yeah, there's going to be a PowerPoint. I'm just going to put up right now for Dorian. And just a reminder. Ms. Anderson, you're ready to go. Yep, and just, just a reminder, Dorian, when you want me to advance the slide, just uh, say so, and I'll move it to the next slide for you. Great, thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Mayor, um, and nice to see you and all of the councillors and the city staff. Uh, as I've been listening in over the last little while, it's uh, become abundantly clear that your jobs have become a lot harder than my jobs have become since the pandemic um, crept in. So thanks to all of you for the hours and hours that you've been spending working on this. Um, and also thanks to the economic development team. They've been helping me through a lot of questions and amendments as we've been moving forward, pulling together our 2020 programming update. Um, if you wanna go to the next slide, Evan. So before we move into what we're planning for the rest of 2020, I wanted just to give you a quick overview of some of the highlights since we last spoke in August. Uh, we completed the fall festival at Montebello last year, and this does feel a little bit sore talking about this, considering that this is the very thing we will be canceling this year. Um, but again, we did uh, right across the board had event uh, attendance increases across every program and every event we hosted in 2019. Um, an economic impact of approximately $5 million towards the city, uh, over 350 million media impressions, largely from Montebello Park's My Wine Life exhibit, as well as the Snow Globe Soiree series. They were big things that got us features as well in national um, and uh, provincial media outlets. Um, and we did get international media attention as well. We have been featured through Destination Canada, Destination Ontario. Uh, Canada.ca had us as one of their top things to do for Valentine's Day uh, to their eight, 800, or I think it's 870,000 um, subscribers. So it was a very successful year from a marketing and attendance perspective. Next slide, please. The Fall Festival specifically continued very strong growth. Uh, we we're very happy to see the tours and visitation at 47% last year. Traditionally, and about three years ago, it was in the 20s. So the fact that we're really aggressively targeting marketing campaigns outside of Niagara is paying dividends. Um, most of our visitors are also younger, and that's a deliberate choice on our part to try to bring in new audiences to uh, Niagara and to wine country. Um, and 51% of the people that attended all of the fall programming uh, were new to us. Um, so that largely comes through the Discovery Pass numbers, while we know Montebello Park remains a community favorite. Uh, last year, again, as a reminder, we changed the park layout. So we incorporated the 100-year-old Rose Garden, the beautiful tree promenade, and completely opened up the park and had overwhelmingly positive responses from the community and attendees, uh, as well as, the, as I mentioned, the My Wine Life experience, which we launched, uh, was a huge hit with the community and with families, as it was a free event at Montebello that was not directly tied to wine consumption, uh, and it increased our social engagement by 200%. We also had 31 community groups and artists from the city of St. Catharines that were featured in the Grand Parade. 
So those are just some top line highlights about what a great um, festival we had in 2019 and a bit of uh, sour grapes, if you excuse the pun, about the fact that we will be officially uh, canceling or reprogramming all of these elements for this current year in light of COVID. Evan, please, next slide. Um, so as I'm sure you can imagine, obviously when COVID hit, we are a not-for-profit association with a very uh, strict fiscal responsibility policy. So as soon as it hit, we were, um, I was immediately put on a spending freeze. We had to pause or postpone all new initiatives um, and focus on benefiting our partners, which is largely the wine and, and grape industry, as well as our tourism partners. So we focused on uh, changing all of our outbound communications to those kind of promotions and the festival itself took a back seat. Next slide, please. So here's what 2020 shall look like, a different kind of festival. So this was designed uh, for a few reasons. One, obviously to keep the festival top of mind. Secondly, to drive benefit to our partners, both in the wine industry, the city of St. Catharines and our tourism partners. Um, and also in a way for us to be able to deliver programming that was low cost both to the festival and could enable our sponsors where necessary um, to also save some funds, which we were able to do for the city. Almost 50% of the committed budget um, is going back into the city uh, coffers, which I'm sure is much needed at this point. So Montebello Park is officially uh, being canceled. Um, and instead we're gonna uh, update that with a few different campaigns. Um, we will be doing a lot of activity at wineries, extending the discovery pass period uh, the snow globe soirees will be happening at winery locations in late fall through winter. But we are going to introduce also festival streaming Saturdays. So this will be a way to sort of replicate the main stage events on Saturday nights. Uh, we already have Jonesy confirmed to play. Uh, we're going to get another headline band for that second Saturday and have a social media contest to try to encourage local artists to have a paid job playing in front of a festival audience uh, on one of the Saturdays as well as some other fun programming inter intermittently. So they'll be running both of the Saturdays that would have been Parade Saturdays in Montebello. Uh, we're doing some wine uh, at home campaigns, uh, but one of the most excited things that we have got responses from so far is the Grape and Wine Porch Parade. So figuring out a way that we can bring the parade to life was important to us, and this is our solution, which we'll get to in just a moment. Evan, if you can go to the next slide. So the Adapted Community Program uh, the downtown parade obviously can't happen in spite of uh, any loosening of the um, provincial guidelines. So we instead are doing a neighborhood initiative. We will actually bring the festival team out to neighborhoods across St. Catharines um, and then through our partnership with Meridian into other communities outside of St. Catharines to encourage community members to decorate their porches, decorate their neighborhoods. And however it works with the reopening um, framework, if it is possible to have small neighborhood parties, or social distance parties, we're gonna use all of those opportunities to get community to share the spirit of grape and wine. We'll be live streaming this on Parade Saturday. So we'll have five video teams going out across the city, as well as, um, as introducing uh, content from community partners and neighborhoods and families that are gonna send us videos and uh, photos. So we're really gonna see the spirit of grape and wine and the spirit of St. Catharines come to life through this new Meridian Porch Parade. There's gonna to be tons of um, advanced activities as well. We're going out to local businesses to try to get them engaged through our partnership with Meridian. Um, so this is really gonna be something that's gonna launch quietly in the next couple of weeks, but will be the focus of our entire summer campaign. Next slide, please. As mentioned, we'll also be doing winery focused programming. So through the festival and our partnerships, we have allowed um, technology solutions to come to wineries at a much more affordable cost. One is a reservation system. So people visiting the wineries during our Discovery Pass programs can book their, um, their appointments. So they will not be waiting in line. They will not be worried about crowding. A second thing we're launching, which is very exciting, is a digital self-guided tour of the winery. So each one will be customized to that winery property, allows the winery to do tutored tastings, walk through the vineyards. So it really gives community um, members and visitors an opportunity to experience experience a winery tour without that proximity to another tour guide or being in large groups. This is also a fun thing we can send out at winery to home uh, or also through social media channels. So people all across the province and the country can get a little taste of wine country while they're sipping Niagara VQA wine. Um, and as mentioned, the summer snow globe soiree dining series now will move into the vineyard starting in late September. 
and going right through until uh, the end of um, December. Evan, next slide, please. So a quick look at the revised funding model. So again, as mentioned, uh, we wanted to find a way that understanding that our programming has changed significantly and we will not have Montebello Park as our anchor festival that we know uh, drives so much benefit to the city. We wanted to find a way that we could try to pull back our budget and pare back our budget in consideration of all the extra expenses that the city is obviously undertaking with COVID. So what we refer to as value and kind services because that's what they are to us, but those are all the contract services and non-cash uh, sponsorship elements through the city. We've reduced by $35,300. The $10,000 that's remaining in there would be things that we would use to activate uh, any programming that the city chooses to have us partner with. So if we come in as a partnership or event management partner um, and we might need fencing or, or other support from the city, road closure things, we wanted to leave an amount of, of money in the budget just in case that happens. Uh, the Ice Wine Festival sponsorship, it was pro the program will be executed as planned. Homegrown Festival, unfortunately, was canceled. We did a digital version instead, so we removed that completely from the budget. But we are asking for the full festival allocation for fall because these initiatives, while different from what we've done in the past, uh, require a considerable amount of, of planning for our small team uh, and will be, in many ways, um, the festival reaching more people from a face-to-face -face and a, a hand-holding perspective than any programming we've ever done. So it's more of a hand sell um, and an opportunity for us to work with partners in brand new ways, engage sponsors in new ways, and more importantly, engage the community in many different ways. Um, and the last thing I would like to note is that we are really carefully, I know as you are as well, following the province's reopening framework. So as those things change and adapt, we can either introduce or scale back elements of programming uh, based on what that looks like but under no circumstance will the parade happen downtown or will Montebello Park be able to happen. We'll just enhance these, um, these initiatives that we've discussed. And uh, that's the end of my presentation. Again, a huge thanks to Brian and his team. They've been so helpful uh, helping us pull this together. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor and councillors. Thank you very much, Ms. Anderson. Uh, to the Director of Economic Development, do you have anything to add that uh, you wanna put into this before we go to questions? Uh, three, Mr. Mayor. I think Dorian's done an excellent job summarizing uh, how the how the wine festival um, can operate in a different way. So um, while respecting the reopening framework. So we had a lot of discussion. I think there's significant savings, but it's still an important festival for this community and to Niagara. And it's an opportunity to um, experience it in a different manner. Okay, thank you to the director. I'm just going to go to the board member, uh, Councillor Phillips, then uh, Councillor Miller. Mr. Phillips. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'll find a question here somewhere, I'm sure, because I know I'm supposed to have one. But anyway, uh, first of all, I, I just want to thank the members of the, of the board of the Great Wine Festival. They, uh, we've sat through many meetings and uh, they've come up with ideas. And Doria uh, is, as you can see, very creative in her um, in creating this. She could, we very easily could have said, no, we're not doing anything. Great Wine Festival, we're not going to have it this year. But now she's brought something to life that I think the residents are going to uh, really, really respond to uh, good support from the wineries. And to be honest, I think the wineries should be very thankful to the Great Wine Festival uh, for the support they're going to get from this. Uh, to Mr. To, uh, Director York, uh, I, in my mind, this is going to be a uh, something that we're going to need your department to really advertise for us to get out there. How do you see that going to be done? Well, through, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to the councillors, Councillor Phillips, um, I mean, social media is probably the easiest way to get the word out there and we'll certainly help market it in any manner we can. Um, and as far as, as we can with the budget that we have. So we have to be respectful of all the money uh, or what's left of our budget. Um, it's taxpayers' money. So we'll do it in an effective manner. We promise you that. Well, the Great Wine Festival Board is returning money to the city. So perhaps some of that money could be used go to economic development to do that perhaps but uh, anyways I, I just want to thank Dorian uh, uh, not very often do we have a board coming to uh, council returning money uh, that they were given uh, and uh, I'm sure that the board could have spent it if they really really wanted to but they didn't need to and uh, I'd like to thank them for uh, their honesty in returning that those funds to the city thank you Mr. Mayor 
Thank you, and thank you for your, your leadership on the board, Councillor. I know you've been on there for a number of years, and it's uh, great, great to, to see the efforts that are coming out of it. Councillor Miller, you are up. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ms. Anderson, for joining us. Uh, as you may remember, last year I asked about uh, the presence of migrant workers at the at the festival, um, and there was they were part uh, of the parade a bit. But you know, I think uh, part of the thinking was there there might be a larger role moving forward. Obviously, COVID nineteen uh, you know has, has really changed this year's festival. Um, but additionally, it's, it's highlighted a lot of the misery that a lot of these migrant workers uh, live in, and work under, both in Niagara and, and throughout Ontario. We, we've seen some die, and, and it's highlighted the lack of protections. So I, you know, I, I guess I'm a little bit concerned throwing a celebration while, while this, uh, this is in the news, and, and we're finally starting to sort of have this conversation about, uh, about migrant workers. Is there thought to somehow including them uh, and, and if not their plight, but just just their role in the community, their importance, their their sort of the nature um, to the Niagara wine industry has, has that been uh, considered again this year? Uh, well, it's definitely something. It was one of the things in our our uh, takeaways from last year uh, in our post event report. Um, to be honest, at this point, it hasn't been considered yet. All of this that, that I presented has happened in the last three weeks. So we had to wait until we got Celebrate Ontario funding before we could have any chance of moving any programming forward. Um, I will discuss it with the board and see if we find that there's an appropriate way to incorporate it. I'm not sure this will be the year, however, because there really um, there might be things we can do through social media and, and through our digital channels. But uh, to be honest, there's a lot of competing messaging happening right now. So I want to make sure that we are getting the safety, um, the safe visitation message out first, um, as our goal is to really help the tourism and wine industries stay viable and be sustainable because there's, I'm not sure how much you've heard from the grape and wine industry, but they've suffered significantly as well. So we're trying to make sure that that industry is staying healthy enough for us to have festivals and these partners next year. But I will definitely make note of it. And uh, we have a, a, our next board meeting with a programming update. I'll make sure that we um, add that to our agenda for discussion to see how we feel I uh, best would be incorporated. Uh, yeah, I appreciate that. I think, you know, it's an important platform that the that the board and the festival has. And, and this is, you know, obviously a critical issue. So certainly I'm never going to stop asking you about it. Um, and I appreciate that, that you're going to bring it to the board because, it, you know, it, it. I just I can't overstate how important it is to start uh, having this conversation and start doing better by these members of our community. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Miller. Councillor Porter, you're up. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thanks, Dorian, for your presentation. Um, I think COVID is making us all innovate and I think there's a real opportunity with these kind of porch parties to um, have some real grassroots involvement in uh, grape and wine and may maybe even change things in the future. I just wondered if um, anyone on the board has thought about um, just or board ideas from New Orleans. They have their crews and there are tons and tons of these crews, K-R-E-W-E, which are like social organizations that put together parties and parades. And there's huge ones that have been in the community for 100 years. And then there's um, a crew for dogs and they have a dog parade. I was wondering if you thought through how the like porch parties or the neighborhood uh, groups could work. I, I, I'm in a neighborhood association. Um, and I also have a bit of a street um, Thing happening on my street where we often um, get together we still we socially distance but get together but I could see us participating um, officially in the grape and wine parade so has that been thought through and have you looked at places like New Orleans where um, pe these crews actually do their own fundraising um, and they really um, they really add to and expand to uh, the Mardi Gras experience without uh, putting additional costs on the city because they do their own they do their own fundraising. Um, I'm also thinking that um, some of the neighborhood associations or little porch parties could order wine or food from various restaurants. Um, I'm just wondering if that's part of the thinking. I'm actually quite excited about it if you haven't haven't been able to tell. Well, it's almost like you've been sitting in our meetings. Um, yes, New Orleans was definitely part of the inspiration, as was uh, Portland had a big rose festival that they converted to a porch festival as well. 
because it was the largest fest or parade that they had in their community. So yes, there's a few things that we've rolled out. Um, we so Meridian has come on as our title sponsor, so they are gonna they are striking a committee to make sure that you know all the different neighborhoods are um, are engaged. However, neighborhood associations and BIAs were also on our target list as part of our outreach. Uh, so we are going to be going out to those communities, giving them ideas and, and concepts. Um, we have actually a what we're calling the festival wine pack, so people can order. Um, whether it's a six pack of different wines from different VQA wineries or, you know, special gifts and prizes that are going to be packed in, but there will be a festival winery pack that people can order from winery to home. Um, local restaurants, we're also going to have them come up with tailgate uh, dining packs that people can have delivered or do curbside pickup as well. So we're really going to try to create a neighborhood, like basically give people the tools and options to have a neighborhood party. A couple other things through this. So the streaming Saturdays and the Unlap Parade Saturday, we're gonna have contests for different community groups as well. So there'll be, um, you know, some will be fun, easy little prizes, but we're actually gonna offer up a couple places in the Grand Parade in 2021. So whatever neighborhoods, for example, you know, has show the most spirit will be given a complimentary entry into the Grand Parade. But I do think there's some great legacy opportunities here to keep this whole porch parade concept as part of a grape and wine extension. So um, yeah, if you have some ideas, uh, Councillor Porter, I'd love to get offline and chat with you about them. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm full of ideas, executions and other, and other stories, but all right. That's thanks. what I'm good at, that's perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Porter. <laughs> uh, I think that's it for the questions of council, which is great. Um, I need a mover, I'll take Councillor Phillips to move the presentation, seconded by Councillor uh, Cisco, all in favor of accepting the presentation, that's carried. Uh, and I will say uh, to Ms. Anderson, thank you very much. As a former board member of the Niagara Gape Wine Festival, uh, you have done an, an, an amazing job of, of really bringing the festival to a new dynamic level using digital media and using really innovative ways to breathe life into different parts of it. So kudos to your, you and your team. and. Looking forward to, as we get through this, um, the situation we're in today, to see even, even greater ideas come from, from you and your team, because it is a special festival that holds a, a lot of memories for a lot of folks. Uh, so with that, I'll look to the clerk to call a question. Did you get a, move, a mover and seconder, I'm sorry, for the motion? on the floor oh, i did not <laughs> councillor uh, phillips is the board member again and this time i'll go with uh councillor townsend sorry about that to the clerk appreciate that okay. all right councillor phillips yes councillor porter yes councillor cisco yes councillor sorrento yes councillor townsend yes councillor williamson Yes. Councillor Miller? Yes. Councillor Littleton? Yes. Councillor Kushner? Yes. Councillor Harris? Yes. Councillor Garcia? Yes. Councillor Dodge? Yes. And Mayor Sensick? Yes. Carried unanimously. All right. Thank you very much for that. 3.2. We're looking to uh, a motion for legal and clerk services, motion regarding body cameras for police officers and comments from Anti-Racism Advisory Committee. So council will hear a delegation from the chair of the Anti-Racism Advisory Committee. Uh, Salah was a, was a door, uh, uh, I get this, sorry, sorry Salah. Was it- Not as bad as Srebrenica, but- uh... <laughs> Oh, I knew someone was gonna call me on that. <laughs> was it Duran? Uh, Wazirudin, yes. Was uh, it... Th thank you for your time, mayor and councilors. I'm Saleh Wazirudin, Chair of the Anti-Racism Advisory Committee, your Anti-Racism Advisory Committee. In your meeting where you brought forward the, referred the resolution on body cameras, you said you wanted to expand beyond body cameras and your residents responded. Not just your Anti-Racism Committee, but residents gave uh, oral delegations, spoken delegations, written delegations. We also had many consultations and we had conversations for years about these re police reforms, including with police and with the Canadian Mental Health Association. And I showed some of their forms at the, um, well, all their forms that the committee came up with to a McMaster professor who studies police reforms. And without him knowing that I was involved, he said that it was very comprehensive and covered all of the issues uh, in, that have been discussed in police reforms over the last couple of years. 
So your residents want to see you move this forward. And I think you can pass these reforms as one motion. I'd like to encourage you to do that. I do want to spend a little time addressing or explaining one reform that may uh, be unnecessarily controversial because of the wording. And it's about reallocating funds or, or defunding, as some say. The fact is, even the police services board is saying, don't look at the police to solve social problems, fund civilian services instead. 11% of the 2018 calls were for welfare checks, mental health, or suicide threats, which don't need an armed response. And under the Police Services Act, it's the police chief and board who decides what is adequate policing. So we as a residents, including you, have the right to say, uh, we want these three kinds of calls, welfare checks, mental health, and suicide threats outside of policing, and have the police figure out the new requirements of what is adequate and come back to the region with the revised budget, which will let the region shift the funds. So it's not really that controversial or strange to have the reallocation of funds. It brings together what's been discussed over the last few years. Uh, otherwise, I'm, I'm here to answer any questions you have uh, about um, any of the reforms, and I don't want to take up too much of your time tonight. Uh, thank you very much, Soleil. It's greatly appreciated the leadership that you're showing on the, the committee as well. It's great that uh, you took time out today. I have Councillor Porter uh, with some questions. Yes, um, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, the presenter, thank you, uh, Sele, um, for your work on the Anti-Racism Committee. I watched the meeting. Um, I'm personally struggling with um, body cameras. I, um, I think uh, if you read uh, lots of uh, studies, there's a, it's quite divided. Um, I do support everything else uh, in the report, and I think that the reallocation of funds um, for me is what is actually most important. Um, it, what do you think is the most, uh, I know all of it's probably important, but what do you think is the most important or what would you like to see um, if you, as the priority or that you would like Niagara Region to take most seriously um, from your recommendations from the motion? Well, through, through your worship, um, the good news is a lot of these reforms are really low hanging fruit. Um, they're long overdue. Um, body cameras is one, ending street checks is another one. I do want to address body cameras as you as you brought it up. And there's been a lot of controversy about this in discussions about police reforms in general, because there may there are many studies that show that it doesn't do what some people think it that the body cameras would do. But body cameras really the, the people who want the body cameras, and we had um, black residents give spoken and written delegations specifically asking for body cameras. The reason is not because we, they, we believe that the body cameras themselves, but just by having them, are going to reduce uh, disproportionate violence or anything like that. It's just that it's a tool that's available whenever there is an incident that, among other tools, you can use body camera footage. Maybe it will help, maybe it won't help. But just for having that tool, just for that one value, it's worth it just, just to, uh, to ask for it. Um, and to have it for the people who do who are in favor of it. So by itself, it's it's not a solution either. But these are some really easy ones that can make a big difference. Uh, body cameras, street checks, uh, releasing information that is um, already collected is just not publicized. Um, so those are some of the easy ones that can make a big difference, I think. Yes, I think there's some easy ones and there's the, the ones that actually cost money or it have an impact to the budget. So I think that was what I was getting at. Um, with all municipalities facing budget constraints uh, at this moment, um, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but if you had a choice between uh, um, asking the NRP to reallocate funds or implement body cameras, what do you think would be most effective? Well, you know, personally, I think if they sold the armored vehicle um, and it, it that that would free up a lot of, a lot of money that they could use for things. I don't think the body cameras will be well as has been stated. It's not the body cameras themselves that are as expensive. It's the um, the data. But I think there is something that seems contradictory. That on the one hand we want to reallocate funds from the police. On the other hand, we want to spend money on police reforms. But I think we do need both. It it sounds like they're two opposite things, but really they're not. On one hand, on the one hand, you're reallocating funds by shifting the police calls to civilian, uh, to where the, to, to the civilian, a civilian service. But at the same time, we do still need to 
to spend on body cameras or an ombudsman, uh, different costs like that to have to strengthen um, the uh, civilian uh, interests um, with, with the police to, to have more control over the police. So I think it's, it's, it's tempting to say that let's just go for whatever is not going to cost any money, but I think we, we do need both kinds of reforms. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Porter. Um, I don't see any other hands up. So Soleil, thank you very much again for, for being here. I, I imagine you'll stay on the, the Zoom platform as we have a discussion of council. And again, thank you for your leadership on, on what you're doing with the Anti-Racism Committee. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, so um, motion to receive presentation. Councillor Miller, seconded by Councillor Phillips. And all in favor of receiving the presentation. That's carried. And now I move on to the motion. So if Evan, you could pull up the motion onto the screen. I have Councillor Cisco, who is making a motion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we are uh, putting in place of the original motion, the expanded motion that came from the, uh, the Anti-Racism Committee. And I'll start by thanking Sally and the Anti-Racism Committee. They did a lot of work uh, very quickly uh, after the original motion was referred to them to collect information and uh, feedback from the community and it was sincerely appreciated. And I think the, uh, the expanded motion gets to where we wanted it to go. Uh, at the time before we referred the motion, I said that the hope was that uh, we'd be able to get a broader motion, which really uh, addresses a lot of the concerns that our, uh, our community and the communities within our community uh, have had uh, with policing in general. Uh, and I think this motion does a good job of doing that. I, I will say, and the, the point was made, I've done a lot of reading about body cameras and the research behind body cameras as well. And to Sally's point, um, while the body cameras may not change necessarily the behavior, they do still provide an accountability tool. Uh, and a lot of the research does indicate that that uh, does exist, but that the behavioral changes that some are hoping for don't happen. Uh, so I think it's an important part of the motion. Um, I, I will also address because, uh, you know, there is a lot of controversy around the phrase defunding. Uh, and the motion really speaks to reassessing uh, the police services budget. And I think there is a, uh, a necessary step that has to occur there as well. Uh, I, I will be the first one to admit in the past, I've pushed very hard for things like the foot patrols, which are specifically mentioned uh, in, the, uh, in the motion that came from the anti-racism committee. And at the time when we were discussing the need for a foot patrol in the downtown, uh, I think a number of us, myself included, stated that it wasn't simply a matter of increasing police presence. We needed other social services there. Uh, and we have seen the addition of a police presence, uh, but those additional social services haven't seemed to, to follow. And with everything that's going on in society now and with the research that a lot of us have availed ourselves of, um, it seems to be that those social services are the key point. And so when it comes to looking at the way funding is dispersed at the region, I think it's something that the region and the police services board need to do. Uh, to look at whether there are better situations, because I think the reality speaks to many of our, many of the, the members of our community uh, saying that police presence and uh, the police showing up to every situation isn't, isn't the right response. Um, and, and we see this across North America, many police services, many police chiefs stating very clearly that the police should not always be the first choice. Uh, and if you look out West, uh, I am doing some of the research around this motion, looking to programs like the CAHOOTS program uh, in, I believe it's Oregon, where uh, a lot of people, uh, or a lot of uh, calls to 911 that in other places would go to the police, wind up going to a social services, uh, and they're able to dispatch people without armed officers, which are able to de-escalate situations and to provide help and direct uh, the people in those situations to the services they require. Uh, there's a, a program with the RCMP in Surrey, and I, I wish I could remember that, I believe it's called CAR 51, uh, or it might be CAR 7, I can't remember the number, but uh, it's a program specific to the RCMP in Surrey, where, again, rather than off armed officers being sent to certain situations, uh, social uh, service workers and outreach workers are sent instead. And in speaking to RCMP officers who worked in Surrey, they, they said that that program was much better. Uh, it, uh, it led to a lot of de-escalation in situations that could have turned deadly uh, and wound up 
uh, having positive outcomes. So I think in its entirety, uh, this uh, this motion is a good one. And again, I appreciate the hard work that the anti-racism committee did uh, in a very short time frame to address a lot of the concerns that the community has. Uh, I hope the council will pass this. I hope it passes unanimously. And I look forward to the conversation that I think needs to happen at the region uh, with both the membership of the police services board, but with regional council as a whole to try and reform the Niagara Regional Police, but also recognize that we need increased funding in other areas of service uh, across Niagara Region, uh, because if we want better outcomes for everybody in our community, if we want everybody to feel like a part of the community, um, it, it can't simply just be a, uh, a first resort and a last resort to always send the police to every call. I think uh, a lot of this speaks to the need for major reforms, and I, I hope that St. Catharines can lead the charge and that Niagara Region can lead the charge uh, in Canada in being the first to implement very important reforms. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cisco, for that. And I got, I got a couple of speakers. I got Councillor Miller, Councillor Garcia, Councillor Townsend. Councillor Miller, you're up. Yeah, I just want to say, uh, obviously, thanks to the Anti-Racism Committee for the work on this. I, you know, the one point, you know, I certainly in support of all their reforms. I think they go a, a bit further than, than some of the conversations locally that have been being had. So I appreciate that's not an easy um, task to, to have to carry that forward as the anti, you know, as, as mostly racialized people to be the ones asking for it. Um, and so I certainly appreciate that they took that on. I, you know, I, I would just say we shouldn't be afraid of, of using the word defunding. The Niagara Regional Police budget is, is nearly tripled in 20 years uh, from around 60 million to around 170 million now. Um, a lot of that may be due to 9-11. Was happening around uh, the early 2000s. You, you saw the budget jump, you know, 15 percent uh, a lot of years. Uh, and obviously, you know, you just have to look outside. Certainly, my ward to see that things like housing and community services have not seen their budget triple. And I, you know, I, I think that's the conversation. And, and maybe you know, to to Councillor Cisco's good point that it shouldn't just be about. It's not we're reducing the police budget because we we don't like the police necessarily. Uh, but it's about safety in our community. And, and I think that our community would be a lot safer if we tripled the budget of Niagara Regional Housing and tripled the budget of community services and uh, increase, uh, you know, the, the social safety net for people through through welfare and ODSP and, and programs like that. So it's about where our priorities are at. And I, you know, I'm, I'm certainly happy to, to, to say we should be having the conversation about where those priorities are. And, and I think they're misplaced right now. So I uh, certainly hope the police services board and, and Niagara region itself will really look at, uh, we'll look at their budget moving forward. And, and thanks again. Thank you, Councillor, Councillor Miller, Councillor Garcia. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just need some clarification and I'm not sure if I should address this too, but uh, uh, the motion that we had on the agenda was much more compact. This is very lengthy and um, without being able to read it all at once here on, law, on, on the screen, uh, I'm trying to understand if somewhere in here does it say that, that this be a recommendation to Niagara Region or to Niagara Regional Police Service, because obviously we don't control their budget. So um, it says be resolved that councils endorse the following recommendations, but does it say somewhere that these recommendations be forwarded to the Niagara region or where, where does that happen? Councilor Garcia, I think you're actually correct. There's, there's no, in just from a technical term, uh, there is no, there's not, the, if we lived in a vacuum, uh, we, this motion would let us to believe that we actually are oversight of the Niagara region police. Councilor Cisco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the intention, uh, this this motion was all in the minutes uh, that are a part of the uh, of today's uh, agenda. Uh, the intention was that the final clause um, from the original or the last two clauses of the original motion that these uh, call on the Niagara Region through the Police Services Board uh, to to begin this process, and then it be forwarded on to lo all local municipalities. And I apologize for the lack of clarification, but those should be the final two clauses of this motion that we are requesting that the Niagara region implement what is called for here and that it be forwarded to the appropriate bodies. Councillor Garcia. Okay, thank you. 
So I will just say, Mr. Mayor, that that second last clause does need to be slightly changed uh, to the police services uh, board to immediately begin the process of implementing the above recommendations. And that is correct. Okay. Councilor Garcia. That's okay, uh, Mr. Mayor. At least I understand what we're, how the action is being taken from here. Thanks for the clarification. Uh, Councilor Townsend, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you, a uh, special thank you to the uh, St. Catharines Anti-Racism Committee and Soleil for all the work they've put in. Uh, there's there's definitely a lot of a lot of information that they've provided, and I think that's wonderful. Uh, I think that. Um, Full disclosure: I'm, I'm not fully aware of all these these programs. I'm wondering if there could be an opportunity for us to, um, similar to what we did today, where we had Dr. Hershey come and answer some questions for us. Uh, would it be would there be a possibility where we could have the police chief maybe come and answer some some questions regarding some of the programs? Uh, because my only concern with this is um, I'm not sure which what programs the Niagara Regional Police currently do offer. And my concern with this might be that some of the programs uh, that are being suggested or recommended here, they may already do. So I'm wondering if there would be an opportunity to invite to a future meeting uh, the police chief to maybe answer any questions that we may have about some of these programs. Okay, I'll look to the CAO uh, just in terms of the process. So we would, we would extend an invite to the chief of police um, send him the outline of what the committee has recommended, they would, he would address that and then we could re reconvene this portion. Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor, certainly we can do that. We would be sending him the entire motion so that he's, he's prepared for all the intricacies of it. And then we can either have him just come for questions or um, address all of the individual items that may be very lengthy, but perhaps just a questioning, question answer session such as we had today. Okay, so um, to the clerk, how is that accomplished as Councillor Townsend is speaking to this motion currently? For you, Mr. Mayor, Councillor, if Councillor Townsend would then have to ask for a deferral. Just sorry, point of order, can we get clarification if this already occurred at the committee level? Did they already talk to the police? I'm just I, I'm just worried we're, we're doubling up here. Through you, Mr. Mayor, I'm not aware of that. Saleh may know. Saleh, Chair. Uh, through you, Mr. Mr. Your Worship, uh, we had extensive conversations with the police on all of these issues. Uh, for example, with the street checks, uh, the information was from the police board staff. I talked with uh, Superintendent David Mead on the training program and uh, several of the other programs. I talked with the Canadian Mental Health Association uh, the Canadian Mental Health Association director who does the um, first intervention training program about the training program. So each of these, I was very careful to actually talk with the people who are actually involved with it. Um, to Councillor Miller's question, were they at the committee, I guess? Is that Councillor Miller re asking was the police at the committee? Yeah, I guess I, yeah, I guess my concern is that we, we task the committee with this work, they do the work, and then we say, well, we want to double check it sort of thing. I, you know, I, I'm not sure that that's really respectful of the committee. But your question was, did the, was the police at the committee level? Is that your question? Yeah, were, were, was this, was their recommendations as, as contained in the minutes informed by conversations with the police? Yes, they're all from conversations with the, with the police. Um, I, I went through several channels to, uh, to make sure I was talking to you the right people and uh, they're all um yeah made, made sure that all, for all of these uh, that i have um what what's actually being done currently so that we can address that and i think in the background or you'll find that for each of their forms you'll find the information i got from the police uh, including from the hot commander level um, officials and that this is based on what we got from them okay councillor miller uh was a point of point of information yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I, I guess I just, I, I don't really see the need, but fair enough. Okay, uh, so go to Councillor Townsend for- Yeah, so thank you, Mr. Mayor. And to Councillor Miller's point, this is in no way to insult the committee or anything. 
Uh, this is, I just want some answers. I just want to understand further. And I think it would provide an opportunity for councillors to also understand and be educated on the programs that Niagara Regional Police do offer. Um, the chair, Saleh, also did say, when I, it stood out to me, he did say that the police chief, he's aware of what adequate policing is. I would, essentially, I just would like to hear what the police chief has to say about it. And I don't see any, any issue with that going forward. I think it's an opportunity for us to educate ourselves with the NRP and what, what is being offered right now. Okay. So I would ask for the deferral and the council to support that until we can have the police chief chime in on this. The clerk, um, I just wanna get clarification. So he's already spoke to the motion um, procedurally. Can, he, can Councillor Townsend ask for a deferral? Yes, he can. I didn't think you could, sorry, I thought. I apologize. I thought, I'm sorry. What what I thought Councillor Townsend was doing is just clarifying, and I thought those were all questions of clarity. I didn't. There was no sort of questions about the body of the motion. Okay, a motion to defer uh, pending a presentation by the um, chief of police um, at the earliest possible date. Councillor Townsend. Yes. No, I just well, want to yeah. make sure that you're. The, what, yes. That's what I'm asking for, yeah. Okay, point of order from who? Point of order, yeah. Mr. Williamson. Yes, please, Mr. I was calling it, is that, is that Councillor Williamson on point of order as go well? Ahead, go ahead, Sal, go ahead. Thank you, thank you. Mr. Mayor, <clears throat> I believe that we can only send correspondence and I'm just gonna ask a procedural question because I went through this before in 2016. So we as a council can send correspondence so I think what we would have been voting on tonight would it be just to send correspondence to the police services board. I don't see uh, what the practicality of, I, I, of having the chief come and speak to correspondence because it would have to go to the police services board and then they would have to, they would have to, to make the decision at that level. I know that we can have correspondence. So, I guess my question is, is it really necessary when what we would be voting on is just ultimately, even after the presentation, is whether or not to send the correspondence and we probably, we, we likely would. Uh, yeah, I think what Councillor Towns is pointing out is the word endorses in here, Councillor Sorrento. You're being asked okay. to endorse everything. It's not simply sending something up for communication, for information. You're actually endorsing positions. So well, I didn't think we could do that, Mr. Mayor. Okay, so I don't want to get into the debate, but I don't care. No, I'm not. I'm not debating. I'm just procedural just, question. Okay. Uh, well, okay. All right. Councilor Williamson. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would just like to also add uh, the Police Services Board as well, since they are the uh, decision-making body. Niagara Regional Police Services Board. Invite the entire board. You can invite the chair. So the chair of the board. The chair, yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is defer. This is for a deferral, so it's non-debatable. Um, I'm looking through the clerk. Is there enough information that can be provided? Through you, Mr. Mayor. There's enough information for the deferral. However, I'll need I'll need to do a roll call because I can't see everybody on the screen. Okay. Point of order, Mayor. Cisco. I just I'm just I have a question with respect to the the second part there. We're talking about a recommendation that we would be sending to the police services board why would we be asking the police services board chair to come and give us advice on the recommendation that we're going to send to the board so, i can i don't agree I, I mean without debating the merits of the the police chief i don't understand the second part of the deferral look i i, I added them so i'll speak to that they're, they're duly elected to serve on that board and they're the decision making body so why wouldn't they be included in the decision making process they ultimately they have, but they would be included in the decision-making process when they make a decision related to this. We're talking about endorsing a recommendation that we think we should send to them to make a decision about. Okay, so let's just well, um, motions on the floor. We want to have a debate between council. Um, Evan, can you just put the motion back on the screen, please? Okay, go up to the top, please. So just in terms of the deferral, if, if this goes through, it's an endorse the recommendation. So go down to the bottom now. 
and it's endorsed the recommendations and then um, immediately begin the process of implementing. So I think the, the request is to get the, get the NRP, the chief, and now the chair to provide context for that so we can look at what the immediately begin the process is rather than just endorse. Uh, by, by looks of this motion, it's also not just endorsing, but telling them to immediately put into place these, these actions. So we'll just go to I'll go to the clerk for the for the vote. Through you, Mr. Mayor, I need a move. Is it Councillor Townsend? And I, we got a seconder. I'll Councillor second. Williamson. Okay. Okay. Councillor Dodge. Uh, yes. Councillor Garcia. Yes. Councillor Harris. He's a conflict. Oh, sorry, conflict. Uh, Councillor Kushner. Yes. Councillor Littleton? No. Councillor Miller? No. Councillor Phillips? Councillor Phillips? Councillor Phillips? I'll come back. Councillor Porter? No. Councillor Cisco? No. Councillor Sorrento? No. Councillor Townsend? Yes. Councillor Williamson? Yes. Mayor Senzik? Yes. Councillor Phillips says yes. Councillor Phillips says yes. Five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five. And that's carried. So we do have a meeting on July 27th, I believe, to the clerk. And I think that would be a the, the earliest possible date. And then if that, this motion can be provided, and then that'll be a, that'll be an agenda item that can be discussed. And I, I think uh, the, to, to chair Salah, I think having you there as well, if you can make time again, uh, to provide some context as well. Okay. So we'll try and get to this in the next two weeks as well. And hopefully the, the chief or the deputy chief and the chair can be there. Okay, um, next on the list, the office of the CAO, and this is the update I call upon what would be the deputy CAO, David Oaks, to provide an overview of the report. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I know we have a full agenda tonight, so I'll uh, keep my comments brief. Is um, This marks our seventh update report um, regarding the, the COVID-19 um, COVID update. Um, <clears throat> At the last, or since the last council meeting of June 22nd, we've been able to open um, several amenities across the city, including splash pads, Garden City Golf Course, uh, Victoria Lawn Cemetery, and our beaches. Um, so I'm just going to provide a quick overview of, of some of those and some of the issues that we've uh, been identified and a couple other um, highlights um, to provide to council. So um, our aquatics team from CRCS and the facilities team from EFES have done a great job of um, getting the splash pads open. Um, we've had very good positive comments from, from the public in terms of how the, how the, the um, aquatics team is managing the sanitation, the cleanliness of the washrooms, and it's just a testament to the, to the staff. So uh, the hours of operations are typically 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. However, um, 2020 is the year of heat amongst other things. So um, we've had quite a few heat advisories since opening, so the um, the hours have been extended from 9 a.m. until 8 p.m. to provide that um, support to to the residents. And um, just to give a, a a sense of use across the the various um, splash pads, they range from anywhere between 100 110 um, people per day up to 275 at at Pearson Park. So they are seeing a lot of usage. Um, the usage is monitored. We have um, identified times where um, they go in and, and clean the facilities. So the numbers aren't as, as large as what they would have been in the past, but they are significant. So um, just a shout out to, to uh, all the uh, team members who've been a part of that. In terms of the Garden City Golf Course, it's been open for approximately uh, just over a week. So the numbers um, from July 6th until today um, essentially what we're able to show is 360 um, rounds of 18 holes have been played um, 
as of um, as of today, and an additional 319 rounds of nine holes have been played. So it is getting a, a, a significant amount of usage um, for the first week, um, and we'll continue to monitor that as uh, as we go through the the summer. I'm going to come to beaches um, in a little bit, but I, I wanted to highlight. Um, as we've heard from Dr. Hergy that we're moving from stage two, or we could be moving from stage two to stage three in the next several weeks. Um, one of the things that we've been doing, and it's included in our recovery plan, is um, having more services available to the public um, online. So our IT team has been um, working with all the departments to develop a appointment booking app for the public to uh, essentially allow residents to have the ability to book appointments with city staff for a variety of items, um, ranging from parking, um, tax licensing, or planning and building services. Um, the intent uh, for this app is uh, it's currently in the testing phase, but it will be ready in the next, uh, I believe, in the next several weeks. So it's an exciting piece of innovation, as we like to um, call it, when we, we start to um, manage the numbers of the public coming into the building and managing how um, the public's able to interact with our staff. So. Um, again, it's it's a it's a good testament to um, some of the innovation that we're able to to move forward with. Uh, in terms of beaches, um, I think we all, um, in particular the uh, the counselors in in the wards with with uh, the beaches, um, we've seen uh, a combination of things from weather to um, lack of amenities. Parks are are not to full capacity. We don't have organized sport. So there's a pent up demand within the community and people are, um, you combine that with the weather, um, people wanna be outdoors with the heat and we're seeing a, a significant influx um, of demand to the beaches. And um, we'd mentioned in the last report, um, some mitigation measures that we're working on. And I'll just go over a, a few of those at, at this point. Um, the, the team in Municipal Works has been working very um, diligently to keep the, the beaches groomed, uh, manage the litter, keep the washroom facilities um, up to uh, a level of, of sanitation um, that is required for, for COVID. Um, unfortunately, it, at Sunset Beach in particular, we just, the amenities are um, minimal. We're having a tough time getting portable um, washroom facilities. So the um, uh, the demand on the beach has caused some some issues within the within the beach area, and that's that's um, sort of overflowed into the neighborhood. So one of the things that we had uh, done uh, July third was to engage a, a company to help us with security patrols. And Sunset Beach, we have um, security staff at the beach on weekends, um, essentially from, from opening to closing. And on weekdays, we have um, staff on the beach as well from, from the afternoon until closing to help our uh, municipal work staff um, deal with the, the work that they need to do, but also manage some of the, um, the issues that we're seeing when it comes to limiting the numbers of people coming into the beach, managing social distancing, and trying to um, deal with um, behavior that isn't appropriate at a beach, whether that's fires, whether that's smoking, whether that's alcohol. Um, so all of these issues have um, compounded. And um, as we continue to evolve and every weekend we have a, a bit of a debrief and try to reassess, um, we're starting now to see a bit of a spillover um, specifically into Lakeside as well. And I, I should note that the patrols um, at both Sunset and Lakeside Beach. We, we don't currently have um, full-time security staff at Lakeside, but we do have patrols. So um, the security company is going down three times um, a day, evening into night to um, walk the beach to um, make sure that once closed at nine o'clock that anybody on after hours is, um, is asked to, to, be, um, to leave the, uh, the premises due to, uh, based on the bylaws. So, we have had compliance um, with that when when our uh, when the teams are going out there. Unfortunately, not having you know 24/7 eyes on the the properties, there's there's going to be um, issues that that result. So as we continue to evolve, we're looking at adjusting the hours and, and the type of service that we're providing in, in both beaches. 
Um, specific to Sunset Beach, um, there have been a lot of neighborhood issues with relation to parking in prohibited areas, um, people um, parking in front of driveways, parking in front of um, hydro um, areas, blocking access for EMS and fire. Um, so we've had uh, parking enforcement um, go out and right now you'll see, you would have seen on the consent agenda, a report that will be tabled for public meeting, um, next council meeting to increase the parking fines um, to provide more of a deterrent for people who are right now, um, the $30 fine isn't, um, isn't creating a, a deterrent. So that would apply not only to the Sunset Beach, it would also include um, areas in and around Lakeside and Port Dalhousie, Jones Beach, as well as the, um, the, the road in and around Morningstar Mill. So our, our four big areas that we're seeing a high level of um, parking um, that's causing issues um, for the public ro roadway as well as EMS. Um, as, we, as we continue to, to move forward with, um, with these programs, um, we're starting to see the issues at Sunset Beach compound into Port Dalhousie. So um, we're working on a plan to, to address that issue now as well. Um, as, as part of all of this, um, there's been a, a significant amount of social media communication, um, signage is being installed within the beaches. We put par parking prohibition signs in, in various neighborhoods, including tow-away zones. So this weekend, we actually uh, believe we towed seven vehicles um, in and around Sunset Beach. Um, some of these deterrents we're hoping are, are going to help to, to mitigate that, um, the, the added pressure that we're seeing particularly on the, the beach areas in Morningstar Mill. So um, as we continue to, to address these issues, um, we continue to ratchet up the, the types of services that we need to do, whether it's increased security, whether it's parking prohibitions, whether it's increasing fines. Um, you know, we've, it's one of these things where communities across Niagara, across Ontario are all facing the same, same situation. Um, it, is a, it is a big concern for our staff and for the residents, and it's something that we're taking um, seriously, and uh, we hope to, you know, to be able to continually adjust and, and move forward with um, any of these, uh, these programs in partnership with uh, Niagara Regional Police, our, our fire staff, our municipal works, and our security, security team. So um, that's really the, the gist of the report. At, this point, um, but I did want council to be aware that um, you know the, the teams that we have in place are are doing everything they can within the parks throughout the entire system. Um, our facility staff, our our park staff, um, have been going above and beyond trying to manage a situation that that hasn't really been hasn't really been seen in, in the community. And um, you know from a from a staff morale standpoint. Um, positive messaging is, is always a good one. Um, you know, we're getting a lot of negative messaging in, in social media. Um, I just want to use this opportunity to talk to our staff, our frontline staff that, you know, we support everything that they're doing. They're doing a great job. It's, um, it's, it's a situation that we are all in that needs to be managed and we're trying to do the best we can um, with the resources we have. And, um, you know, as we continue into phase two and then into phase three, um, we're really looking forward to be able to be able to position the municipality um, in a in a good uh, in a good position so we can move to the stage four um, whenever that will be. Thank you. Great update uh, to the deputy CEO. Thank you very much for that. Um, so we got a long list uh, of speakers with some questions. Councilor Townsend, I believe you're up first. My apology, that was up from earlier. Okay, I'll look to the to the to um, the council coordinator. I got Councillor Kushner, uh, Councillor Sorrento. So, are, are these from the last ones? That's from the last one, Mr. Mayor. I can take my hand down. Sorry, everyone. For everyone who doesn't have a question, take your hand down. Okay. So I'll start. Councillor Kushner, are you in? No. No. Okay, thank you, lower hand. Uh, Councillor Phillips, you in? 
Got to go off mute. Yes, I am. Okay. Well, so we got three on here. Councilor Porter, you're first up. Let's go. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to the Deputy CAO. Um, I don't know if this is true, but you, you see uh, posts on social media that a lot of the beach goers are from out of town. Um, do the staff have insight about that? And um, what do you think about some of what uh, I guess Fort Erie has done with their beaches? They kind of leave the beaches only for locals up to a certain point and allow other people to go at different times. Do you think that would help alleviate the pressure? Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, maybe I'll start and, and pass it over to Director Smith if uh, he has any additional information. Um, anecdotally, we're hearing, you're correct, we're hearing a lot of the, the vehicles that are that are coming into the parking lots, into the beaches are, are from out of town, from the GTA area. We haven't specifically tracked um, where people are coming from. Um, up to this point, um, now that we have the, the security patrols and they're actually on site on the weekends at Sunset Beach, we're able to control a bit better um, people coming into the, into the beach area. Um, if we were to institute a Niagara only, um, we would then require um, the security staff to um, request proof of residency. And, and that would require um, having staff at the, um, at the facilities, both at, I'm assuming you're referencing both Lakeside and, and Sunset Beach in particular, um, to be able to do that. And they would have to be at the, at the site early on. So it, it's, it's a resourcing issue more than it is a, um, you know, because it wouldn't necessarily impact our staff to manage that. It would be, we would, we would look to the security company to to help us with that with that process. Councilor Porter. Thank you. That's nothing. Okay, um, on that sure. line, I'll go to Councilor Dodge. And then, sorry, Mr. Uh, Mary, sorry, just, uh, I think uh, Director Smith was gonna just add on, if you don't. Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, one of the other issues that we need to uh, address is the fact that some of these facilities are hard to secure. Um, Sunset Beach is easier to secure. It has three definite entrance points, but it, it still has other ways to get into the beach. Lakeside is a much more difficult beach to secure because there's many different access points from the parking lot um, to, to walk through. So um, any kind of prohibition that we put in place uh, will have to deal with not just the staffing resource, but how do we physically close off the beach? Uh, and we are looking at that, but those are not simple solutions. So I just wanted to make sure that council was aware of that. Thank you. Okay, Councilor Porter, you're good. Okay, Councilor Dodge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Listening to um, our deputy CAO's um, very uh, detailed uh, um, review of what's been happening down at the beaches and whatnot, I'd like to make an amendment if I could. I guess, uh, first of all, I'd like to receive uh, the report from that, him as uh, for information. Um, and then I'd like to put an amendment on the floor. And the amendment would be, I would like to move a temporary Niagara resident only access to our St. Catharines beaches starting July the 18th and 2020. And also ask staff to develop protocols and procedures for our beaches for 2021. And uh, having put that out there, I guess I can wait to speak at the end because I'm sure that people will have a lot of questions and um, I can give some background information at that time if you want, or I'll leave it to your discretion right now. Okay, um, just Councillor uh, Dodge, uh, just for definition, what does local access mean? Because I know that'll come up. In the oh, sorry, sorry. I meant uh, I would like to move a temporary Niagara resident only access to our St. Catharines beaches starting July 18th, 2020. Okay. okay. Uh, so you're moving the motion and you've added that as, as an amendment. So it is your motion now. Okay. Yeah. I'm looking, you're gonna speak last. I'm looking at my list and Councillor Miller, you had your hand up already, I'll go to you. Thanks, I just, uh, I guess, uh, 
three of them are at a scale. I, I've had a few residents ask about cooling centers, uh, specifically the use of arenas as, as potential cooling centers. Uh, as you may know, uh, our ward, uh, Maritime Ward, doesn't have a splash pad uh, and now doesn't have a pool. Um, so I, I know some people are concerned about uh, residents who, who might not have air conditioning, things like that, uh, where they can easily access uh, somewhere to cool down. Is that is that something we looked at? Uh, was determined it's not financially feasible? I know there's Centennial Maritime in arena there's issues because uh, we don't operate it we'd have to work uh, a little bit with the lines on that just wondering if, if that conversation has happened if we look into that to the CAO or the deputy CAO either way uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor I'd actually defer to um, Mr. Christie they've, they've developed a cooling center plan Director Christie uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, the uh, right now the only cooling center that we're operating is the Kiwanis Aquatic Center, as you know. Uh, we've had uh, very, very, very few uh, people come in to use the cooling center. Another option for us uh, would be to use the the museum uh, as a as a cooling center uh, as well. Uh, we have verified that the buses are running um, along the museum route, so. Uh, that is a possibility as well. Uh, in terms of arenas, as you know, the, the recovery plan uh, slated the, re the arenas to be reopened um, September 1. So uh, we wouldn't be putting ice back in probably until the first week of August uh, at the earliest. So um, I, I would suggest that uh, if we're looking for something in the Meriton area, the museum would be an option. Okay, I appreciate that, and, and thanks to that. I would, my, I guess my concern is, um, I guess accessibility. But, but you're right about the buses. So yeah, um, you know, don't forget uh, about us down there in the southeast. Okay, uh, Councillor, yeah, uh, Councillor Kushner. Yeah, the the question I have, uh, Mr. Mayor, how does the tenants at the beaches? compare this year with previous years. Okay, so who, who's the who's the counter of attendees? No. We, can, we can ask either, let's go with Mr. Smith and then, then Councillor Phillips. Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, we have uh, never counted bodies on the beach. Um, and just so we're not in a position that we can give actual numbers. The Anecdotal evidence is that it, there's a high demand right now. And as the deputy CAO uh, mentioned in this presentation, there's sort of a pent up demand to be outside right now, especially with the heat and the sun. And so that is, is spilling over when, when other facilities are not open to the public, but we do not have exact numbers. But uh, if we're operating at over full capacity, which I gather we are, because of illegal parking, et cetera. Have we considered a temporary fee to restrict entry into the uh, beaches? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I guess the, the fee question would have to come in front of council and perhaps Director Douglas could talk to that. Uh, I just wanna be clear, especially with Sunset Beach, more so than Lakeside Park, the capacity issue is mostly with the parking and not with the numbers of people on the beach because the beach is large enough to accommodate the numbers from the the parking uh, the parking that's available on the beach and even can accommodate larger numbers with parking that spills into the neighborhood the problem is all the uh, associated issues as that parking issue spills into the neighborhood of emergency access and and blocking people in and and blocking hydrants and such like that. Um, so it's not actually a capacity on the beach issue that we, we are facing at this point. Okay, and what is the demographic that's going to the beach now? Are you getting families? Are you getting young people? Or are you getting both? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, my staff are telling me that it's, it's wide open. So we have large families, we have large groups of uh, young people, we have large groups of older people. So it, it's a full mixture, a lot of boaters, a lot of swimmers uh, right across the board. But uh, I get the impression that we've had more problems this year than any other year. Okay. Is that correct? 
I think I think based on the volume, yes, it is. So I'd, it, you're correct. So I'm referring to behavioral problems. Yeah, I, I think based on the situation that we're in with a global pandemic and, and the heat wave, yes, there, there's just issues arising from this. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kushner. Councillor uh, Townsend, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you, I guess uh, my concern with this is how would we stop residents essentially who are not from Niagara from entering the public beaches? Uh, what I would hate to see is a scenario or a situation where people do come from out of town and essentially just find a way onto the beach. Uh, I'm just, I'm trying to understand what this would look like. Can any, can just anyone to chime in on this? So you know, I'll either go to the deputy CAO or to the director because a number of beaches in Ontario have now since closed. If they can shed a light on what they've done either in Wasaga, Savo Beach, um, there's a number of them that are gone now. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, their complex issue um, could have a variety of um, responses by the municipality. So um, one of the challenges that we're trying to manage and, and balance is, you know, we, we could take the approach to, to close the beach entire, in its entirety um, to deal with, with the, the concerns. And that's what um, some of the beaches across Ontario, as Mayor mentioned, have, have done. They've actually closed the beaches to all public. Um, other, another scenario um, that, that has um, been implemented in, in a few areas, Fort Erie um, being one, is providing a, uh, a mm -hmm. resident pass that would be um, provided to proof of, proof of residency um, property owners. And um, they're, they're essentially issued a pass that they, they have, take with them. And when they, it, they have to show the pass in order to gain access to the, to the beach. And those, uh, Bay Beach in particular has um, very defined points of entry. So that's how, how that gets managed. The, the difficulty right now um, to, for St. Catharines to implement something like that is where the beach is already open. So it would really be um, the reliance on uh, the security patrol to manage the, the people coming into the park and, and requesting identification. So again, as I mentioned earlier, it, it really from that perspective comes down to a resource standpoint and we would just have to increase um, the number of people manning both Sunset Beach and, and Lakeside to, to be able to um, control access points. Thank you, uh, Deputy CAO. I, I do like and I appreciate the direction that Councillor Dodge is going in. I do, and I am a fan of what they have done out in municipalities such as Port Erie, where they do sell the pass. It allows us to, I guess, uh, regulate. And then uh, I believe from what I understand is that there is a fee for out-of-towners to visit it. So if this is in, included kind of in, a, in the, the wording of this motion, uh, I would be very supportive of it. I just want to make sure that this is kind of the direction Councillor Dodge is going with this, where there would be some type of mandatory pass uh, for families who are local to have. And if there would be maybe a fee attached to those visiting from out of town, uh, I just am hoping for some clarification. I guess that would be for Councillor Dodge. Councillor Dodge, you want to just provide a clarification? Okay, Mr. Mayor. Um, logistically, that would be a great um, way to do that. And that might be something that we can put forward in 2021. But being that we're like so far into the season now, I think that we have to look at other avenues of allowing people in there and the easiest way and the quickest way to do it, I think, you know, meeting with staff, um, myself and Councillor Phillips, and uh, that um, it would be like that they would prove that they're residents of, of Niagara at this time. And then that could be something that, you know, as we work forward that uh, we uh, iron out at that time. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor, that's all. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Townsend. Councillor uh, Garcia. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to the mover, <clears throat> I certainly support uh, uh, limiting the beaches at this time to our residents, but I wanted to ask the mover uh, why Niagara as opposed to St. Catharines resident, because um, my understanding is Fort Erie did it just for Fort Erie, and if 
we're concerned about people coming from out of town, if we say Niagara, that's another 300,000 people from outside the city that could potentially be using the beaches. So could we just restrict that to St. Catherine's residents? I guess if you're asking if I think that's a friendly amendment, I don't think it is. I think that the idea here is that, you know, other municipalities that are close to us where they're allowing us to, our residents to maybe perhaps go and use their pools and whatnot. I thought it was only fair that we as the St. Catharines would allow Niagara residents. And I think that a lot of the Niagara region, they already have their own beaches and whatnot and they're using those. So I don't think that we're having an influx of people from the other municipalities coming here to use our beach. So I just thought that that was a fair way to do it. Thank you, Councillor Dodge. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, thank you, uh, Councillor Dodge. And maybe I could ask staff to comment on that. Is that uh, the reality of what we're finding? When we find people out of town, are they really from out of town, out of Niagara? So I think Daryl's on the beach right now. So Director Smith. You tell us what you're seeing. Uh, <laughs> through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, we only have, uh, I'll say, license plate evidence of where people are coming from. We, we don't talk to, to people and ask them where they're coming from. We do see license plates from all over Niagara, all over the GTA. Uh, and when I say license plates, I mean the advertising covers of who sold them the car. So we don't have any firm numbers as to who are Niagara residents, who are St. Catharines residents, and who are GTA residents that are, are using our uh, facilities. I'll go to the Deputy CAO. Thank you to the Director, Deputy CAO, in terms of any information that you're getting from uh, the companies that were, are, are looking after the beaches. Uh, thank you. you, Mr. Mayor. The, um, the, they're not, so we've only been able to implement full security measures this past weekend um, where the uh, security guards were at the gate right from right from the beginning. Um, they haven't asked for ID or any proof of, of re residency. Um, however, when when issues um, do come forward and in our in our debriefing, I, I would suggest it's um, at, up to this point, um, it would probably be a 50 50 in terms of um, outside of Niagara versus Niagara residents in, in those situations, but that's a very small, um, you know, number of, of incidents that we can track based on that. And in your discussions with Niagara Regional Police related to, um, they did they did a number of ride checks. What was their, what was their observations? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to be honest with you, I'd have to go, I'll have to check on that. I, I don't have it in front of me, but we can, we can certainly look into it. I'll, Somebody else around the uh, SLP table has that information. Uh, to the CAO, because uh, the, the information I got from the Niagara Regional Police just in, in passing discussions with, they had over 1,300 cars that were pulled over and a majority of them were from outside of Niagara. That gives you some context. Yeah, three, Mr. Mayor, I did recall an email, the numbers, I, I'd have to check the email, but I did recall an email where it was overwhelmingly from outside Niagara. Councilor Garcia. Okay, <clears throat> I'm okay then, Mr. Mayor. It sounds like uh, <clears throat> keeping into Niagara residents is, uh, is safe based on the information we just got, even though it's not necessarily uh, um, <clears throat> that accurate, but at least it's a direction. I'll see if we can get some more accurate uh, information from the Chief of Fire Services. So, thank you, Mr. Mayor. What I can say is when the fire service personnel were on the beach is helping to uh, evacuate the beaches at night. They were finding, and some of the responses we've we've had to the beach as well, they were finding a significant amount of the public were identifying themselves as from Brampton, Mississauga, and the GTA. Probably a little bit more stronger information, Councillor Garcia. Is that more accurate for you? Yes, <clears throat> yes, that's okay, Mr. Mayor. So I'll I'll stay within Niagara. That's okay. Councillor Porter, you up? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I know I spoke, but that was before the amendment. Um, I, I, I'm really struggling with this because no matter what we do, um, we're going to have to have security and all the additional staffing here to begin with without any way to recover the cost of it. Um, I think that we, as 
on a temporary basis should add, add parking fees. Um, we have security there anyway, um, and we can um, collect fees to help cover the additional staffing required um, to make sure that the beach is safe. Um, and even if we minimize it to just Niagara residents, we're still gonna have to have that security. Um, and I would also like us to take a look at uh, adding, uh, you know, paid parking there in the future. This might encourage people to get to the beach in alternative ways using their bicycle or by taking the bus. Um, so I also think there's an environmental piece to this. I would like to vote on the, um, the temporary resident only amendment separately, um, but I would also, uh, I wonder if this is friendly, um, if we could uh, add a temporary parking uh, fees if that requires a public meeting or if it's requires, something so that, requires, yeah, that requires a public meeting there's a whole process involved in that i'll go to the yeah. CAO. i don't want to add anything that's going to have us do something that may be an after after this motion passes uh, to the CAO. yes yeah, certainly if we are adding any new fees then we need a public meeting we also need the communication of the fees the collection of the fees it adds a whole other administrative uh level to this so Certainly okay. that's something we can do. It's just not, doesn't happen very quickly. Right. It's not going to happen before the season, um, right? It'll happen probably after the season ends. Um, so then I guess I would say that for 2021, I wonder if it's a friendly amendment that staff be directed to look at um, parking fees. So we could um, we add including parking fees, just yes. authority there to prepare protocols and procedures for future use and parking fees and associated um, revenue options. Yes, thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Harris. Uh, to the amendment, uh, I was just wondering, how are you going to ensure when students uh, go to the beach that they're from St. Catharines, like would they have to bring their student ID cards? Like if they don't have driver's licenses, how would that work? Uh, I'm not sure who would answer that. Okay, Let, let's try and get some detail on here, folks. Let's, uh, my thing would be, it'd be under 18, you're not going to check for IDs. Under 18, okay. if you're- That's, that's good. If that's the case, that's good. I'm, so, I'm good with that. Um, I'll look to the, to, to Councillor Dodge. Uh, we got to put something in there for under 18. Are you okay with under 18? There won't be checking of ID? Sure, I'm okay with that. Okay. Okay. Folks. That's it. And, and to carry, uh, Councillor Porter's point, I think, Instituting a parking, uh, a paid parking will allow us to upgrade the beach and things like that. And it's another opportunity to uh, generate some revenue. And I'm not sure it's that difficult to uh, install some pay and display machines. Okay. So I look forward to hearing back for 2021. Councillor Phillips, you're up. Thanks, Councillor Harris. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, definitely support the, uh, the motion that. Councillor Dodge has, has brought forth. Uh, in answer to Councillor Kushner's question, this is definitely the busiest season we've had uh, at Sunset Beach. Uh, I drove down there as an example on Canada Day. Uh, I entered the parking lot and came out. Usually it would take me five minutes to drive through there and it took me over half an hour to get out. Didn't, well, the only time I stopped was when my car couldn't, was blocked. Uh, and uh, after I came out, I drove the streets of Port Weller and I could barely find a parking spot uh, in the whole community. So I've never seen cars in all my years of uh, being a counselor in, <clears throat> in Grantham, which is now 14, never seen uh, as many cars at all. And uh, I'm, we're, Councilor Dodge and I are getting calls all the time. Uh, this past weekend uh, was very busy very rude behavior uh, by people uh, who are parking in front of driveways uh, and on the way home because of the lack of uh, washroom facilities. Uh, they were relieving themselves on private property, uh, all kinds of garbage being thrown on private properties. The residents of Port Weller are really suffering. So we need to do something quick uh, uh, to relieve this situation. Um, Councillor Dodge and I spoke with Mr. Oaks this afternoon 
And uh, I suggested that after this season, we strike a committee to come up with ideas such as paid parking or anything else. Uh, obviously, the, the washroom is, is a old, dilapidated washroom. Uh, there is money in capital. The new washroom will be started, according to Mr. Marcuccio. The washroom is going to be started in August, so there will be a new washroom, larger one next year. So that's going to solve, hopefully, some of that problem. But uh, we need something done now. Uh, as far as out of town, out of town visitors, um, I don't know whether we need to tell TripAdvisor or who we're going to tell uh, or how we're going to tell these people from G the GTA, uh, GTHA, I guess, uh, not to come. Uh, but uh, obviously, they need to know because if I drive from Mississauga to Sunset Beach and all of a sudden say, "Sorry, you don't live here, you can't go," they're going to. Uh, our security people are going to have a real problem. So we need to get it out there to uh, tell people that uh, they better go somewhere else. Thank you. I'll second the motion too, by the way. Thank you, Councillor Phillips. Uh, Councillor Miller, I'm trying to get. Yeah, I guess, I, I, I mean, to the to the season thing, I, one day I'll tell someone the horror story of when I was student staff at Lakeside Park in 2006, and I was the only one there on Canada Day. But you got to buy me a beer for that story. I guess my, my concern about when we're, uh, this seems like we're sort of coming up with this late, late in the game and, and we're sort of making it up a council here is what, like, do, do we have any idea, I guess, to director Smith, perhaps what the financial implications of, of this is in terms of staffing, uh, you know, possibly putting up barriers at Lakeside Park as, as discussed, there's a lot of entry points uh, so we can have that checkpoint. I mean, do we have any ballpark of, of what we're talking about? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, at this point, we don't have costs associated with the barriers. Um, we do have um, staffing costs, but the staffing costs are going to vary depending on how we actually do the barricades. So I, I'm fortunate, I think we can come back with some uh, better information on the cost, but at this point, uh, we don't have any numbers that, that would make any sense. Yeah, I struggle with that, you know, uh, sort of the blank check uh, idea for something like this, but I understand, I, I suppose, the urgency uh, of it. And I, I guess similar to Councillor Porter, it's it's a it's a real challenge, I suppose. Um, to to just you know, obviously, we're going through this economic problem. We've already we've had to lay off workers. We've had to shut down programs we wanted to do and things like that. And now, uh, I'd be a bit concerned about that. And and just in terms of I know we're going through businesses are closed but we we still want Niagara we still want St. Catharines to be a tourist destination um obviously um we don't want overcrowding the issues we've had at the beach but maybe that comes when we don't open pools and we close pools over the last uh decade or so so I it's I, I really struggle with this and the message we're sending um to to about the the openness and the attractiveness of, of coming to St. Catherine. So uh, I guess I'll listen to if anyone else has anything else to say on this. Just to put it in context, um, Wasaga, so like we're not, we're not late to the game on this one. Uh, just last week, Wasaga just closed their beach. They actually put up fencing all around, snow fencing around their beach. So to say that we're behind on this one, I think is, is, is misinformation. Um, I'll go to Council Littleton. I did just want to say something. Um, actually, it's along the same lines of what Councillor Miller was just saying. And I do certainly sympathize with residents who have been used to going to the beach and, and having an experience there. And now they find that there's quite a lot of people here. Um, I am concerned though, that what, what I'm also hearing is um, we don't want people from the GTA and coming here to come to our beach. But one of the attractions of St. Catharines is that we have a beach. And I'm assuming that maybe some of these folks that come here might have family here. Maybe they stay for the weekend. Maybe they eat in our restaurants. Maybe they spend money at other things. Maybe they go to a winery. I don't know what people do, and I'm not about to suggest we do surveys to find out. But it's a discussion about closing off, and this is ours, and we don't want to have others in the space. And, and I, again, I think it's the perfect storm right now though, because they're so limited. The, the places that people can go are so limited. So maybe they're like, oh, go to beach. I'm gonna to go to the beach. But I just think that we need to be careful 
when we're talking about this because I certainly want to be open and, and people come and see how wonderful this area is. And um, living on it, living on a water, a, a, a city next to a water is pretty exciting. I grew up in London and there's no water. You have to drive for that. So I can see the attraction that people want to come down here and experience that. So I'm not going to be voting in favor of this for that reason, because I don't want to send that message. Although I'm, I am sympathetic to the residents for sure. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Littleton. Seeing no other further questions, I'll go to Councillor Dodge for a summary remark. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to address maybe a couple of the comments. Um, when we're asking, when we were asked, you know, is there more uh, traffic and whatnot at the beach? Um, we've had, I think, three to four ride uh, set up outside. And I can tell you that the people leaving the beach, it takes them five hours for the ride just to get the, the regular people through. And I don't know the numbers exactly, but I've been told that there's like parking for 200 people down there. And one of the rides they counted leaving the beach because there's only one way in and one way out of there. Um, they had 1500 people that they had go through their ride program. So that means there's 200 people parking on the beach, 1300 people parking somewhere in the community. And um, I know that, you know, we want to be open for business and stuff like that. But I think that, um, you know, all the, the stuff that's going on with the pandemic and stuff, we have parks that are closed. We have, you know, pools that aren't open, different situations because of this um, pandemic. And I think that we need to be cognizant of what we're, you know, having our, our own residents go through. We want to make sure that they're kept safe and that they have a place to go when they can't go to the park and whatnot. And, um, you know, another situation we have down there, unfortunately, is, is the lack of washroom facilities. And when you get all these people, you might be thinking, oh, there's not um, overcrowding at the beach, but there certainly is. And there's a lot of not safe distancing going on and people don't wanna go down there with their young families and whatnot because they see a lot of social distancing that is not happening. And, you know, the lineup to just to use the washroom is from, you know, from where the washroom is, I guess people wouldn't know, but, you know, say a couple of city blocks long with people just trying to get in to use the washroom. So, um, I think that you know staffs work very hard at this, and I know that uh, Director Smith sent out a, a preliminary sort of um, what we're already spending in security and whatnot down there. And um, certainly, you know, moving forward to 2021, we can maybe put some of these parking fees and, and different revenue options into play, and that can go directly to the beaches and whatnot. But I think that under these circumstances, unfortunately. You know, we need to look after our residents and make sure that they have a safe and happy place to go. So I'd like to see this happen and I hope that I can get the support of council for this. Thank you, Councillor Dodge. And we'll call the question. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor Dodge. Yes. Councillor Garcia. Yes. Councillor Harris. Yes. Councillor Kushner. Yes. Councillor Littleton. No. Councillor Miller. Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Councillor Porter? No. Councillor Cisco? Yes. Councillor Sorrento? Yes. Councillor Townsend? Yes. Councillor Williamson? Yes. Mayor Senzik? Yes. And that's carried. So it looks like tomorrow's going to be a busy communication day for the city of St. Cat. <laughs> Thank uh, you. Um, I'm sure a lot of residents will be happy with this decision for now. And um, if we could take any any examples of what other communities have already done, it'd be great to follow follow suit. Um, moving on to 3.4 uh, offices CAO. This is one that has been pulled from consent. And so I'll look to um, Councillor Garcia and have Evan pull it up on the screen. <clears throat> this, there was a motion that was submitted last minute. So... Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so the, my, uh, my motion is um, an amendment or an addition to the uh, what was recommended on staff. So the first part of that was <clears throat> the recommendation that the report be received for information purposes. And I have added and that programs or initiatives involving large commitments of taxpayer funds that are not related to the COVID emergency 
such as CIP as an example, not be discussed by council until proper in-person public participation is allowed. And <clears throat> I will speak to that. I know it's late in the evening, but uh, <clears throat> I, first of all, I allowed uh, staff for all the work they have done in, in coming up with ways of, uh, of uh, remote, uh, promoting remote public engagement. Uh, <clears throat> I get concerned because even though we say we have all these methods, uh, uh, I hear from so many people that they don't have uh, access to the internet, they don't even have a computer, they don't have a cell phone, and we have a huge proportion of seniors in our city who uh, many of them are likely to be in that situation. So my concern is that we, there is no substitute for public participation, so I would like to make sure that when we are going to make such huge decisions as you know committing taxpayer funds for many many years in the future and <clears throat> there could be many other programs like that but not uh, you know not that come to mind right now but there could be several um that we waiting for a month or two however long it's going to take until proper in-person public participation should not be a handicap i know i communicated with a clerk uh, yesterday because I see that in the news that uh, Niagara Falls is uh, is reopening their city hall and getting more access into city hall. And uh, I know that the clerk and staff are working on ways that we can social distance within uh, council chambers so that um, uh, someday, hopefully soon, uh, we can accommodate council and perhaps uh, some key staff in council chambers and social distance and maybe we can have public participants be in, in a separate room where everybody can social distance. But I, I don't personally feel there is any substitute for in-person public participation for major decisions, but I'm hoping council will support that. All right, thank you, Councilor Garcia. Councilor Cisco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'm gonna ask, first of all, that we split the motion into two parts. Uh, obviously, I'll be happy to uh, to approve the uh, information purposes part of it, but I can't support the second clause. Um, we've undergone now almost four months uh, where we have delayed a lot of work. We have, uh, we've been dealing with COVID crisis specifically, but there is still work that needs to continue within the community. And I think, uh, Staff have done an excellent job of ensuring that public participation is able to, to take place. Just to, to Councillor Garcia's point, um, and I just this was a very quick internet search, but uh, as of 2017, according to the CRTC, 90% of, sorry, 89% of Canadian households had a home internet subscription and 99% of Canadian households have access to fixed broadband internet. Uh, so I, I would actually say no, 89% of, of people, and I, I would bet that that number is higher in an urban community like St. Catharines, the vast majority, almost everybody has a home internet subscription of one type or another. But additionally, uh, we've seen just in the past two weeks, the volume of correspondence that is possible uh, when issues of importance come up. I mean, I don't know about other counselors, but I would I would wager, I've been on council for 10 years and the volume of correspondence with respect to the, the mask debate uh, was higher than any other issue. It, it beat even the, the decision-making process of the Meridian Center. Um, I, I got hundreds of emails. I got uh, many phone calls. I think we have done a very good job and we will continue to do a very good job of, uh, of allowing public participation, but to continue to just push off uh, big decisions, which we are going to have to make. We do have a CIP uh, update coming forward. We do have other major issues, but to say that those issues can't be dealt with until we can have in-person public participation, we also don't know when that's going to happen. Um, it's entirely possible that counselors may be able to meet in person together in, in the next couple of months, uh, but depending on what size of gatherings we're allowed to hold, uh, we may not be able to have additional people in the room. We also don't know what course this virus is going to take. So we don't know whether we're going to continue progressing stepwise uh, through the different phases and get back to pre-COVID levels of, uh, 
of social interactivity. So how long do we push off major decisions? I don't think that's reasonable. Uh, when it comes to, uh, and I'm gonna speak selfishly now to my ward, you know, when it comes to issues like the GM property, um, a new CIP is probably going to factor very heavily in any potential purchaser of that property. It's going to factor into their decision making. So to just say we're going to not make any decisions on major issues, it, I don't think it's reasonable and I don't think it's necessary either. Tonight's a perfect example. We had uh, Sally Wazirudin come and speak to us uh, and was able to give his input with respect to the work that his committee had done. Uh, at the first meeting where we were to uh, to the first meeting where we were going to debate the statue issue, uh, we had several members of the public stay online with the Zoom meeting throughout. Uh, we've seen very good uh, viewership of the the proceedings on YouTube. Uh, I think staff have done a fantastic job of ensuring that all of that is possible. And when you look at other municipalities across the province of Ontario, other municipalities are making it work. Uh, so I, I strongly disagree with the, the second clause. Uh, I strongly disagree with delaying uh, major decisions because we don't know when, when full in-person participation is possible. If we need to uh, work with staff to set up a physically distanced uh, portal at City Hall during council meetings, well, then maybe, maybe that's something we can do in anticipation. But I think we provide a lot of different avenues for people to give <clears throat> comments on these issues. And I think we need to continue to allow that to happen, but we need to move forward with the business of the city and simply hitting pause on everything uh, isn't reasonable and it isn't, it isn't good management of the city. Councillor Williamson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I support Councillor Garcia uh, fully on this, not just because he's my trusted colleague in Port Luzi Ward, but because he's he's being cautious and he's being concerned about uh, openness and transparency and accountability. And th there also is sizable cohorts of people who are excluded from these proceedings in an electronic manner. Uh, just tonight, I'm, I'm paying for high, high speed uh, Kojiko internet and I'm kicked out for five minutes and you, you know, potentially you could miss an important vote when that happens. Um, we don't know when this is gonna get resolved and when, when we're gonna be able to do uh, in, in person meetings, but that's not to say that we need to rush into making decisions. Um, I, I'd be one, for example, on the General Motors property that we be talking to the owners and the former owner to get them to bear some responsibility for the damage that they've done on that property. There's no, there's no reason that those kinds of discussions can't continue to happen, and they're not decisions that or discussions that need to happen at the council level. But if you walked into uh, uh, many of the seniors' residents, uh, you'd be hard pressed to find uh, too many people that actually have internet access. Um, I think it disproportionately would exclude people from lower income segments as well. So, I, I think that, and Councillor Garcia didn't raise this just recently or tonight, he included this kind of wording the last time that this was discussed. So it's not new information. And I think it's staring on the side of caution. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Porter. Thank you, Councillor Russell and Councillor Court. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'd just like to talk about the CIP program. Staff changed the CIP program as a response to um, discussions around affordable housing. So the reason why they went off and changed it, they I realized it didn't align with some of our affordable housing goals. So to kind of center out the CIP program actually, I think, endangers some of our um, initiatives under our housing action plan. And I don't know why the CIP would be centered out um, and not uh, other meetings. I also question, um, you know, the online engagement uh, and even like the, the budget town hall, we know how many people stay online um, when we do the telephone town hall and we have statistics from Engage STC. When I sit in budget, in-person budget consultations with the public, they're literally between like four and seven people and often it's the same person coming back over and over again. 
um, it's actually quite difficult for people to get out and go to a one or two hour public meeting and be heard if there is something online and it's up for two weeks and you can review a video and watch it over and over again. You can email staff. The engagement is actually much better. Um, so I would like us to move forward into the next century and not backwards. Um, and I think this is the way of the future. And I just wanna compare, if we're gonna talk about the CIP, we've had several meetings with the public and with stakeholders on the CIP, far more this year than we did in the previous iteration of the CIP back in 2014, when there was one public meeting, um, I think that one group spoke at it and it happened after the 2014 election before the new term of council was put in place, which is perplexing to me because almost half of the council um, was not carrying on into the next term. So this very important program had one public meeting. I didn't, I don't think there were any other public meetings. So when it comes to a CIP engagement, I think our staff have done an excellent job and I would be surprised if the rest of the council didn't want to move forward with it. We need to move into economic recovery and economic recovery involves um, building things, getting our trades going, um, getting our building department uh, planning and approving things, approving things. Um, and I don't know why we would want to set things back or hold them off when there's perfectly acceptable ways and probably better and more accessible ways to engage with the public. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Porter. Councillor Miller, you're either getting ready to go on your work machine behind you or... Oh, I don't have the end of this meeting. Um, I guess my, I, I guess I, I, I actually appreciate mentioning the CIP. Certainly, not in any rush to see that. And the last iteration was pretty far off. Anything that in my mind was was supportable, so I, I don't see the need to rush that back. I guess my question to Councillor Garcia, it, I, what is? It, can we get a number maybe on this? I, I just have a hard time saying large commitments of taxpayer funds. I, it, I, I don't mind, you know, I, I don't want to really get it. I don't really mind supporting this, but I'd like to know what, what we're really talking about. We're talking about a million bucks. We're talking about 500,000 bucks. talking about 10 million. It's just, is there some criteria? Otherwise it looks, we're probably going to be doing it on an ad hoc basis, which, which seems like it might take up a lot of everyone's time. Thank you, Councillor Miller. It's for you, Mr. Mayor. I think that's a good question. I think we would need some advice from staff as to what the criteria should be. Uh, and I, I use CIP only as an example, but I'm concerned about uh, initiatives that require large funding. And I, that's why I said that it's non covered emergency related because we do have um, a number of them now that we're spending lots of money, but it's because of what's happening with COVID. Uh, <clears throat> I don't buy, you know, having spent my whole life in business plan major projects, I don't buy that <clears throat> people are making these decisions based on whether it's CIP or not. I think that, but it is a major decision for the city and taxpayers because it commits us to <clears throat> many years in the future. Um, I would suggest that we ask staff, uh, they obviously can't say it right now, but to come up perhaps with what they think is a reasonable number that would be a cutoff of something that we should have better public engagement on. Uh, you know, maybe half a million sounds like a, like a good number to me right now, but I'm, I'm just guessing at it. Uh, it's a good question. <clears throat> and emphasizing again what Councillor Williamson said, we have many constituents that don't have access to the internet. So those statistics are general statistics, certainly not, not in St. Catharines. Okay, Councillor Miller. Well, I guess I'm waiting for staff, I guess, to weigh in on, on what a reasonable cutoff on something like, like this might be. I don't know if staff will have that, but I'll go to the CAO. Well, okay, sure. Through you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I can think of many ways that we have already passed things with public consultation and already had a lot of input. When I look at some of the decisions we make, some of those decisions that are non-monetary in nature arguably may have a greater impact to citizens. So to have a blanket statement to say just things of monetary nature 
we may unnecessarily restrict ourselves some, you know, the budget is coming. And we heard from Dr. Herji today, we're not sure what, how long our new normal may be. So, um, you know, I, I wouldn't have a dollar value that I would, would say would make sense because I would need to say, what are the different things that are coming from us that we would like council and the community to weigh in on. And then I think, you know, staff can, can look at what's coming up in the calendar and decide. And we've, we've shown you the ways that we're going to intend to do public uh, consultation. Then on a case by case basis, we can look at it. And if council feels that the consultation that has been done is insufficient, then, then we certainly can have more discussions about that. But um, each individual, each individual thing we do has different, you know, has implications to different sectors of our community, and some are are more technologically savvy, and some aren't. But I think this COVID situation has brought many of our residents up higher. I have, you know, my 85 year old mother watches YouTube now because that's where she gets some of her her community aspects that she normally would have had. So. I think we I think we can make this work is what I'm saying. And if there is a situation where someone does need to and, and staff need to look at it on an individual basis, we're certainly willing to do that because we're very dedicated to community. Well, we need the community support. We need community consultation to make effective decisions. So um, thank you. I, I, I don't have a dollar. Oh, wow. Long answer for I don't have a dollar number. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it was, that was probably reasonable to expect on the spot. So uh, yeah, that's it for me. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Miller, Councillor Townsend, and then maybe we can get a vote on this one. Councillor Townsend. Uh, my question was answered. Thank you. Okay, so I'll look to the, I'll look to the clerk. I, I, again, I, I agree with what the CAO is talking about. I, I think we put it in their hands instead of having a motion like this. I think we put it in their hands. And so we'll do the split motion first, and then we'll do the um, information purposes. You want to start with the the yellow, okay? And do we have a seconder, Councillor Garcia? I imagine Councillor Williamson. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> My understanding was that he would, but I haven't discussed it with him. Yeah. Yeah. No, I will. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor Williamson. Yes. Councillor Townsend. Yes. Councillor Sorrento. No. Councillor Cisco. No. No. Councillor Porter. No. Councillor Phillips. <clears throat> yes. Councillor Miller. Councillor Miller. Oh, I was muted. Yes. Yes. Sorry. <clears throat> Councillor Councillor Littleton, sorry. No. I didn't hear that. I apologize. No. Thank you. Councillor Kushner. Yes. Councillor Harris. No. Councillor Garcia. Councillor Garcia. I'll come back. Councillor Dodge. Yes. Councillor Garcia. Yes. And Mayor Senzik. No. So I guess um, to the CAO. And that's carried. We should obviously the budget. Uh, this impacts the budget, the capital budget, all the other stuff associated with it. So uh, we should have a meeting with the budget chair and the uh, vice chair to figure out if we should just hold our meetings, put them in abeyance until um, we get to a situation where I guess. Uh, the public can go in person. I think this is a interesting point. Point, point of order, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. I just a question. We've already voted, but the CIP, the policy related to the CIP, has absolutely no financial implications. So, can we still deal with the CIP policy when it comes forward? It's individual projects uh, that involve commitments, but we can still deal with the CIP policy. Is that correct? I guess I'd look to the treasurer. Uh, the actual CIP policy has no financial implications. What are you talking about? Put yourself I'm talking 
about the CIP policy Sorry. and there are no financial implications with it. Sorry, Mr. Mayor. It's a, and then a policy, it's a policy. So I'm just looking for some direction from staff on what we just voted on. I think CIP policy can still be debated based on this motion. That's all. For you, Mr. Mayor, certainly the policy does not commit the funds. However, thank you. Um, if we if we're not committed to funds, the policy, what's it doing? But yeah, the the debating of the policy does not commit funds. And we can pass the policy. Thank you. Okay, uh, move on. So again, uh, to the CAO, I'll have to figure out because uh, with this motion, the budget and everything else just pretty much stops for public engagement. Um, we'll move on now to the second half of the motion for information. Yep, information. Okay, Councillor Dodge. Yes. Councillor Garcia. Yes. Councillor Harris. Yes. Councillor Kushner. Yes. Councillor Li Councillor Littleton. Yes. Councillor Miller. Yes. Councillor Phillips. Yes. Councillor Porter. Yes. Councillor Cisco. Yes. Councillor Sorrento. Yes. <clears throat> Councillor Townsend. Yes. Councillor Williamson. Yes. And Mayor Sensick. Yes. That's carried. Okay, Council, we convened a uh, motion to ratify forthwith. We have a motion the Council adopt these items forthwith by General Committee Monday, June 13th. And um, I have a motion from Councillor Sorrento, uh, seconded by uh, Councillor Phillips. Is he going? So moved, Mr. Mayor. Well, we, we still have to do 3.5, eh? All right. So we're getting up to curfew pretty soon. Um, 3.5, which is the Seymour Hanna. Uh, so this has been lifted by Councillor Littleton. And it's this is just to allow it to, to happen. Thank you. Okay. Any questions on this? Or, uh, Councillor Williamson, you got a question on this one? No, that was, that was last. Sorry, I got it out. Okay. Call the question. Councillor Garcia. Yes. <coughs> Councillor Kushner. Yes. Councillor Kushner. Yes. Councillor Harris. Yes. Councillor Dodge. Yes. Councillor Littleton. Yes. Councillor Miller. Yes. Councillor mm -hmm. Williamson. Yes. Councillor Townsend. Yes. Councillor Sorrento. Yes. Councillor Cisco. Yes. Councillor Porter. Yes. Councillor Phillips. Yes. Ma Mayor Sensick. Mayor Sensick. Yes, that's carried. So, Thank you. Uh, now we go on to motion ratified forthwith. So we had Councillor Sorrento and Councillor uh, Don't move, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Ratified forthwith. So all in favor? Show of hands. Carried. Um, we have that motion removed. 10.1 has been removed to the next meeting of council. Um, now we have emergency operations funding. So Evan, if you could bring up 10.2 on the screen. This is largely a housekeeping item. This is in line with AMO, with FCM, with LUMCO, and with MARCO. And the Niagara region has also <coughs> approved this motion. So this is not something that was just created out of thin air. This was brought forward by... Uh, the groups of organizations that you see listed as well. So, Councillor Cisco, I'll give you the floor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, as you mentioned, this is a motion that's been uh, passed by other levels of government and by our uh, by our advocacy organizations. I think it's an important step. Uh, we have been uh, waiting now for four months for uh, our two upper levels of government, the federal and provincial governments, to determine the next step in terms of funding with respect to municipalities. We're hamstrung by provincial legislation uh, and we, uh, we don't have the powers that the federal government obviously has. And so uh, I would hope that this is a very simple and unanimous vote uh, to pass this and lend support to the efforts that have been ongoing through your work with LUMCO at AMO and uh, with basically the other uh, municipal government in Ontario. 
Thank you, Councillor Cisco. I know, I know um, Chair Bradley has been active in this, and Chair Bradley was supportive of this at the region as well. So, um, do we have any? Let me just go for questions. We've got a lot of participants. Councillor Williamson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I uh, offered uh, an amendment just before the council meeting because I worked on it today. I think Evan has it. What does it say? Do you want to read out what it says while we're waiting for it? Well, I, I, uh, there it is. Whereas municipalities are the direct responsibility of the provincial government, and since they have since the provincial government has not provided adequate funding to municipalities, we encourage the federal government to continue to make financial transfers with provisions attached to, uh, well, ensure that the money gets to the municipal level of government. Uh, that seems to be one of uh, the sticking points. And if the, if the, my concern is that if the federal government gives money to the provincial government without it being targeted to go to municipalities, it'll just be subsumed into the provincial budget and it won't reach municipalities. So. I think it's important that we indicate that we want to see, um, particularly if the provincial government is going to provide us with adequate funding, that this money gets directly to us or directed to us via the province. Because we haven't seen money coming from the province. We're creatures of the province who are who have the responsibility for funding us directly. Um, so they, they need to spend some of their own money in this. We're all in this crisis together. Uh, as Councillor Cisco's motion, as, and as he mentioned, um, we don't have the financial capacity because, the, of course, we rely on property taxes, which are a regressive form of taxation. So I think adding uh, this in there is important because it does says, yeah, we'll take targeted expenditures directly uh, from the federal government through the provincial government. Um, seeing no other further questions, I'll call a question. You, Mr. Mayor, uh, Councillor Cisco, do you have a seconder? Uh, Councillor Littleton, I would presume. Okay, thank you. Councillor Cisco. Yes. Councillor Sorrento. Yes. Councillor Townsend. Yes. Councillor Williamson. Yes. Councillor Porter. Yes. Councillor Phillips. Yes. Councillor Miller. Yes. Councillor Littleton. Yes. Councillor Kushner. Yes. Councillor Harris. Yes. Councillor Garcia. Councillor Garcia. Yes. Councillor Dodge. Yes. And Mayor Sensic. Yes. Carried unanimously. Okay, so now we have 10.3 and um, that's another motion that came from Councillor Garcia. So we'll give you the floor again. If I can read that, Mr. Mayor, can everybody hear me? Yeah. That, that staff be directed to review and recommend future potential features to the new shoreline protection in the Abbey Muse, Considine Avenue area that will reinstate public access to Lake Ontario and that staff be directed to include funds mm -hmm. in the draft 2021 operating budget to identify those potential alternatives and the associated cost. And I want to speak to that, but I will speak last and somebody wants to speak to it first. I, I, I don't, I guess, well, of course, Councillor Williamson. Hello. Hello. Did we lose somebody? Uh, everyone has access to the internet. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> well, 
somebody, somebody from outer space. Ah. Can, can people hear me? Yeah. Hello? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, we spent a lot of money in an urgent matter to, to uh, repair this shoreline. <laughs> And one of the consequences was to, uh, to have a situation where the stairs got um, um, taken out. We would like to see them reinstated and um, we would like uh, this to be looked at um, when, budget, when we're considering budget uh, down the road here. So um, appreciate council supporting this motion. And uh, it's, it's about, all about access to the water. It's a small area. And when the water level is down a little bit, there is a, a beach there. And uh, those of us who are into geography know, know that uh, we have a um, west to east flow along the shoreline. And if you put out a little jetty, you will create a, a beach uh, quite quickly with uh, the way that uh, longshore drift works. So there's always a potential to have a reinstated little beach down there. There's already a platform and it's very well used. And that's attested to the, by the many calls and messages that we receive. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Williamson. Councillor Cisco. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, based on the fact that this motion would probably require some public consultation with respect to how to do it and also include spending funds, I'm going to make a motion to defer this until we are able to have full public participation and spend funds based on the motion that was passed a few minutes ago. So it's a motion to defer. Okay. That's motion to defer, a non debatable. And we already have a motion on the books that we just passed under uh, ratification. So this does fit within that category. So can I can I just ask a question, Mr. Mayor? It's non-debatable. What's your... Why? Well, it was just, is this uh, more, is this about public consultation or is this just asking for a report for the potential of, uh, like asking engineering, what's the potential of installing this? No, it's being asked to direct, to review, and recommend future potential features and to put money in a budget. Motion to defer. Okay, let's vote on the deferral. Some clarification, Mr. Mayor. What clarification are you looking for? I, I want to understand what we're doing here because uh, what I'm asking is that as Councillor Harris just pointed out, is that staff prepare a report on this and they have two faces on this. We're not trying to stop what's happening or anything. We just want some input from staff. So I don't see how that involves uh, commitment. And the second thing that I would like to ask clarification from the clerk on is when we have just passed the motion as Councillor Cisco pointed out, does that motion take effect immediately or is it after the minutes are ratified or how does that happen so, um I'll, I'll just jump in here first of all your motion does say include funds so you are asking for the inclusion of funds counselor so it isn't just a fancy report that comes back but it's including a fund so i'll go to the clerk for um your second question through you mr mayor the the motion that was passed tonight is the motion that's passed Councillor Garcia, when the minutes are passed, obviously that makes it final, but we usually work from the ratification motion, which happens tonight. So we ratify forthwith, which means immediately. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you to the clerk. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Motion to defer until we have, I guess, in public meetings. Okay. Uh, can I, uh, can I call the question or can we call the question? Well, I, I would like that. Could it be split? We could do the first part and leave out the second. Point of order, Mr. Mayor. I'm making a motion to defer the entire thing. Oh, oh. Okay. Motion to defer the entire thing. Okay. Councillor Dodge. Councillor Dodge. Sorry. Couldn't get it to unmute. Uh, no. Councillor Garcia. No. Councillor Harris. No. Councillor Kushner. No. Councillor Littleton. Sorry, yes. Councillor Miller. No. Councillor Phillips. No. Councillor Porter. Yes. Councillor Cisco. Yes. Councillor Sorrento. Yes. 
Councillor Townsend? No. Councillor Williamson? No. And Mayor Senzik? Yes. And that's lost. Interesting. Mr. Mayor, I still have the floor. I actually had my hand up. How does Cisco still have the floor? Because I didn't give up the floor. Oh, okay. Keep going then. Why don't we just split the vote? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I'll say, first of all, Mr. Mayor, that the hypocrisy around this table right now is staggering. Okay. A moment ago. And please don't I'm mute me all the time, whoever's muting me. Yeah, it's not about <laughs> yourself here. Come on. A moment ago, Count, council. council decided to not spend any more money without being able to have in-person public participation, and then immediately decided not to defer a motion that is asking to spend money without public participation. And we know that public participation will be necessary because we've received emails from the public talking about how frustrated they were that this wasn't returned. Uh, that this wasn't we, returned. We avoid so, talking about our colleagues while we're at this meeting. If you have something to say about the motion on the floor, I think that's fine, but I think we can all put on our big pants and deal with it. I'm wearing my big pants, Councillor. Thank you for the lecture, though. Okay, let's just let's just get through this. We've got 20 more minutes before the end, so if we can just get through this and keep moving it forward. I, I just, I, I find it amazing that we, on one hand, say that we shouldn't be spending money, but on the other hand, we're now making a motion to continue to spend money, Mr. Mayor. That's all. Okay. Councillor Harris. Okay, could I ask that the motion be split in two and can we vote on it? Yes. Is that possible? Yeah. So you want to split it and which one do you yes. want? Yes. I would like to vote on the, uh, the staff be directed to include the funds first and then the second part. And the way I understand it is that the ward councillors want staff to look into the possibilities of finding options to have access to the lake. So come back with a report. That would be the first part of that motion. That's is that first. correct? I'll look to the mover. So if we can hurry up there. That is correct. Okay. So we're gonna vote on the, can you highlight Evan, Councillor Harris, what do you, you want that one voted on first? Uh, sure, sure. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Yep. Point can I just like- You have a point of order? Yeah, I do. Okay, it? so we're, we're splitting this up. Just for the second part of it, where we're asking for funds to be put into the budget. Do we have an idea? Like, can staff tell us what type of money we're talking about here? Well, they have to come up with a report. So it's, it's actually, it's an incorrect motion because they're asking okay. for including funds, which we don't even know exists. Okay. Let's vote on the first one. Through you, Mr. Through you, Mr. Mayor, Councillor Dodge. Yes. Councillor Garcia. Councillor Garcia? Yes. Councillor Harris? Yes. Councillor Kushner? Yes. Councillor Littleton? Yes. Councillor Miller? Yes. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Councillor Porter? Yes. Councillor Cisco? Yes. Councillor Sorrento? Yes. Councillor Townsend? Yes. Councillor Williamson? Yes. And Mayor Senzik? Yes. And that's carried. On the second, uh, Councillor Williamson? Yes. Councillor Townsend? Yes. Councillor Sorrento? Councillor Sorrento. Yes. Councillor Cisco. An unknown amount of funds? No. Councillor Porter? No. Councillor Phillips? Yes. Councillor Miller? Yes. Councillor Littleton? No. Councillor Kushner? Yes. 
Councillor Harris? No. Councillor Garcia? Yes. Councillor Dodge? Yes. And Mayor Senzik? Nope. And that's carried. All right, this is great, spending money. All right, next next uh, one is 10.4, <laughs> opening of pools. Councillor Porter, this is great. Uh, point of clarification, can we even um, debate this? Uh, we're directed not to spend money, so oh, I- uh, In the motion, it said COVID related. So I think if we just say this is COVID related, we should be okay. Of course it is. Of course, COVID related. <laughs> Uh, okay, so um, if you if the motion's on the floor, so many, I'll just read the motion. Um, whereas many residents, including families with children and seniors, do not have access to a pool, and whereas some residents live without air conditioning, whereas beaches in St. Catharines have experienced overcrowding, and other beaches in various parts of the region now have fees or limited access to visitors from other municipalities, whereas St. Catharines Municipal Beach is closed for unknown periods of time by the Niagara region pending unfavorable results of routine E. coli testing, which could potentially leave residents without a safe place to swim. Therefore, be it resolved that staff be directed to open the small pool and the large pool. Um, I actually would like to say Staff have a recommendation of which pool, so I'm going to change the motion um, to say that it's the Port uh pool with additional safety protocols as required during this pandemic, such as additional cleaning and social distancing, and be it further resolved that staff make the determination of which location to open based on cost and timing. Um, so staff have sent a memo, which is in our sugar sink folders. Um, because of the late timing of this motion, um, it's July 13th. Staff have said it, it would take a few weeks um, to open the pool that's e most easy to open, um, which is the Port Dalhousie pool. So it would potentially be ready by August long weekend. We do have enough uh, lifeguard staff to open um, that, those two pools in Port Dalhousie. Uh, we currently don't have the staffing to be able to open uh, all of the pools. And as was mentioned many times, we're facing a $7 million budget shortfall and we have increasing costs all over the place. Um, so this is actually uh, us trying to provide a service to the municipality and to the residents that um, they expect from us. Um, it's been very hot. And I am concerned that um, a, the beach isn't the best place for some families that they do wanna use a pool. Um, and I think that we, uh, we are obligated to open a pool uh, safely. And we've got uh, in a couple of our pools, we've got a big pool and a small pool, which should provide enough uh, social distancing. Um, and we'd have enough uh, current lifeguarding resources to support uh, the social distancing and the safe uh, reopening. Um, so I, I did leave it to staff. Um, none of the pools are in my ward, unfortunately. Um, and I don't want this to be uh, a war discussion. This is just about getting a pool up and running quickly. Um, so in case that the, the beaches go out because of E. coli, people have a place to swim. Mr. Mayor, we have two speakers waiting on this issue. Yeah, no, I see that. Um, Council, I got Councillor Harris. Councillor Harris, you're up. Are you, are you still on? Or? Yeah, I'm still here. I was just wondering if we could add Lincoln Pool to it. It's a highly used pool in Western Hill. There's a lot of families that use it. A lot of families that perhaps don't have vehicles, they can walk there. And I was wondering if the mover could add that pool. That's not friendly to, I mean, that's not friendly. Um, I'm trying to do this in a way that um, <laughs> Okay. Respect the budget. I talked to staff a couple of weeks ago, and as far as I understand, no other councillors have reached out to staff to talk about the budget, how many lifeguarding staff we have on. I would not entertain opening additional pools. This is just about opening um, a pool in a location that has both a big and a small pool that would support social distancing. And I take my kids to that small pool in your ward and. 
um, it's it's quite crowded, and I, I just don't think we have the resources to do it. I guess, well, to your point, it's quite quite crowded. That means it's used quite a bit. So I, I guess Maybe. Western Hill will be There's losing one. out on this. <laughs> Make that as an amendment, Councillor. Then we got we got some speakers that we have to get to. Uh, it's an amendment, but it wasn't accepted friendly. No, so it's so. still an amendment. We just keep it as keep it in red. Um, to the clerk, uh, there's two speakers. So if you want to have, um, if you can introduce them, I don't know who's waiting. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, the first speaker is going to be uh, Rebecca Hahn, and then following Rebecca, we have Angela Zito. So, first, uh, I guess Rebecca Hahn, you are the first to present. Welcome, Ms. Hahn. Hello, thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank all of you for the opportunity to address my concerns with you this evening. Um, a quick bit about myself. My name's Rebecca. I've been married 16 years with two teenagers, 13 and 14 years old. My husband Aaron and I run a small construction business, um, which Aaron began 14 years ago. The last few months, of course, have been very challenging uh, for us as small business owners um, since we essentially lost our right to work and provide for our family. We are obviously grateful to be back up and running. However, excuse me, when I found out the public pools were not scheduled to open this year, I became very discouraged, as did my kids. Um, I therefore took it upon myself to do some research about the safety of swimming pools with regard to COVID-19 and then reached out to the city to see if we could somehow make this work. Uh, upon reaching out to the mayor's office, um, Julie Hughes contacted me um, and let, it, let me know the criteria with which um, the city used in evaluating and deciding which amenities and service to open. In, to open. So the three criteria, as you're probably aware, are safety, feasibility, and community impact. I will therefore use these same criteria to demonstrate why I believe the pools should be open. Um, so the first concern was safety. In Julie's email, she attached a small blurb from a report which stated, um, quote, staff have identified several health and safety concerns associated with reopening the pools, including the ability to enforce strict social distancing guidelines, as well as the uncertainty regarding the, co the spread of COVID in water. So with regard to enforcing strict social distancing guidelines, um, since it is mainly kids using the pools, I would note that last Wednesday, the director of the CDC, Dr. Robert Redfield, stated, uh, quote, there's no evidence that children drive the spread of the coronavirus, end quote. In addition, the president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, Sally Goza, said, quote, children are less likely to become infected and they are less likely to spread the infection. Um, with regard to the uncertainty regarding the spread of COVID-19 in the water, the CDC website states, there is no evidence that COVID-19 can spread to people through recreational water. I would also point out that as of today, there are only 31 cases of COVID in all of Niagara region, which obviously has a population of around 100, uh, 479,000 people, which works out to 0.01% of our population currently infected. So I think we can agree that safety should not prevent us from opening the pools since children, the main demographic using the pools, are not generally susceptible to the virus, um, nor the spread of it. I understand certain precautions obviously need to be taken. However, I believe there are numerous ways to implement such strategies. Additionally, if we need some guidance, um, perhaps we can reach out to Well Under Niagara Falls where they have opened their pools and ask how they have implemented their reopening. The next criteria was feasibility, which looks at the costs associated with safely delivering the service or opening the amenity and whether it is fiscally responsible to expend those financial resources. First and foremost, I would like to point out that we, the taxpayers, pay for these facilities and rightfully expect to have access to and use of them. I understand the city lost revenues due to the shutdown, but that does not justify denying its constituents access to amenities which our property taxes pay for. Um, as small business owners, we can't give our clients less than what they pay for simply because of the loss of revenue that we incurred due to the government enforced shutdown. For example, if a client signs a contract for us to build a 300 square foot deck for $10,000, we can't turn around and only build a 200 square foot deck for the same price and simply blame it on uh, the loss of revenue due to the government imposed shutdown. This obviously wouldn't be lawful. Neither is it lawful for the government to charge us for services and amenities we're not able to access. Um, I understand the cost to open pools is approximately $492,000. Ideally, I would love to see all pools open. However, if that is not realistic, I would request that at least the Lion Dunk Pool in Meriton be opened. 
The rationale behind this request is that there are no splash pads or beaches within a reasonable distance to Meriton, which kids can access, access via their own means of transportation. I also understand the line dog pool needs painting. Um, perhaps since there will only be roughly a month of use, the painting can wait till next year. Um, finally, with regard to the community impact, which looks at things like how many people in the community the amenity serves, as well as whether the service is available through other partners, I would first point out um, that the extreme heat and humidity that we endure through the summer months. Uh, many families in our community rely on the use of these facilities to cool down, especially those who don't have air conditioning. Um, as previously mentioned, there are no splash pads or beaches within a reasonable distance to Meriton families. I think we can agree that with the high um, extreme temperatures that we get in the city, there needs to be some sort of accessible relief for families. Um, with regard to the service being available through other partners, there are no swimming pools accept accessible to the public other than those which are publicly owned and operated. In contrast, even though there are a number of options for golfers in terms of courses that are open to the public, it was still decided to go ahead and open the Garden City Golf Course. It is my understanding the cost to open the public golf course was roughly the same as opening two outdoor pools. Under this criteria, the availability of the service through other partners, this seems completely unjustified to open the golf course and not the pools. In terms of whether this service fits in the larger context of recovery for the community, I would argue that it is imperative that after three months of being told to stay home, we ensure there are available amenities that encourage outdoor physical activity, fresh air, and social interaction for our children. Swimming pools allow for all of the above, even during extreme heat waves. Um, if we are truly concerned with the physical, mental, and social well-being of our community, we need to consider these things as they are crucial to our well-being and building our immune systems. Um, obviously, the kids have already gone through a lot. They've had so much taken away, school, graduations, time with family and friends, sports, hiking. Um, now I just found out the playground um, is closed indefinitely. And I think it's time that we consider them when making decisions about how we use taxpayer funds. Um, I thank you again for the opportunity to express my concerns. I want you to know, no matter how I come across, my true intentions come from a place of seeking fairness and justice and wanting the best for our kids and our families. So I really hope you will consider all the valid points I've made and come to an appropriate decision. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Han. And thank you for staying on the Zoom platform for as long as you did. You'd see that we've been dealing with a lot of stuff and this is just as important as everything else that we've been dealing with. So is there any questions of the presenter? Um, I'm looking at hands up. Are they for the motion or is this for the presenter? So Councillor Dodge, this is for the presenter. No, Councillor Garcia, this is for the presenter. Councillor uh, Harris, is this for the presenter? No. Okay. Um, there's no questions, uh, Ms. Hahn, but I do wanna say thank you for taking the time to articulate your position. And uh, I think we're gonna have a, a very thorough discussion and you've made some very salient points about uh, where we should be investing our dollars. So thank you for that. And we'll receive the presentations after the next speaker. So Evan, I will pass it over to you to bring in the next speaker. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So next speaking, we have Angela Zito. Welcome, Ms. Zito. Hello. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for allowing me to speak on this issue. Uh, in the email that I sent to all of you, I outlined the reasons why reopening pools is so important to the demographic that I represent, which is parents and caregivers of young children. And I think I made a pretty strong case, but to those of you who may remain unconvinced, uh, I do have something to add. Uh, I grew up here and I worked for the city of St. Catharines as a lifeguard and swim instructor for seven years at West Park Pool. And in that neighborhood, I saw a lot of disadvantaged, at-risk youth visiting the pool, uh, and in particular, older boys. Uh, these boys would attend public swim all day, every day, for the entire summer. And the pool is a safe and healthy place for these kids to blow off some steam. Uh, it was clear to me that if they didn't have the pool, they would very likely be getting into a lot of trouble. So as you cast your vote, I would urge you to consider your responsibility towards these kids um, and to imagine what summer might look like 
without pool access for them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. You know, thank you for sending in your written information as well. It does, does help to form our, our position. Uh, Councillor Garcia, do you have your hand up again to ask a question? You got on, okay, you, you don't? Okay, great. No, it, it's on the motion. Okay, so if we could just stop putting up our hands when the speakers are speaking, we can wait until after that. Um, again, thank you for the presentation. So can I have a motion to receive the two presentations? Uh, Councillor Miller and Councillor Dodge, all in favor? Okay, that's carried, thank you very much. And now if we can have Evan put the motion back on the floor. And um, before we do that, uh, can I have a motion to extend the meeting by, uh, looks like we got, yeah, it looks like we got about another half hour. So I move the meeting by half hour. Uh, Councillor Miller and Councillor Dodge. So all in favor, hands up. Any extension after that needs, I think a majority, needs a, a, a full, uh, I think it needs a, a 100%. And I can tell you, I won't be voting for it going past 11 o'clock. So you know you're going to lose on that one. Um, okay, so here's the motion on the floor. So now we're back to people with their hands up. And I think, uh, well, I guess Councillor Miller, you got your hand up, don't you? I did. Look at that. Um, I guess the first question is, uh, do we have the what the cost is on on per pool? I know we had that report back when we got the update. Sort of originally, we made the decision around pools, but do we have it handy right now, Director Christie? Through you, Mr. Mayor, we we approximate that it would cost uh, uh, up to one hundred and ten thousand dollars per pool site uh, to run for for one month. Uh, the exception would be the Lincoln pool because it is smaller. So that number is around the $40,000 mark. And I guess, are we, you know, we've seen what's happening with the beaches. Are we confident that we can deal with the, the presuming crowding that, that we're definitely going to get if we open just one public pool? Well, can um, we speak? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, while we're not sure as to the number of folks that will be coming out to the pools, um, we, we have seen um, the experiences, the lived experiences in other municipalities and the other neighboring municipalities where they've had to institute, um, they've had to use timed swims, so 45 minute periods where people can get in and then we have to clear the pool and then we have to disinfect touch points. So that's been the experience uh, that other municipalities have instituted. So we are looking at um, similar ways. If if councils, if it's council's will to, to open up a pool, that's what we will have to do. There's no way of telling how many people will come. Um, obviously on hot days, we're going to have more than, than not, but uh, yeah. That, that would be our best guess is that we're, we would have to be ready for worst case scenario and we, we would have to staff accordingly as well. Okay, fair enough. I, I guess I, I, you know, I like was expressed by, by Ms. Zito or Ms. Hahn. I'm concerned about the having in Port Dalhousie. We know there's a, a beach nearby and they have a splash pad relatively nearby at Pearson, things we don't have in the south end of town. And I, I'm also concerned about the message it sends that we're opening. Uh, a pool in probably the most affluent neighborhood of, of St. Catharines. And, and what we're trying to do here is provide access, uh, particularly for people who, who need it, who tend to be disadvantaged socioeconomically. So I would also move on an amendment that we open the uh, lion dunk pool as well. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, if I could just offer additional information on that. Got Director Christie and Director Martuccio, come on in. Um, so the only reason, Councillor Miller, that we uh, recommended uh, Port Dalhousie over, over Lion Dunk Schoolie in Meriton is that the Lion Dunk Schoolie pool uh, requires um, repairs. It's not just about painting. So last summer we had uh, quite a few incidents of um, people uh, with uh, small cuts to their feet because the, the paint was peeling. So th that paint has to be addressed this year. And because of staining on the floor of the pool, um, 
it, it casts a shadow at the bottom of the pool. You're not supposed to have shadows at the bottom, bottom of the pool. You're supposed to have bright white background so that the lifeguards can uh, adequately, adequately supervise the pool and provide a safe environment. So if we have those shadows and if we have the staining and we, we, don't, we can't repair it, um, I don't think it's a short-term fix. Um, I will defer to Director Martuccio to, to, to offer up uh, possibly a more technical explanation. But from, from our perspective, from, a, from, a, from an aquatics perspective, we would need that pool to be fixed uh, before we could operate it. That's a public health issue. So I'll go to Anthony and to Director Martuccio. Yes, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, uh, Director uh, Christie was correct. Uh, the, the problems at Lion Dunk are with the large bull tank. Um, if we do fill the pool and try to open it, there is the possibility that public health will not um, allow us, will, will not allow us to open it because it won't pass it because of the staining um, and, and they'll just deem it unsafe. The, the small pool tank, on the other hand, uh, we could open if, if required. Just uh, so, some clarification as well with regards to the cost. Uh, as Director Christie mentioned, it's about $109,000 uh, per pool site. That includes both the large and the small pool if you're opening them at a site. Um, but there's also about uh, $10,000 in setup costs that are also required at each site in order to ensure that we're in compliance uh, with all the uh, public health regs related to COVID um, and that we have put all the appropriate measures in place. All right, thank you for that. I guess just to clarify, is that is that what you're saying is it's not gonna be possible or just more work is gonna be needed to be done, but it's still gonna be possible to open it in August. All right, looking for a definitive here. Anyone? Uh, Got to unmute Anthony. For the Lion Dunk Schoolie large pool, uh, we, we do not recommend that we try to open it. We, um, we're not certain that we will get public health uh, providing approval to open that pool. I'll leave my amendment on the table, that's fine. All right, um, let's see, Councillor Dodge. That's not, can I, do I, uh, that's Am I able to respond if it's friendly or not? I yeah. didn't ask. And it's not. Council reporter, is it friendly or not? Well, no, we just uh, went from $110,000 to people asking for $250,000. Um, it would be friendly if we close the golf course tomorrow, then we can open all the pools. That's my position. So if any of the councillors um, want to add that, then we can, we can certainly do that. No one seemed to care about kids about a month ago. No one's emailed staff. All of a sudden, everybody wants to open all the pools. Um, and we're not really giving staff a lot of time to put this together to be able to open up pool. If we have to open all three, um, it's going to extend it out even further. We want to open a pool as soon as possible. So no, it's not friendly. Okay. So let's see. A lot of hands up here. Um, Councillor Miller. Sure. You did go to me, so. Councillor Dodge, you're up. Okay. So. Um, and speaking with staff earlier and whatnot, when it says that lifeguards, I don't know who put them, be it further resolved that lifeguards be removed from the splash pads, does that mean that all lifeguards would be removed or only the ones that are needed to be removed to help at the pools? Through you, Mr. Mayor, when we hired lifeguards to staff our uh, splash pads, we uh, we did so just to cover off our operating hours at the splash pads. Now, coincidentally, the number of lifeguards that we do have on staff right now, we could open up one pool site, so a large and a small. Um, and, and as you know, typically we don't staff our splash pads, but with COVID, uh, we have been cleaning. The, they've been doing a fantastic job of clearing the splash pads and then cleaning afterwards. We Ooh. would need to relocate those lifeguards to, to, um, to pools and then staff the splash pads with other non-aquatic staff. So um, to, to, to answer your question, uh, Councillor Dodge, we would, we would require to move, we would be required to move all the lifeguards that are currently working on splash pads to, to the pools. Okay, and then going back to um, the lion, the, the pool in Merton, um, I know that uh, Councillor Miller has asked that both be open and if the large one isn't, um, you know, it isn't logistically possible to do that, would it be okay to have, or would it be okay to open the uh, small pool? Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, um, opening up multiple sites uh, would, 
thin us out from a staffing perspective and it may impact our ability to open from 11 to 7 um, in the first few days or the first week or so until we can hire additional staff. Okay. But it is possible. It is possible to do that. And what would be the or like the quickest opening of any pool that we could expect? Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, staff require approximately uh, seven to 10 days in order to have a pool ready to open. Okay. Would that be even for the small pool in, uh, in Meriton? Would that pool need that much time to open? If that was the only one that we actually opened there at that That's location? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, that's that's correct because uh, we need to fill the pools with water. Then we need to have public health inspection, and we also have to set the sites up uh, with the appropriate protocols for COVID. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right. So now, Councilor Sorrento. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to uh, one of the directors, I guess Director Christie. Um, if we remove the lifeguards from the splash pad, which we have one in St. George's Ward and replace them with other staff, would you have any safety concerns? Would you be, would you be comfortable with additional other staff other than lifeguards um, supervising the, the children at the um, splash pads? Um, through you, Mr. Mayor. So again, I, I just want to remind council, we typically do not staff our splash pads. Typically they're just uh, free use. We don't, normally have staff on site. Uh, am I comfortable with other staff supervising them uh, in light of COVID? Absolutely. Um, mostly they're functioning there with points. So yes, very comfortable. Okay, Mr. Mayor, just so you know, I think I missed about three quarters of that and I caught the tail end of what Director Christie said, which I believe he said he would be comfortable with it. Is that right, Mr. Mr. Mayor? Yes. Yes. Okay. So then just a clarif clarification question, how are we removing lifeguards from splash pads if we don't assign lifeguards to, to supervise the kids? I don't understand that. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Councillor, can you repeat that question, please? Okay. In one of the clauses, it says, be it further resolved that lifeguards be removed from splash pads and assigned outdoor pools. You just said that we don't have lifeguards at splash pads, correct? Not typically, but we do this year. We hired we lifeguards. Yeah. Yes, we okay, do have lifeguards. Enough. Okay, thank you. My question has been answered. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Director. So, and Councillor Townsend. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. My question's been answered. Thank you, Councillor Townsend. Councillor Garcia. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to ask staff through you uh, for some explanation of these costs. Like when we say it's going to cost 110000 to open one pool, what, what does that entail? Like it sounds like a huge amount of money to me. Um. I'll take a first stab at this and then Director Martucho can add, but um, we typically, through you, Mr. Mayor, we typically staff the life, the, uh, the each pool based on capacity. Uh, so we would need uh, lifeguards from opening to close uh, on rotations. So theref therefore, you know, you might have uh, up to six lifeguards on deck, maybe even more. Um, they need to go on rotation and they need to go on their assigned breaks. Um, they're working directly under the sun and in, in a lot of cases in, in stressful heat alert days. Uh, so we would need to, to cover off shifts um, from, from, a, uh, from a programming side, from an aquatic side, that takes up the bulk of the operating costs of, of outdoor pools. But I'll uh, defer to Director Martuccio for, for additional costs within those numbers. Yes, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, those costs will also include facility maintenance staff that are required to go to each pool to ensure that the uh, balance or water balancing is within um, the parameters of public health and the staff are also uh, required to uh, clean touch points much more often as a result of, again, COVID and the more stringent health, uh, public health requirements. Um, so we're, we're required to uh, 
to make sure those staff are getting through those facilities uh, on a regular basis at, at minimum every two hours. Uh, thank you, directors. And through you, Mr. Mayor, <clears throat> um, obviously staff know uh, what the cost would be. I, it sounded like a lot of money to me, but <clears throat> I would just like to share with my colleagues that uh, uh, I have had a lot of emails from people, certainly in Port Lucy, but other areas who are concerned about the fact that uh, they have little kids and they can't take these little kids to the beach as much as uh, an adult would be because there are people partying and swearing and smoking and whatever. And also uh, the other municipalities uh, like Niagara Falls, uh, Welland, uh, Toronto have been able to reopen their pools. And this is of course an expense, but it is a COVID related expense and it's something that we need to address. So I, I would support opening all of the pools that we can open. And uh, even though, even the one in Marathon, even though Marathon is so affluent, but that's okay. All right. Um, I think we got Councilor Littleton. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to say, I mean, it's it sounds like uh, the Marathon pool cannot open this year due to all of those um, construction concerns, the paint, the staining on the bottom of the pool. And, and I understand that. And I think um, to Councillor Porter's point, when we talked about what we are gonna open and what was recommended from staff a little while ago, this is very hard. The COVID, this whole COVID thing has been astronomically difficult on children. I completely understand because three live in my house. I've seen graduations cut, I've seen soccer seasons cut, final soccer seasons, girls that have played together for six, seven years gone, that's gone. Uh, my daughter's trip to Greece next year is in jeopardy because of school. We don't know if kids are going back to school. I totally understand all of this completely. And when we were talking about what we are gonna open, we made sure that we could open those splash pads for the kids. And yes, we don't have one in Meriton and that is going to need to be addressed. We absolutely need to get one in Meriton, especially if we have any other kind of pandemics or we find ourselves in situations like we are in right now. It's, it's awful. But tonight, just a couple other numbers that we need to think about. We're now looking at 110,000 plus 110,000 plus 40,000 to open the other pool. That's 220, 260 plus 15,000 to open the pools, plus the, now we're over $300,000. I'd just like to let everyone know that in the consent agenda, we approved something to allow for delay of paying um, tax, when you don't pay your taxes, the, excuse me, sorry, my son's here, play, not paying the uh, interest on, on that. That is looking like it's gonna add to our $10 million shortfall of another 270 to potentially $670,000. If we add another 300, we just added a million dollars in one night. And I understand, I do, I, I understand all of this, but we currently have tax arrears for 2020 at seven. Per I'm super concerned about the people who are in that situation and, and they're, we're gonna be looking at a tax increase next year if we can't get these numbers down. And I don't know how they're gonna pay and they're not the ones that are gonna call me and say, Lori, I'm afraid that I can't pay my property tax bill because they, they have feelings of whatever that might mean for them, right? Shame, um, worriedness. And I'm so sorry, but that's what, where I think we are right now. And I'm so concerned about all of that that is not coming in. Tax revenue is not coming in and, and we don't have money to open these pools. And so I can't, I can't vote in favor of opening all these pools at all. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Littleton. And we have Councillor Williamson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to um, Mr. Martuccio or Mr. Christie. Um, how long would it take to get the dunk schoolie pool in uh, in order? And was there um, have we budgeted money for those repairs? Through you, Mr. Mayor, the uh, are you talking about the 
uh, repairs. The large tank. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. yeah. The large tank in, in Meriton. Through you, Mr. Mayor, um, we, we did not budget for those repairs. Um, and it, in order to engage a pool contractor at this point in time, it is going to be extremely difficult. We're probably looking at at least a six to eight week delay. Okay. But you said there's not significant problems with the smaller pool there that could get up and running in a reasonable fashion? Through you, Mr. Mayor, that's correct. We did the repairs to that pool last year. Okay, I won't uh, do the hindsight thing, but Lancaster Pool would be a nice option to have available to us right now. Questions on, on here. Um, I think we'll start with the voting and actually Councillor Porter, have you spoke already or no? Yes. I, I did introduce um, the motion i'm sure if i can wrap up i guess i guess i'm kind of in shock because i don't think any counselor messaged staff or raised any concerns about pools previously then all of a sudden we just are snap want to open and spend two hundred fifty thousand dollars um to try and open something for a month when no one talked about this when we we're opening a golf course so i guess um my my mission tonight was to try and restore some service um, to the public because I think um, because I think it's fair and I think it's the right thing to do. Um, but like Councillor Littleton said, um, we're going to be facing a huge, huge tax increase next year if we don't watch what we're doing. Um, so we have to be mindful at every step um, that we're uh, providing service yet doing it safely and doing the right thing um, and be, be mindful of what's going to happen when it, when budget time comes um, next year. So my, my mission was to try and um, be fair tonight. And um, I'm really struggling with the fact that we might end up spending $250,000 to open something for a month um, when we're spending $350,000 for men to go golfing when there are tons and tons of private sector golf courses all around St. Catharines. So I would urge council, if you want to open all the pools, I somebody put forward a motion to close the golf course tomorrow. All right, thank you, Councillor Porter. Um, two points of clarification. Are, where's, where's the money coming from? Because I was told related to the crosswalk we didn't have five thousand dollars within the budget obviously we're talking about significantly more amounts of money so and is this a reconsideration because we sort of voted on pools two months ago um i'll go look to the clerk because uh, it would have been a reconsideration on the golf courses too i believe because we voted on that that was brought forward so look to the clerk i don't think it's reconsideration through you, Mr. Mayor, I believe at the time we, we decided that a lot of this was sort of fluid and we were going to be coming and revisiting it. So we had talked about that, that these would not be reconsiderations, but we would be moving forward through the through COVID. Thank you. Okay, so um, yeah. Uh, Sorry, and just where is it? Where's the money coming from? So we, we would have already been operating the, we've already approved this in the 2020 budget, Councillor. And so it's not new money, it's money that's already been accounted for. And so this just goes to the further debt of that we're incurring, that's all. Okay, it's, thanks. It's not new money. Um, okay, well, I think Councillor Porter captured it all. Uh, if we're gonna open up golf courses, then I guess, you know, pools are an asset as well. And so it's, uh, we're at a position where we're spending yet more money and we're doing it for community good, but, um, we're gonna go with golf. Let's go with the pools. So how are we gonna do this to the clerk? Because you've got um, a couple of not friendly amendments. So we can do with, let's deal the Lincoln Park pool first. So that one's the first one that'll be the amendment. So let's do that one. Okay, and that's that's the correct way. We'll, we'll start with Lincoln Park. Um, my question is, Councillor Harris, do you have a seconder? Uh, Councillor Kushner. There we go, all right. Okay, so this is Lincoln. Okay, so that's what council is voting on to open this pool. Okay, uh, Councillor Dodge. Councillor Dodge. Yes. All right. Councillor Garcia. Yes. Councillor Harris. Yes. Councillor Kushner. 
Councillor Kushner? He was there. Hey, he's there. Oh, his video disappeared, but his Councillor Kushner, are you there? Aging Councillor Kushner. Okay, I'll move on to Councillor Littleton. I'll go back up. No. Councillor Miller. Yes. Councillor Phillips. No. Councillor Porter. No. Councillor Cisco. No. Councillor Sorrento. No. Councillor Townsend. No. Councillor Williamson. Yes. And Mayor Senzik. Yes. And Councillor Kushner, are you there? We'll, we'll wait for that vote. Councilor okay. Kushner, come on. We, if yes. Councillor Kushner is not in the room, you'll need a seconder, Councillor Harris. Councillor Kushner. Is he there? Yeah, he's there. We're gonna we're gonna wait for him. Oh, okay. Oh, it just says Jay Kushner joined. Councillor Kushner. Councillor Kushner for Lincoln Pool. No, we'll, we'll just wait for him. Want to make sure it's all transparent and all the other words that we use. Compassionate. Yeah, that's a great one for this one too. Look at that. Councillor Miller. Putting it in there. That's fantastic. Yes. Councillor Kushner. Yes. There you go. Okay, and that's carried. All right. All right one pool open. Okay. Let's go to the next one. Okay, the next one, Evan, can you put it up? Is it for Port Dalhousie or is it Link Lion? It's Lincoln Dunk. Lincoln Dunk would be the next one. Okay, and who was the mover? Was it Councillor Miller? Move by me, seconded by Councillor Williamson. Okay, excuse me. Can I just ask a point of clarification? Is it even possible to open it up in time? It'll take eight weeks, but you know, we'll see what happens. I did ask that question. I thought the answer was that it's not. <laughs> I'm sorry. I have a point. I, I need to hear that answer too. I'm sorry. I had to leave the room. I apologize. Can I, is it possible though? It's my understanding it's not possible. To Director Martuccio. Through you, Mr. Mayor, um, without doing the paint repairs, we would be taking a chance at filling it and public health not passing it, allowing us to open it. If we did, if we had to do the paint repairs first, it would take six to eight weeks in order to initiate those repairs. So do we want to open an unsafe pool? Can I make... Sorry. Can, can I have develop. a... I'm sorry, can I ask the mover of the motion that I apologize because I have child issues here on a six hour meeting. Um, is it possible that we could get the repairs done to open the pool for next year to make sure that it can be done for next year? Can that be done? Through you, Mr. Mayor, if the budget is approved in the 2021 uh, budget, uh, yes, we could get that work completed. To the mover, Councillor Porter, could I make that amendment? I'm sorry, everybody. Sure, I mean, at this point, I'm not sure how we'll have any consultations be able to pass a 2021 budget, but yeah. Okay, thank you. So just, I, I know Councillor Miller has his motion on the floor, but I'm gonna make the motion, I'm sorry, Councillor Miller, that we look at getting the funds added so the proper work is done so we can have a pool that is healthy and safe for the Meriton community next year. All we, what we'd have to do, Councilor Littleton, is defeat this motion and then we could bring yours onto the table. Okay, I'm, I'm so sorry about that procedurally. I am. Um, no, that's fine. Okay, so we're still on the, we're still on the uh, lion dunk. Mr. Mayor. Point of order? Yes. What's the um, being that staff is saying to us that they won't, they're they unable to open the larger pool, could we just have maybe the mover consider opening the small pool, which they said that they could do? Ah, look at the move. That's what the, that's what the mover has to say. 
that's not a friendly amendment. We're we'll going to have to vote on it separately. It's already being voted on separately. So I'm looking to the mover, Councillor Miller. I would say someone should add that as another amendment. If the big one can't be open, we should still be looking at the small one. All right, so let's, let's vote. Let's move forward with the vote, folks. Okay, you're voting on the highlighted motion before yeah. you. Councillor Miller is the mover. Councillor Harris, I believe, is a seconder. Okay, uh, Councillor Williamson. Yes. Councillor Townsend. No. Councillor Sorrento. No. Councillor Cisco. No. Councillor Porter. No. Councillor Phillips. No. Councillor Miller. Yes. Councillor Littleton. Uh, no. Councillor Kushner. No. Councillor Harris. <laughs> Councillor Harris, are you in the room? Yeah, I am in the room. I wasn't really second. I wasn't really seconding it, but I mean, I'll say yes. So. Yes. Okay. <laughs> you weren't the seconder. I'm sorry. No, no, I wasn't. I was just because I was actually going to vote no, but you made me the seconder. So w Williamson, Williamson no? was a seconder. Oh, yeah, I'm Williamson. Sorry. So okay. now can I vote the way I wanted to vote? Yes, you can. Okay, so no. <laughs> okay, my apologies. I thought I heard Councillor Harris. Councillor Garcia. Yes. And Councillor Dodge. No. Mayor Senzik? No. Okay, and that's lost. All right. There we go. Now let's make sure that that pool gets done next year, right, Councillor Littleton? That's what we need to do. That, that's what I'm asking so that it can be done in a safe manner so the kids can get in it the first, first instance they can get in it and enjoy it for the entire season. All right, let's bring that up during budget. So that we're going to move that to budget, okay? That's, that's fine. <clears throat> okay, so now the last one is the remainder of the motion. All right, here we go. We got one pool open. Councillor uh, Councilor Porter, do you have a seconder? Um, well, it, the original motion, I had a seconder of Councillor Williamson. There you go. Um, okay. I'm in. Councillor Porter. Yes. Councillor Phillips. Yes. Councillor Miller. Yes. Councillor Littleton. No. Councillor Kushner. Yes. Councillor Harris. <laughs> Councillor Harris, are you yes, there? Yes, I keep I keep muting myself. Yes. yes. Councillor Garcia. Yes. Councillor Dodge. Yes. Councillor Cisco. No. Councillor Sorrento. It's already passed. Yes. Councillor Townsend. No. Councillor Williamson. Yes. And Mayor Senzik. Schools before golf. Yes. And that's carried. There we go. There we go. Look at that. All right. Uh, thank you for that. And we only got about three minutes left. So uh, we're going to skip some stuff, but we got no calls of notice of motion, no report court requests. We got ABCs. And so um, we have a motion, I guess, Councillor Miller, you're, you're lifting something out of the minutes. Uh, you got about two minutes to go and hopefully you can get it done in two Yeah, minutes. I know. Okay, uh, so this is for the Rainbow Crosswalk, which we I've talked about a lot at this council. Uh, everyone knows about them sports. Uh, they're looking to add uh, a couple stripes to support the racialized community and also the trans community. Uh, there's an additional cost of $5,000, so I don't think we need a public meeting for that. Uh, and I'm asking that the additional funds come, because apparently can't be worked into the existing budget, that they come from the Civic Project Fund. This is a one-off that will qualify. There's about $3 million at the last update in the CPF. Uh, you know, I think we owe it to our racialized and queer communities to pass this tonight. Thank you. All right. Any questions on this one? Oh, Councillor Dodge, you have a question. Yeah, sorry, Mr. Mayor. I just want to have a clarification. Uh, Councillor Miller just said 5,000, and in the recommendation, it says 7,000. So is it 7,000 or 5,000? Good point. My understanding was budget. Oh, sorry. 
through, through you, Mr. Mayor, I think it was approximately 6,500 and something, which I rounded it off to that. I don't think you're going to need the full amount, but just in case I rounded it, because staff will have to go and just give me a full cost. All right. Uh, Councillor Porter. Oh, I don't have my hand up. That was a mistake. Sorry. Okay. So it uh, looks like I can call a question on this one. You are seconder, Mr. Miller. Who's your seconder again? I don't have one, but I'm open to anyone. I'll do it. Okay. Okay. Councillor Porter. Um, okay. We need to pass the bylaws, so I'm going to move quickly through this. Councillor Dodge. Yes. Councillor Garcia. Yes. Councillor Harris. Yes. Councillor Kushner. No. Councillor Littleton. Yes. Councillor Miller. Yes. Councillor Phillips. Yes. Councillor Porter. Yes. Councillor Councillor Cisco. Yes. Councillor Sorrento. Yes. Councillor Townsend. Yes. Councillor Williamson. Yes. And Mayor Senzik. Yes. This and is that's definitely, carried. Definitely, definitely, yes. Thank you, Councillor Miller, for carrying this through. Okay. You're welcome, buddy. Looks like we're, we're just going to go right to the bylaws. Uh, reading of bylaws, we have a motion that the bylaws listed in Council Agenda A through L be read a first time, then considered and passed. They be signed by the Mayor and City Clerk. Councillor Cisco, you're moving these bylaws, seconded by Councillor Porter. And I'll look to the clerk to record the vote. Councillor Williamson. Yes. Councillor Townsend. Yes. Councillor Sorrento. Yes. Councillor Cisco. Yes. Councillor Porter. Yes. Councillor Phillips. Yes. Councillor Miller. Yes. Councillor Littleton. <sighs> Councillor yes. Little. Yes. Councillor Kushner. Yes. Councillor Harris. Yes. Councillor Garcia. Yes. Councillor Dodge. Yes. And Mayor Senzik. Yes. Carried unanimously. That is it. We're at our time limit. And I'm just going to give Councillor Littleton 30 seconds on the library. And that's it for the ABCs. And then we're going to do the adjournment. So the library has started holds pickup service at um, Merritt Branch, as well as it had opened originally Centennial Branch. They're going to do it at Huck and Port later this month. Also on the 20th, the computer access will be opened at the Central Library. That is a great, succinct update and a motion to adjourn. Who wants to make that? Because this has been such a fantastic meeting. Councillor Phillips, and then seconded by Councillor Garcia. Let's do the horseshoe on this one. All in favor, carried. All right, have a great night, folks. See you on the 27th. Hopefully it'll be just as an entertaining meeting.